Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any notices of motion? Senator Harris. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion 827 standing in my no, name. No, I think you jumped a gun, Senator. I think it's further down the list when that comes up. No, sorry. No, I'll be right here for me. Are there any, any notice of motion? I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Oh, sorry, Senator Chen, I should realise. Sorry, Mr. Yes. President. My ang angle, is too, angle is wrong, obviously. Mr. President, I give notice that 15 day, sitting days after today, I shall move that the Excise Amendment Regulations 2004, number 1, as contained in the Statutory Rule 2004, number 27, and made under the Excise Act 1901, be disallowed. Mr. President, I seek leave to incorporate in Hansard a short summary of the Committee's concern with these regulations. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Mr. Chair. President, I probably sh should have preempt both the, my previous notice uh, to say that it's on behalf of the Standing Committee of Regulations and Ordinances. And uh, on behalf of the same committee, Mr. President, I give notice that 15 sitting days after today, I shall move that the, that temporary order number four of 2003, made under the Fishery, Fisheries Management Act 1991, be disallowed. Mr. President, I seek leave to incorporate Hansard as some short summary of the committee's concern with this order. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Now I shall proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Ian Campbell. Uh, Mr. President, uh, thank you. I move that government business order of the day relating to the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment representation in the House of Representatives Bill of 2004 and uh, government business orders of the day numbers 9 through to 11 be considered from 12.45 p.m. till no later than 2 o'clock this afternoon. The question is that motion be agreed to? Those of the Senator Ludwig, do you wish to? That includes the taxation laws, the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment, superannuation and dairy. A nod's as good as a wink to it. Yeah. Well, the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of the opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. I think, uh, Senator, ha there's two other matters. Uh, Senator Harris, do you have a motion seeking leave or leave of absence, leave of absence motion? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for a senator. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Harris? Uh, I move that leave of absence be granted to me for the period 11th to 13th of May inclusive uh, on account of family matters. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Again say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark, postponements. Postponement notifications will be lodged in respect of General Business Notice Number 850 to the 11th of May, General Business Number 849 to the 11th of May, and General Business Notice Number 844 to the 11th of May. Senator Allison. Oh, that's the one that's been put on. Yep. Right. Well, I now shall proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions, Senator Allison? Um, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 484, standing in my name for today, relating to the death of the former Victorian State Premier Sir Rupert Hamer, be taken as a formal motion. So, what number was that, Senator? 
848. Uh, oh, good. Uh, the question, is there any objection that's been taken as formal? Being no objection, I call Senator Allison. Motion standing in my name. Question, is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Allison. Business notice of motion number 847, standing in my name for today, relating to the senior citizens and aged care sector, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Being no objection, I call Senator Allison. I move the motion, standing in my name. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Ridgway. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to amend business of the Senate notice of motion number 852, standing in my name for today. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Ridgway. I thank the Senate and I amend the motion by omitting in paragraph uh, B, Roman numeral 1, and continue the established acquisition practices of the Parliament House Art Collection, and I ask that it be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? Being no objection, I call Senator Ridgway. I move the motion as amended. Question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, to say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Gregg. Thank you, President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 845, standing in my name for today, and relating to an order for the production of documents, response to the UNHRC finding in the case of Young versus Australia, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? Being no objection, I call Senator Gregg. Thank you, President. I move the motion, standing in my name. Question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Ludwig. Thank you, uh, President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 843, standing in my name for today, uh, be taken as a formal motion. Is there, any, is there any objection to this being taken as formal? Being no objection, I call Senator Ludwig. I move the motion, standing in my name. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Campbell. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to amend. Uh, government business notice of motion number one before seeking to have the motion taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? Be being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Campbell. Uh, thank you. I amend the notice as follows. Uh, A. That the Senate suspend at 11.30pm on April the 1st and that the Senate resume sitting at 9am on Friday the 2nd of April and B. Uh, messages to be considered from the House of Representatives are the Agricultural, uh, Fisheries and Forestry Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 2003, and the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Extension of Time Limits Bill 2003 and the Migration Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 2002, sorry, No. 1, sorry, 2002, uh, and ask that the amended motion be taken as formal. Senator Ludwig. Thank you. Just on that motion, it, it might be worth clarifying that while everyone seems to be here, is that uh, should we finish obviously earlier, then uh, that will uh, buy uh, everyone's assistance. However, if it gets uh, close to 11.30 or thereabouts and, and uh, we are not that far away, then I think there should be a little bit of flexibility in the system. So if we can start with that, uh, predicate with that uh, issue that there might be, uh, if we're not that far away, then we might be able to. Uh, finish with a bit of uh, flexibility. Otherwise, it would be more sensible to come back rather than have a long night. Senator Campbell. You... Uh, could I just say, Mr President, uh, having a look at the program, I actually think the program is very doable by dinner time, quite frankly. I think uh, if there's a perception in people's minds that we are going to sit till 11 or 11.30, then we could perhaps talk till then. I'm sure we're all very capable of doing that. But in my assessment of the program and talking around the chamber, I think it's actually quite entirely doable by four or five o'clock this afternoon if there's goodwill around the place. That's my expectation, that's my hope, and I make a plea to uh, all colleagues around the chamber mm. that we seek to uh, try and get out of here by dinner time. I but, believe uh, this is, too, this is a yeah. contingency. Mm. <laughs> Senator Allison. Thank you, Mr President. Just to indicate uh, the Democrats will be cooperative with whichever arrangement is in place, but uh, can I make a plea for uh, another level of flexibility, that is, if we're at 11.30 and there's half an hour or an hour to go, that uh, the 12.30 might be an option still considered so that we don't Senator stay Ludwig here unnecessarily. Yeah. Well, the question is the motion amended. Motion. Senator Harradine. Uh, Mr President, by leave, uh, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Um, first of all, I was not uh, aware 
uh, that the uh, government had agreed with the proposal by the opposition to uh, uh, draw stumps at 11.30 and um, come back tomorrow. Uh, look, we all have individual commitments outside of this place. It's all very well for other senators to get pairs, I mean, uh, presumably to meet their obligations, so I'll have pairs. Um, I'm not in the situation to provide a pair in those circumstances where I need to evaluate the arguments for and against particular <coughs> motions or, or, or particular amendments that uh, uh, come before the House, uh, before the uh, Senate. Um, so, um, uh, to be quite frank, uh, um, I have certain commitments and I don't intend to, uh, uh, to um, uh, do otherwise than meet those commitments. Senator Campbell. Can I seek leave to make a short response? Well, I think we've all been talking on the same matter, so... Yeah, I've spoken once already, I think. But um, just, um, Mr President, I, agree. I, I understand that, uh, uh, that this was in fact discussed at the Whips meeting last night and that a representative from Senator Haraline's office was there. But can I say that I, my understanding and my belief is that, this, that the program is incredibly doable by dinner time tonight, Mr President. And if we just get on with it, that's what will occur. And I think that the rest of the chamber have agreed to a very flexible arrangement in case something goes wrong, as it sometimes can. But I've got no doubt that if all senators here right now want to get out of here by dinner time, or by five or six o'clock tonight, it's very doable. And I suggest we get on with the program. The well, question is, the amended motion moved by Senator Campbell be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Senator Mackay? Short statement. I'm sorry. Just on this matter, I, I just wanted to say to the manager, I think that he's right in what he says. I think what Senator Harradine is saying is that probably the fact that the government was, was likely to agree to the Labor Party proposition should have been communicated to Senator Harradine. Certainly his representative was there, but it wasn't indicated there whether or not the government would agree. So I, it's a procedural issue, and I, I think I do take Senator Harradine's point. Right. Well, the question is, the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator O'Brien. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing my name for today, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? Being no objection, I call Senator O'Brien. I move the motion standing in my name, Mr President. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of our opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, Senator Harris. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion 827, standing in my name for today, relating to the establishment of a select committee on the Lindeberg agreements, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? I call Senator Harris. Uh, I move the motion, standing in my name. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Um, do we have any other? Senator Campbell. Um, Mr President, I ask that Government Business Notice Motion number two, which relates to works in the parliamentary zone, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? Being no objection, I call Senator Campbell. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those... Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Lundy. Thank you. I think it's worth making um, a few points about this particular motion, which seeks to approve the capital works within the parliamentary zone, being the design and content of the centenary of women's suffrage commemorative fountain at Old Parliament House Gardens. I know the minister, like all of us, is aware of the history of this, that originally this commemorative, uh, commemorative uh, capital works was a red fan. And I have to say, initially, when the Joint Standing Committee on the National Capital assessed the merits of the red fan and decided early on not to advise the minister to inquire into this issue, it was on the basis that we had assurances of full consultation um, from the National Capital Authority and, indeed, that the design had been tested. Um, some time later, it became clear that, in fact, neither of these two things had occurred. Not only did the design change substantially, but indeed the National Capital Authority um, was um, challenged by a number of organisations 
uh, as to whether or not they'd actually been consulted. The issue was both a combination of subjective view of the Red Fan Monument and as well as the concern about the process by which the National Capital Authority had pursued the approvals. I have to say that the National Capital Committee, uh, National Capital uh, Joint Standing Committee does not have a problem with this proposal, so we're not seeking to oppose it in any way. But what we do want to say is that we understand that once again full consultation processes have been gone through, and I know the minister would have been assured would have been assured of this as well in supporting this motion. So we do support it, but I think it's absolutely worthwhile noting the controversy leading up to this point, and that once again we have been convinced by the National Capital Authority that they have in fact adhered to the appropriate consultation processes in the context of the sensitivity of this issue. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no, I think the ayes have it. Senator Brown. President, uh, thank you. I ask the General Business Notice of Motion number 853 standing in my name for today relating to the protection of endangered species of wildlife and plants be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? Being no objection, I call Senator Brown. I thank the Senate and move that motion. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Brown, you have one on I do, thanks. President, and that's uh, motion number 851 relating to Tasmanian forests and endangered wildlife, and I ask that that be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? Being no objection, I call Senator Brown. Thank the Senate and move that motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Uh, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Brown be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes will pass to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Allison uh, teller for the ayes, Senator Ferris teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division there being eight ayes and 40 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Ferris, I believe you have two motions. Senator Ferris. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of Senator Sandy Macdonald, I ask that General Business Notice of motion number 841, provi proposing an extension of time for a committee to, re to report, be taken as formal. Is there any objection that's been taken as formal? Being no objection, I call Senator Ferris. I move the motion standing in the name of Senator Macdonald. The question is a motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Ferris. On behalf of Senator Brandis, I ask that general business notice of motion number 842, proposing an extension of time for a committee to report, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? Being no objection, I call Senator Ferris. If the motion is standing in the name of Senator Brandis. The question is, the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Senator Allison. Um, on behalf of Senator Cherry, I ask the general business notice of motion. I'm sorry, I haven't called it yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess you're a little bit quick for me. Um, those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Now, Senator Allison. On behalf of Senator Cherry, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion 846, standing in his name for today, relating to the Health and Disability Services Sector, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this being taken as formal? Being no objection, I call Senator Allison. I move the motion standing in his name. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Tabling and consideration of committee reports. Senator Lundy. I'll just um, find my paperwork. Oh, Senator Ray, perhaps you'll find it. You seem to be better prepared. Uh, no, no, I've probably got a better pair of specs, I think, uh, Mr. <laughs> President. 
Um, Mr. President, I present the 118th report of the Committee of Privileges entitled Joint Meetings of the Senate and the House of Representatives on the 23rd and 24th of October 2003, and I move that the report be printed. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Ray. Mr. President, uh, I move that the Senate take note of the report. On 29 October 2003, the Senate referred to the Committee of Privileges two inquiries into aspects of the joint meetings of the Senate and the House of Representatives on 23 and 24 October 2003. The committee advertised the references and wrote to persons who it believed could assist with its inquiries. It received nine submissions and also had the benefit of transcripts from the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee supplementary budget estimates hearings on 3 and 4 November 2003, at which, se at which several aspects of the joint meeting and arrangements for them were canvassed. In addition, the committee had regard to the, to the Procedure Committee's third report of 2003, which examined related issues. I do not propose to give an account of what occurred at the joint meetings. These events have been traversed in detail in this chamber, at the estimates hearings and in another place. The committee encountered a number of difficulties in conducting its inquiries. The main problem was the paupacy of evidence before it and the unlikelihood of obtaining sufficient further evidence to enable it to make sound findings of fact. I should mention that the terms of reference given to the committee did not require it to make findings as to whether specific contempts had been committed. Rather, the committee was tasked with examining possible instances of improper conduct or improper interference with senators, with a view to making findings of fact and then determining whether there had been any implications for the powers, privileges and immunities of the Senate arising from these matters, and whether the Senate should take or recommend any action in consequence. The difficulties faced by the committee in assembling evidence were in part related to the uncertain nature of the proceedings themselves. Procedurally, the joint meetings were simultaneous meetings of the Senate and the House of Representatives in the House of Representatives chamber and presided over by the Speaker, applying the rules of the House of Representatives so far as they were applicable. Unlike the 1974 joint sittings or the joint meetings held in the 1980s, to choose, Sen to choose ACT senators to fill casual vacancies, these meetings were not preceded by any resolutions providing detailed rules for the maintenance of order or providing that they were proceedings in the parliament and therefore attracting the normal powers, privileges and immunities of the houses. The joint meetings had no apparent constitutional authority and the committee was unable to determine whether they were indeed proceedings of par in Parliament. The committee observes that serious doubts must remain about the status and validity of the arrangements under which the Speaker of the House of Representatives purported to exercise the disciplinary powers of the House over senators who were participating in a meeting of the Senate. One view, on one view, by accepting the House's invitation to meet with it in its chamber under House standing orders, the Senate, in effect, submitted itself to the jurisdiction of the House. On another view, this is not constitutionally or legally possible. In short, joint meetings of this kind are constitutionally uncharted waters. Several aspects of these inquiries required the committee to examine the conduct of members and officers of the House of Representatives. As all senators would recognise, this raises the issue not only of comity between the Houses, but also the inherent limitation on an inquiry by one house into the activities of the other, a limitation which may be a matter of law. While the committee was grateful to receive a submission from the Speaker, it notes that this sub submission comprised only the Speaker's statements to the House and that the Sergeant of Arms declined to respond to the committee's inv invitation to make a submission. The committee had other difficulties with evidence. With regard to the scuffle at the back of the chamber involving Senator Nettle, the committee had conflicting accounts from two senators 
which it did not consider were capable of reconciliation, even with the dubious benefit of a public hearing. Furthermore, the committee wished to avoid providing a forum for further exploitation of the politics of joint meetings. It decided, therefore, there would be no benefit in holding public hearings. Other terms of reference required the committee to examine the possible improper presence and activity of agents of foreign governments. Clearly, it did not have the jurisdiction to demand evidence from those governments and was reluctant to embark on a fruitless exercise of attempting to do so, given the, given the possible diplomatic ramifications. Likewise, with regard to the role of foreign media, the committee had little chance of identifying and obtaining evidence from the news crew that is alleged to have brought an, unau brought an unauthorised camera into the House of Representatives gallery. As an aside, the committee agrees that the treatment of Australian media was unfortunate at best and observes that media arrangements for any future events of this nature in Parliament House should be the subject of early negotiations between the press gallery and the presiding officers to ensure that members of the Australian media do not again find themselves at a disadvantage in their own country. In conclusion, because of the constitutional, jurisdictional and evidentiary difficulties it encountered, the committee was unable to make findings on most of the terms of reference. The committee does not believe that there is any solution to the serious problems raised by the joint meeting forum under the present constitutional arrangements. It therefore endorses the procedure committee recommendation that the Senate pass a resolution expressing its opinion that any future addresses by foreign heads of state should be received by a meeting of the House of Representatives in the House chamber, to which all senators are invited as guests. Under this arrangement, the status of senators as guests of the House and the authority of the Speaker over proceedings would be clear. I commend the report to the Senate and seek leave to continue my remarks. Brown wants to speak. Senator Brown. Thank you. Uh, and I thank Senator Ray for um, the, that report to the Senate. However, uh, I do not accept that the committee has um, been unable to make, uh, through public hearings, to be my, uh, to me, has been unable to make further progress in this matter. There are extremely important constitutional, legal and procedural questions at stake here which now hang in the air because uh, the committee did not proceed to get further evidence on a number of points. But let me make uh, the uh, point coming out of uh, the submission by myself, Senator Nettle and uh, Mr Organ, the member for Cunningham, clear. Uh, the the uh, sittings on the 23rd and 24th in the House uh, were, were nevertheless a sitting of the Senate. And the authority of the Speaker in the House did not extend uh, to treating the Senate uh, in the way uh, which unfolded. The, uh, the Senate, uh, there is no constitutional authority uh, on the first point for the Speaker of the House to prohibit senators from attending a meeting of the Senate, as occurred. There is no authority for the House to do that. And I believe that if the matter were taken to the High Court, the High Court would find so. It's not uh, constitutionally valid for the Speaker of the House to be directing senators as to whether or not they can attend a meeting of the Senate. Yet that is what occurred. Uh, that is not acceptable. And no, Senate, and no, no uh, privileges committee should have found that uh, irresolvable uh, or in some way a matter that could not uh, be found, uh, uh, found upon. It was wrong. It was constitutionally invalid. It was an affront to this Senate. It was not defended by the President of the Senate as it should have been. And it remains um, a, a wrong to two senators and to the electorate of this country that two senators were prohibited 
uh, by the Speaker of another place from attending a meeting of their Senate on the 24th of October, and the Privileges Committee should have found so. On the matter of uh, the scuffle at the back of the House, which was irresolvable, uh, as we submitted to the committee, Senator Nettle was very clearly restrained by an attendant of the House. There is the question uh, of competing evidence about uh, Senator Lightfoot's elbows being used against uh, both Senator Nettle and myself. There is um, pictorial evidence of uh, that event. On both occasions, uh, an assault took place. And were it other senators, I believe the matter would have been taken further. But it happens on this occasion that it's two senators from minor parties on the crossbench. It is unforgivable that any senator going about her or his business. Order, Senator Brown. Senator Campbell. Mr. Acting Deputy President, I would guess that making an accusation of assault against another senator is a breach of standing orders. Um, under Standing Order 193.3, Senator Brown, you may not reflect upon the character of another senator. I have not uh, reflected upon the character, but uh, let me say, uh, in no uncertain terms, that uh, the submission we put to the Privileges Committee was that uh, this was, uh, in effect, Senator an assault Brown, and therefore a Order breach. Senator Brown. Senator Campbell. Order, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. Making an accusation of an assault against a senator is clearly a breach of the standing order you've referred to. You cannot other than reflect on someone's character by accusing them of assault. It's a very serious charge, and it is a reflection on that senator's character. And I ask you to insist that the senator withdraw that reference. Um, just a moment, Senator Ray. Senator Ray. Um, if uh, Senator Brown uh, wishes to make a direct accusation against a senator here, I concur with Senator Campbell's objection. But if he is quoting from a submission that invited him to make a submission on the whole range of activities, he's quoting from that and it wasn't disallowed by the committee and it wasn't, I believe he's entitled to refer to that because it's in the published documents of the report I've just presented. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a trickier one than simply saying you can't make an accusation. On the other hand, we don't want to set a precedent for putting in submissions that you can then quote in here that had breached standing orders. I, I do think Senator Brown is within standing orders, uh, albeit to be advised to be careful in what he says. Um, Senator Brown, you may not reflect on the character of a senator. Therefore, you may not accuse a senator of committing a crime. Um, I would ask you to be careful in the choice of your language. Proceed. Yes, thank you, Acting Deputy President, and I will. And I uh, refer uh, senators to the submission that uh, I made with Senator Nettle and Mr Organ to this committee, which outlines the, um, the point of view we have about the events that took place at the back of the chamber of the House of Representatives. We remain aggrieved and uh, we do not accept that the matter was not resolvable. Uh, we believe that had this occurred uh, to other members of parliament in, in other circumstances, than the visit of President Bush, there would have been hell to pay. But because uh, of the concentration of the mind on the, uh, de in the defence of the President of the United States, uh, then the actions that took place uh, and the, the, um, the events that took place at the back of the chamber seem in some way or other to be acceptable. We do not accept that. We, we uh, remain aggrieved, and we believe the committee should have found so. Uh, should have uh, at least investigated this matter uh, to discover the truth. There is ample footage of what occurred. There is ample evidence on what occurred. 
And um, I remain aggrieved. I'm sure Senator Nettle does that uh, the matter has not, has not been resolved. I believe the committee has ducked on, on this matter, and I don't accept that. When it comes to the presence in the parliament of foreign service agencies, ag uh, agents who directed uh, the speaker's attention to the pres presence of guests of the Greens uh, Tibetan and Chinese uh, uh, Australians of Chinese uh, background in the uh, gallery and the redirection of those um, guests to the school in last enclosures um, above the galleries, uh, I remain appalled at this procedure. How can this parliament? How can this parliament allow secret service agents from China or anyone else? to be uh, directing or helping conduct its affairs. This was an egregious mistake by the Speaker. He has uh, made it clear that he invited these agents into this parliament to help in the policing of the events of that day. This is an affront to the dignity of this parliament and to this country. It should never have occurred. It should never occur again. But where is the remonstrance from the committee on this matter? It's not there. And it should be. The question as to whether there were armed secret service agents from the US or China has not been resolved here. We, put in the, uh, we have submitted to the committee that that was the case. The committee should have uh, and could have well discovered whether that were the case or not. You don't have to go to other governments to find that out. I believe the president knows the answer to that question. And in our submission, we say from the evidence uh, and from the president's uh, own submission that armed guards were in the chamber as those meetings took place. And that in itself threatened the security of uh, members of parliament. It is not an acceptable practice for anybody from another country to come into the chambers of this parliament with guns. It is not acceptable, and the committee should have found so. On the uh, matter of the uh, future attendance of uh, presidents or heads of state just before I get to that, on the matter of the uh, press, the Australian press being given equal rights uh, to uh, cover events like the uh, visits of President Bush and President Hu to the Australian Parliament and uh, the presence of a, uh, an American film crew in the gallery, that matter could have been resolved. It did not require um, a trip to Washington or to CNN to discover that. There is clear evidence uh, that uh, people acting on behalf of the news agencies and uh, working with the, Prime Ministers, uh, the Department of Prime Minister uh, were able to make that arrangement. Why was the matter not further looked into? It should have been, and a finding should have come out of, in the committee's report. It is not acceptable again, that uh, news agencies from another country were given a privilege, I submit, through the Department of Prime Minister, that uh, news agencies in this country were denied. It is simply not acceptable. And the committee could have discovered the facts and could have made a finding on that, but has failed to do so. And uh, in, in uh, so doing, this report is not acceptable. On the final matter, that in future, visiting heads of state should uh, go to the House of Representatives and we go and uh, sit at the back and watch on is, not, is also not acceptable to this senator. We are equal houses of parliament. The place for uh, visiting heads of state is the great hall of this parliament. There is not constitutional provision, and that is in the submission— Order, Senator Brown. Time has expired. Acting
Order, Senator Brown. Time has, time has expired. Senator Bartlett. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Deputy President. This is an important report. Uh, I guess Committee of Privileges reports are always important in one sense because privileges is a very important matter, but this one obviously deals with uh, it's probably one of the few privileges reports where there is a matter of some significant public interest in it. Uh, can I say from the start, uh, I think uh, this is often the case, particularly in trying to get a unanimous report, as is particularly desirable from a Privileges Committee. Uh, it highlights the difficulties of some of the issues that the committee was requested to address. Um, there's no doubt that the incident and everything's happened since uh, President Bush's address to Parliament has been um, uh, attempts to exploit uh, maximum publicity value out of that, but that doesn't negate the fact that there are some serious issues to address, and I think we need to focus on those. I'd firstly say that there's no doubt that the treatment of the uh, Australian media and the, uh, not just the unequal treatment compared to foreign media, but also just the um, uh, inappropriate and inadequate uh, arrangements were clearly unacceptable, and uh, I don't think there's, there's any doubt about that. And that must be addressed. Uh, it highlights uh, the problem of joint sittings. These are concerns the Democrats raised before uh, we agreed to these um, uh, addresses from the presidents of China and the US in the uh, House of Representatives chamber. Uh, I moved a motion that those addresses be heard in the Great Hall as uh, being a more appropriate location for ceremonial activities. Uh, that was not accepted. Uh, by, um, by the Senate, and I think that's unfortunate. I uh, remain of the view that the Great Hall is a more appropriate location for these types of addresses. Um, we do have many functions in that location, from visiting heads of state uh, with uh, usually lunches, but where they make speeches, uh, where there are speeches in reply. Uh, it all works fine, and I really don't see a problem with it. <coughs> um, indeed, uh, the, the media arrangements for those seem to work fine as well, uh, and it's actually a much more um, uh, egalitarian sort of arrangements because everybody is able to sit as equals in the in the, everybody that's invited is able to sit as equals there, uh, not just members of parliament, diplomatic uh, staff, uh, uh, spouses, media are all able to sit in the same space, uh, and I think it's a it's a better arrangement all round. And it's very much one that I would uh, urge senators to consider again in future. The Democrats put a, uh, a submission into this inquiry. Um, set my colleague Senator Murray, on behalf of the party, the parliamentary wing of the party, put in a submission. Uh, I'd reaffirm our recommendation that for events that are not constitutionally determined, so uh, joint sittings under double dissolution um, powers, that. Uh, future assemblies of men members and senators for uh, these sorts of purposes should not be held in the chamber of either house, should not be attempted to constitute as meetings of either house, um, and that would um, enable the Great Hall arrangement, if we were going to go down that path of it being a meeting of either house, it would be on the basis that it is a meeting of one guest at which the other house are guests. I think that would still cause problems, frankly, because any type of uh, arrangement or meeting such as we had in the House of Representatives with the addresses from the presidents of the US and China uh, would still have all of the appearances of a parliamentary um, sitting. Uh, and if the senators were there as guests, uh, it's, it's not an arrangement that I'd be comfortable of. I think it undermines the uh, what might seem symbolic, but to me is very important, of the uh, equality um, between the two houses. And uh, I think anything other than that would be a problem. Um, the other aspect, I guess, if we are invited as guests, is it would leave open uh, the prospect of uh, individual senators being excluded, as happened on this occasion. Uh, and uh, if you're being invited as guests, and I presume it's open for them to invite some of us and not others of us. And uh, in that sense, I suppose, if that's the context in which we put the, uh, the meetings that happened with the uh, presidents of the US and China, uh, then that's basically what happened. The, um, the uh, speaker decided not to invite two senators back the next day, and I think that's that's far from ideal. And uh, all of the the fact that the committee basically has said they're not able to come to a conclusion because of the uh, 
unresolved questions about the constitutional status of such meetings simply shows that we shouldn't have it. A very, very bad idea to have meetings when it's uncertain what their status is, what the status of privileges is uh, in relation to those things. Uh, so uh, I think that's an important uh, point, and I think particularly given the committee can't come to a conclusion on this that it highlights again, let's not make the same mistakes, let's, let's not go down this path again. Um, there, there were clearly some, some inappropriate activity and behaviour that, that happened in that uh, chamber in the House of Representatives. Uh, I might say that there's inappropriate activity and behaviour that happens in that chamber every day uh, that, that they're sitting, and uh, uh, maybe it was a bit of uh, just the atmospherics of being in the House of Representatives chamber that caused everybody to, um, to behave less, uh, in a less dignified way than they normally do. Um, perhaps it's a better reason for us to stay in the Senate where uh, uh, there's normally higher standards of behaviour and uh, going down to that place seems to have uh, brought us down to their level. I mean, I've said um, uh, publicly that I, I thought the behaviour by um, Senator Brown, Senators Brown and Nettle in interjecting in the way they did was not appropriate um, and uh, expressed it on one occasion in a way that was probably inappropriate itself. Uh, but uh, as these submissions also show, there was certainly inappropriate behaviour by other parliamentarians um, and certainly another senator, and uh, clear indications of offensive language being used, uh, as well as um, physical behaviour that uh, another senator, senator certainly perceived as being um, inappropriate and confronting, and the language being inappropriate. Um, I mean, we all say things that we shouldn't say or lose our temper from time to time, and uh, I think the key thing there is uh, obviously to try and avoid that happening too often, but when it does happen, to acknowledge it and apologise. And I think that's uh, appropriate for um, um, any other uh, senators or members who um, did use inappropriate uh, language or, um, or aggressive or threatening behaviour. It's a fairly simple thing to do, uh, and I think it would be a, a wise thing to do. But uh, I don't, um, certainly don't want to be seen to be uh, preaching on, on this sort of issue. I don't like to be seen to be preaching on any issue, and certainly not this one. Um, for fairly obvious reasons, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's a, an issue in terms of inappropriate behaviour wherever it is and uh, acknowledging that and um, addressing it. There's also an issue of uh, the, the, uh, the separate issue, if you like, of uh, what to do um, in relation to uh, the formal proceedings of a, a parliament and that highlights the problem here. The status of the sittings wasn't clear who said what, who did what, you know, there's, there's clear enough evidence there about what people did and I guess you know, people can make their own judgments about that and if, if people want to say what they said was fine or what they did was fine, well that's, that's for them to do and uh, I guess the facts can speak for themselves and it's good that this report has the actual submissions published in it. I think that's beneficial. Uh, I have to say in my own view, in hindsight, after the um, Chinese president uh, sitting through that, that I, I probably should have followed Senator Harradine's example and not attended at all, um, and uh, certainly would have resolved the problem of whether or not to uh, be invited to attend. I think one other thing this report highlights um, inadvertently, frankly, is the uh, issue of the composition of the Committee of Privileges. I don't cast any aspersions at all on the um, uh, senators that are on it, and, uh, but it's a committee that has four government senators and three opposition senators. The fact that uh, an opposition senator, Senator Ray, is the chair of it, I think gives an indication of the, the high esteem he is held in by the Senate on uh, matters of privilege and appropriateness of, of um, uh, Senate-related activities. Uh, but I do think having a committee with, um, with four Liberals and three Labor members on a matter as important as privileges with no member of crossbench, which is now uh, about one-sixth, over one-sixth the size of the Senate. Uh, is another matter we need to look at. Uh, I think it's time for a bit broader representation on that. Uh, I do acknowledge it's a committee you don't want to politicise at all, but I also think it's important to have uh, the scope for input of a slightly wider range of views. So it's an important report. I think there's lessons for all of us in the whole incident. Uh, the key one for me is uh, don't stuff the media around again uh, in such an inappropriate and ridiculous way. Uh, and secondly, 
uh, don't have these sorts of joint sittings in um, or pretend joint sittings in, in parliamentary chambers again. Let's have them in the Great Hall. It's a very good venue. It actually fits more people and it's a, a more appropriate location. The question is that the Senate... Seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Eggleston. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> On behalf of Senator Colbeck, <coughs> I present the sixth report of the Publications Committee and it moves that the report be adopted. <coughs> Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Eagleston. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Chair of the Environment, Communications, Information Technology and the Arts Legislation Committee, which is myself, <coughs> I present additional information received by the committee relating to parliamentary hearings on the budget estimates for 2003-2004. Do I have to move receipt? Senator Lundy. Thank you. On behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, I present the 399th report of the committee entitled Inquiry into the Management, of in Management and Integrity of Electronic Information in the Commonwealth and move that the Senate take note of the report. I also seek leave to incorporate a tabling statement in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The question is so that... I I thought you incorporated your tabling statement. No, I incorporated the tabling statement from the chair, but I would also seek leave to speak. Um, you don't need leave to speak, Senator Lundy. Well, thank you. You'll give me the call then. Yes, you have thank the call. Thank you. I am pleased to be able to table this report of the Joint Committee on Public Accounts and Audit, the inquiry into the management and integrity of electronic information in the Commonwealth in the Senate today. The inquiry into the management and integrity of electronic information in the Commonwealth, which is a long way of saying e-security in the public sector, so I'll refer to it as e-security, is a comprehensive expose of the ignorance and neglect perpetrated by the Howard government in ensuring that the Commonwealth's information systems are as secure as, as can be reasonably achieved. By way of introduction, it's important to put the issue of e-security into the broader context of the security debate. The Howard government has spent a lot of time and energy purporting to be a government concerned about security. However, when tested, the Howard government has little credibility on the home front. The political strategy of John Howard has been to ride off the coattails of US President George W. Bush using the rhetoric of fear, even to the point of distributing fridge magnets to remind everyone there is reason to be fearful. Labor contends that if the Howard government were serious about the war on terror and the potential threat facing Australia and Australians, then it would have been more focused on genuine homeland security strategies and far less sycophantic in its eagerness to join the US in Iraq. It is not lost on anyone that Australia's vulnerability to attack has been heightened as a result of this. The Labor opposition has been able to expose this lack of commitment to security in Australia through our diligence and this has come to light in a number of areas, including insufficient customs and airport security. It's this lack of genuine commitment to security, generally here in Australia, and e-security specifically, that is systematically laid out in the report I am tabling on behalf of the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit today. The terms of reference to this inquiry were focused and covered the privacy and confidentiality and integrity of Commonwealth information, the management and transmission of data, security thereof, and the adequacy of the legislative and guidance framework. Following many hearings and submissions, the committee has been able to agree to a series of recommendations that by their nature and urgency give light to the serious failings in this area under the Howard government. The committee was surprised by the lack of uniform e-security standards, the ad hoc adherence to what e-security guidelines there are, and the inability for any agency anywhere in the Commonwealth to be able to report accurately on the collective state of e-security, including breaches thereof. 
This is perhaps the most concerning thing. The executive government in this country doesn't know what the security status of the Commonwealth is, and they have not cared enough to ask the question. It took this reference to the Joint Committee for Public Accounts in order to uncover this disgraceful hypocrisy. This means that the lip service paid to the Howard government's e-security agenda, coordinated by the National Office of the Information Economy, previously was not effective. There was a lot of talk and a very expensive public key scheme called Gatekeeper, but there was very little substance beyond rhetoric. In fact, where there has been any activity, given the lack of mandated regulatory requirements in this area, due credit can be given to public servants because they have had no policy leadership from the Howard government. It should also be noted that the activity generated by this inquiry has by far reached beyond any effort by the Howard government to require agencies and departments to act. This is also a bipartisan report, which I think underlines the seriousness of the unaddressed issues in e-security. The concern that e-security be addressed transcends the sharper wedge politics of security that the Howard government has been desperate to play. It is also a reflection on the integrity of the Joint Public Accounts and Audit Committee members and their collective preparedness to say just how it is. The result is a report that does not seek to sensationalise the issues and problems, nor do any committee members purport to be experts in the field. Rather, we have actively pursued facts as they relate to the terms of reference and then reflect on the, reflected on the evidence and submissions that came before us. The recommendations, of which there are nine, carry a similar theme in that they recommend diligence, organisation, preparation, implementation and analysis of e-security and risks and strategies relating to it across the Commonwealth. The committee identifies agencies to be responsible for certain functions. NOE previously had a coordination role, but given Labor announced that we would be abolishing NOE and the Howard government later concurred with this, various agencies have been nominated through the recommendations to handle the implementation of an e-security strategy, including Defence Signals Directorate, Attorney General's Department, Prime Minister and Cabinet and the Australian Government Information Management Office within the Department of Communications, Information Technology and the Arts. The committee traversed, through, the, through brief, both briefings and evidence, the sort of breaches that can occur on information networks, such as viruses, denial of service attacks, identity fraud, as well as the countermeasures to deal with these problems. A key area identified was the lack of a uniform reporting system for theft and loss and breaches of information systems. Astoundingly, some approaches to e-security meant that some agencies did not report the theft of equipment to police and did not bother to report under the existing, albeit non-compulsory, reporting system, uh, non-universally compulsory reporting system, DSD's Information Security Incident Detection Reporting and Analysis System, or ISIDRAS. Recommendation 5 urges DSD to reiterate to agencies and departments their responsibility to comply with this reporting system. The use of encryption to protect data and authenticate online exchanges was investigated, culminating in the committee's recommendation number 9 that the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet review and report to the committee on the effectiveness of gatekeeper versus other commercially available public key in infrastructure products and systems. It should be noted that Gatekeeper is a system as opposed to a product in this area. Complaints were received and acknowledged about the complexity and costs associated and potential conflicts of interest with gaining security product evaluation and approval under DSD's ASEP uh, program. ASEP stands for the Australian Information Security Evaluation Program. Um, and the committee. Um, the committee uh, recommends uh, and notes that this process could be improved remarkably in both efficiency and cost. For example, evidence presented relating, uh, sorry, but as the inquiry proceeded, it became clear that an even more fundamental area of security was being neglected. Um, an example is the evidence presented to. Uh, well, evidence presented to the committee relating to the disgraceful handling of a physical security breach at Sydney Airport involving the theft of a number of computers, and this exposed the fact that many agencies and departments did not have a physical security plan for information assets such as desktop, desktop computers and servers. Hence recommendation one of the report is a 101 of e-security. Have a plan. One of the more disturbing breaches, um, again, was one 
uh, that involved Telstra's loss of a whole month worth of electronic backup tapes. These tapes were never recovered and are presumed to have been thrown out with the rubbish as they were, quite bizarrely, stored in a wheelie bin. The committee was dissatisfied with the vagueness of responses by Telstra on this matter. But the recommendation goes further. The committee has identified DSD to act as a watchdog to ensure that these plans are developed and report back to the committee. Recommendation three relates to the conditions by which portable IT devices should be distributed in an effort to minimise the extraordinary level of theft and loss across the Commonwealth. The committee found that over 1,000 laptop computers had been lost by the Commonwealth agencies in the last five years. Another area focused on was the impact of an IT outsourcer in relation to e-security. The committee found evidence that security was weaker where the functions were substantially outsourced in that obligations were the content of commercial and confidence contracts and sanctions for breaches were either non-existent or unable to be applied, i.e. that really meant the loss of the contract. There was also a risk of buck passing and poor information sharing and clear evidence of poor communication between IT outsourcers and agencies in relation to security incidents. Given that so many outsourcers are foreign companies and litigation is possibly the result of ultimately determining contractual disputes and, disputes and liability, the Commonwealth's vulnerability is enhanced overall by, by virtue of the vertically integrated model of IT outsourcing. Um, another issue relates to the potential for offshoring IT services in the context of e-security. The committee was assured that no Commonwealth data was kept offshore and therefore I would expect that any disputes would fall under Australia's jurisdiction. There are, there are more recommendations that relate importantly to the issue of the use of open source and the committee believes that agencies should consider the benefits or otherwise of open source as a normal part of IT risk management processes. I'd like to conclude on the prospects of e-security. In the continued absence of policy in this area, it's really up to the agencies and departments themselves to take the initiative, read this report and act on the recommendations. It's clear that um, the efforts the government has made in this matter to date have not been adequate. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members and committee secretariat, past and present, as well as the submitters and witnesses, and also, in conclusion, acknowledge the work of the Australian National Audit Office on reporting on these matters previously. The question is that the Senate take note of the report. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Eggleston. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy Chairman. On behalf of the Chair of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee, Senator Sandy Macdonald, I present the Hansard record of the committee's proceedings and additional information by the, received by the committee relating to supplementary hearings on the budget estimates for 2003-2004. And now, on behalf of the Chair of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee, Senator Sandy Macdonald, I present the report of the committee on the 2003-2004 additional additional estimates, together with the Hansard record of the committee's proceedings, and I move that the report be printed. The question is that the report be printed. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Call the clerk. Have some messages. A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment representation in the House of Representatives Bill 2004 for a concurrence. Call the Minister. Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that the bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. To amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I move that the bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Oh, sorry, is leave granted? There being no. Senator Buckland? I move the debate be adjourned. The uh, question is that uh, the debate be adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that the resumption of the debate be made an order of the day for a later hour of this day. The question is that, on the question, those of that opinion say aye, against say no, I think the ayes have it. Thank you. 
A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the Law and Justice Legislation Amendment Bill 2004 for concurrence. Call the Minister. Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that the bill may proceed without the formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend various acts relating to law and justice and for related purposes. Call the Minister. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, I move that the bill be now read a second time. And uh, as well, I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned until the first day of the next period of sittings. A message has been received from the House of Representatives acquainting the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate in the Energy Grants Cleaner Fuels Scheme Bill 2003. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one adjourned debate on the motion of Senator Coonan that the resumption be resumed of the Customs Tariff Amendment Bill number two, 2003, and the Excise Tariff Amendment Bill number one, 2003. Minister. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, I, I want to uh, table some documents at the, at the uh, resumption of this debate. I just want to uh, mention to the Senate the background to the tabling of the documents. The Senate has previously requested access to documents related to ethanol through a return to order in October 2002. As Senators would be aware, similar documents were sought under the Freedom of Information Act and a number of documents were released during 2003. Following discussion between the government and the Democrats, particularly Senator Allison, the government uh, agrees to release to the Senate those documents previously released under the FOI Act. I table a schedule listing all of the documents provided by the Departments of Prime Minister and Cabinet, uh, Industry, Tourism and Resources, uh, Treasury and Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry uh, pursuant to those FOI requests. I also uh, table documents provided under the FOI Act from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and the Prime Minister's Office. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, this goes some way towards meeting the Senate's request for production of documents. The remaining documents uh, released under FOI will be collated and tabled by the next parliamentary uh, session. Uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, I, I do think that I should uh, extend thanks to the Democrats for their assistance, which does actually now allow us to debate uh, this very important, very vital piece of uh, legislation before us. Senator Allison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, Democrats will be supporting the government's um, rescission motion to bring on the Excise Tariff Amendment Bill and the Customs Tariff Amendment Bill. Uh, since consideration of these bills was postponed on the 10th of September last year uh, until the government complied with the order for the production of documents uh, that was made on the 16th of October 2002, uh, the government, as the minister has indicated, has now tabled uh, a number of those documents and responded to the ALP's freedom of information request by uh, providing documents on the list that I understand the minister will also table and which I too have um, here. Uh, in fact, the documents uh, requested of the, of the Prime Minister and Cabinet Department uh, were provided, as I understand it, on June, uh, in June 2003, and those that were requested of the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries provided in December last year. Um, the Democrats are keen to see that uh, the government takes the matter of documents much more seriously than they do, and for this reason we supported the return to order and the adjournment of this debate. The delay in dealing with these and the Energy Grants Bill has been, um, gladly, very productive. Uh, the breathing space uh, may have, in fact, saved the alternative fuels industry. However, we uh, don't support the motive behind the, behind the ALP's interest in these documents and we don't think that they are sincere in wanting to know the full information, to use um, the language, about the government's consideration of policy on ethanol. I think the Prime Minister did make, um, make 
errors of judgment and his response to questions about uh, meeting dates don't match the documents that were discovered under FOI. Uh, it's also obvious that the government has lurched from one knee-jerk reaction uh, to another in this whole issue, and uh, I would offer the view that this is not a sensible way to run the country. The Democrats do say it is appropriate for the government to take steps to protect the local industry from unreasonable competition from overseas. The Prime Minister set a target of 350 uh, million litres of ethanol by the year 2007 uh, to go into petrol, and ethanol imported from Brazil would wipe out any prospect of a viable ethanol fuel transport industry to meet that target in this country. The ALP have managed to persuade the press that the imposition of a 38 cent a litre excise on ethanol, offset by a grant for the same amount to the local producers, was a massive subsidy. In fact, it cost taxpayers nothing. The decision did affect uh, Trafigura and uh, Newman Petroleum, two fuel suppliers who are in the throes of importing Brazilian ethanol, uh, and in my view their costs should have been compensated. However, the arrangement will protect all ethanol producers and uh, the future of the industry. And I might say it's a rare case of, uh, of uh, seeing governments in this country putting Australia's interests ahead of the ideologically driven level playing field that we are so, uh, so accustomed to, including from the ALP. It is the case that Manildra produces around 80 million litres of uh, ethanol a year as a byproduct from wheat starch and waste material, which is 90 uh, per cent of the ethanol used in transport fuel at present. With the passage of today's legislation, hopefully there will be many more producers around Australia over the next few years producing ethanol from a wide range of feedstock. The ALP is not interested in the policy reasons for establishing a viable ethanol, biodiesel or other alternative fuel industry in this country. It's not interested in the environmental benefits of E10 or CNG or LPG. And if you want to look at the debate on this issue, you won't find much by way of air quality benefits from ALP senators even though ethanol blends reduce carbon monoxide, total hydrocarbons, uh, 1 to 3 butadiene, uh, benzene, toluene and xylenes, and in some cases nit nitrogen oxides and smog. And you won't find much by way of debate from the ALP or the government on the advantages of ethanol being a renewable energy uh, fuel or the fact that its production costs are a lot higher than for petrol. Senator Conroy, uh, I'm sure I'll listen to you, your contribution to this debate in silence. It would be helpful if uh, you allowed me to do the same. Um, so production costs are a lot higher for ethanol than for petrol, at least for now. I think new technology is going to make a difference to that in the future, and, uh, and a as will economies of scale as production increases. Uh, even large ethanol producers in Brazil, which in total produce 12 billion litres a year, uh, quite, a, quite a difference from 350 million litres, uh, and in the US, which produces 7 billion litres a year, they, they also receive government assistance for this very reason. So the ALP was quite happy to see excise imposed on alternative fuels in 2008 and made no complaints about it being set at the same rate as petrol for energy content. We're, they're very happy to see LPG's excise-free status as a drain on revenue, even though we don't hear a word about the fact that the freeze on petrol excise indexation is costing billions in revenue foregone in this country. The ALP says these documents would reveal special advantageous arrangements that apply to Manildra in return for political donations. Well, it turns out that Manildra has received nothing that other ethanol producers are not also entitled to. The so-called subsidy and the capital grant of 16 cents a litre for new or expanded facilities to a maximum of uh, $10 million until the total production re reaches 350 megalitres, or by the 30th of June 2007, whichever comes sooner, are available to the whole industry. We think it's important for us to deal with this legislation today. The ALP has scored its political points off the government, and it's true that uh, the key beneficiary of the arrangements that are currently in place is Manildra, but that's because they produce the most ethanol. There is not much we don't know about who met with whom uh, and on what date, and there are good reasons to support all the ethanol and biofuel uh, producers, and a reasonable time frame is now in place, as of uh, yesterday's passage of legislation for phasing out the grants that offset the excise. So, uh, Madam Chair, I think it, it is time for us to wrap up this debate today and uh, we'll be supporting passage of the bill. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it.
Uh, division required. Ring the bells. Doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Coonan be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes will pass to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Eggleston, teller for the ayes, uh, Senator Buckland, teller for the noes.
order the result of the division there being 35 ayes and 22 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Clark. Government business order of the day, customs tariff amendment bill number 2, 2003, and excise tariff amendment bill number 1, 2003. Second reading, adjourned debate. Senator O'Brien. Mr. President, the uh, resolution just carried permits the commencement of the debate on these two order pieces. Senator O'Brien, if senators could uh, vacate the chamber quickly, please. Senator O'Brien. As I was saying, uh, the resolution uh, carried by the Senate uh, permits the debate on these two pieces of uh, legislation, and uh, it's significant, of course, that that was as a result of an agreement, obviously, uh, between the Democrats and the government about a, uh, a watering down of uh, the Senate's return to order and the partial compliance with that return to order being accepted by the Democrats as justifying proceeding. Um, I can't say that I'm amazed by that process. What I am surprised at and disappointed about is that uh, Senator Allison personally and Senator Allison's staff undertook to advise my office of the detail of the arrangement, but no such advice was received and the first actual knowledge we have of the detail of the arrangement was Senator Allison speaking in the chamber. Now, um, that's a matter for Senator Allison to reflect upon. Uh, I uh, believe that uh, uh, where an undertaking is given, it ought to be honoured, uh, and uh, I'm disappointed that in this case that it wasn't. Our concern about the information base for uh, the proceeding with this proceeding with this legislation, I think, has been amplified by the evidence of what has been a uh, an arrangement which was put in place, in particular, uh, in attempting to deal with with freedom of information requests that I made when the government refused to comply with a return to order. And the evidence that I've uncovered reveals that uh, Minister McFarlane, uh, Mr McFarlane's department or its officers were directed to establish a special interdepartmental committee to coordinate the government's response to my freedom of information applications. In fact, uh, I believe an uh, interdepartmental committee was formed and did meet on the 11th of March uh, last year in uh, the Minister's Department's Alara Street offices and officers from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Treasury, Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestries and Foreign Affairs and Trade were present. I also understand that uh, Minister McFarlane's department was advised that the operation of this interdepartmental committee was improper and a clear breach of the Freedom of Information Act. Now, I think that indicates the seriousness with which the government um, took the question of whether the information that they held might reveal something that would embarrass them and would reveal something that was perhaps improper in terms of their dealing with Manildra, and hence their reluctance to provide the information. Um, there are coincidental uh, um, uh, matters which were raised by Mr McMullen in the other place, uh, for example, that the Australian Electoral Commission returns reveal that on the 17th of December 2002, a critical time in the timetable of commitments given to the opposition about uh, complying with the original return to order, the National Party received a donation of $50,000 from Manildra. Um, our concern has been the intertwining of the interests of Manildra with the interests of the government and the, the uh, uh, ability to uncover just how much of the policy framework of the government was driven by the interests of the ethanol industry in a general sense and how much was driven by the interests of Manildra and, in particular, the relationship between the government and the company, uh, which has been in part revealed 
and only revealed by the freedom of information process that I undertook. Now, Senator Allison mightn't think that's important, but I know that the public and certainly the, uh, the uh, media believe that it is an important matter and it's uh, attracted a great deal of intention, attention. And uh, uh, it's a matter which I believe will attract further attention as these matters are further revealed. It is a matter of regret uh, that the government has been able to engineer a deal with the Democrats and apparently uh, uh, some others to resume the second reading debate on these bills in these circumstances. Uh, and uh, the Senate originally took a principal decision on the 12th of August last year that we wouldn't give further consideration to the government's ethanol excise and tariff bills until it complied with the order of the, for the production of documents revealing the full details of the government's dirty deal with Manildra, in my, in my view. But having said that, the, the bills are, uh, themselves are simple and ne Labor has never opposed them. But we've said if the government wanted us to consider them, we wanted the government to reveal the details of the deal that it had cooked up with Australia's largest ethanol producer and one of the coalition's largest political donors, which, is, which was, in our view, uh, I think, with, uh, clearly uh, cooked up behind closed doors. Uh, closed doors that are now known to include the Prime Minister's and a matter revealed only through the provision of a document provided to me under freedom of information, a document which would have never seen the light of day had the opposition not pursued this matter quite properly. Yesterday I outlined the undertakings which were given by uh, uh, Senator Ian Campbell, uh, the Manager of Government Business, on a number of occasions in this place to comply with the order of uh, the Senate. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's a matter upon which uh, uh, we're entitled to remark that notwithstanding those very clear commitments, unequivocal commitments, the order for production of documents has not been in any way complied with until today and only then producing uh, some of the documents, apparently, because I haven't seen what's been tabled, which have been produced by a series of freedom of information requests and a process which has involved uh, pursuing those requests, even to taking matters to the Ombudsman. So it's been, frankly, a matter of uh, proceeding by almost pulling teeth from the government, or it's been as difficult as pulling teeth, I should say, to get this information. Um, now, Senator Allison said a number of things in the Hansard, which I uh, referred to in the uh, previous debate in this matter. I'm not going to uh, repeat them again. Uh, the Chamber, I, I refer to my contribution yesterday because they do detail what the Democrats and Senator Allison were describing as, as a get tough position on the government on returns to order at this place. Well, that get tough position ends today. The get tough position that Senator Allison talked about, but not just Senator Allison, because I also recall the words of Senator Bartlett, now the, now the leader of the Democrats on the 26th of March last year, and I do want to refer to those because I think they further enhance the contribution of Senator Allison, which had previously been made in this debate. Senator Bartlett said, I think this is an issue that non-government parties need to look at it a bit more closely in terms of whether we should take more specific action in response to frequent contempts of the Senate. And he went on, it's an issue that is of growing concern to the Democrats, and certainly I would indicate an interesting discussing with the main opposition party whether there are prospects for taking some action that might indicate our displeasure in a more specific, clear-cut and concrete way that might more openly discourage the government from continuing along that line. Uh, and we gave the uh, Democrats, uh, Senator Bartlett uh, uh, and the other Democrats, an opportunity in August to do that, and they joined with us, and that uh, uh, unity of purpose, as I say, ended today. Uh, is that relevant to this debate? Well, yes. The documents that we've been requesting go to the very heart of the policy matter in the legislation before us. And so uh, we will find it very hard to take the Democrats seriously in this regard in the future because the next time the Democrats want to talk about the importance of orders of the Senate or the need for the government to be more accountable, then I'll be urging senators to remember this caving. And uh, I'm pretty sure the government won't forget uh, they've had another victory today, another little win courtesy of the Democrats, and uh, um, they'll be uh, quietly having a little chuckle, I'm sure. But uh, 
uh, that's a matter which we will move on from uh, having clearly uh, recalled the sort of comments that the Democrats have made about uh, their position in this matter. But as I've indicated the, the, uh, previously, the bills before this chamber are simple in nature. The Customs Tariff Amendment Bill No. 2 contains amendments to the Customs Tariff Act of 1995. The amendments impose an additional custom duty of 38.143 cents per litre on ethanol for use as fuel in an internal combustion engine. The rate of duty is the same as the rate currently applying to petrol. Uh, the Excise Tariff Amendment Bill No. 1 of 2003 amends the Excise Tariff Act of 1921 to validate the changes made by Excise Tariff Proposal No. 4 of 2002. This proposal removed the excise exemption from fuel ethanol from the 18th of September 2002 and imposed an excise duty rate equivalent to that applying to petrol, currently 38.143 cents per litre. Uh, I do regret that Labor is considering these bills without the provision of the information that we need to fully consider the government's process of consideration of ethanol policy, but uh, we will not oppose the passage of these bills on that basis, we would be happier if we had that information. Senator Allison. Uh, thanks, Chair. I wasn't planning to make a further contribution to this debate. Um, I've, I've said it all in the previous motion, um, but I, I perhaps we'll respond to Senator O'Brien very, very briefly to say that we, uh, we are still keen to pursue that question of um, government responses to return to order. I think it is a, a critical, a, a critical um, process that, uh, that the Senate has, and, uh, and we've, been, we've been somewhat uh, slow, I think, in, in pressing the government and using leverage in the way that we did on this bill. So uh, I do acknowledge that, Senator O'Brien, and uh, I'm sure it's not the death of uh, returns to order as we know it. Um, we'll continue to do those for good reason. But as I've said, uh, it, this one's gone on long enough. I think we've got enough documents out of the government to know what, what happened. You may disagree with that, Senator O'Brien, but um, uh, this is the decision that we've come to, and uh, I think it's an appropriate one. Having said that, uh, you know, I must also put on the record that, uh, that it's, it wasn't, um, it, it's not our first position to see excise imposed at all on, on alternative fuels, at least not until, uh, until we have uh, uh, an industry which is viable and one which, uh, which is meeting the targets that the Prime Minister set. However, that's all water under a bridge now. We have a grant scheme in place that's been agreed. We've got a time frame which has been extended, which is a good thing. And uh, I, think the, uh, I think the scene is relatively rosy for uh, those alternative fuels. And uh, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll hold our judgment on that position until uh, a, f a few more years down the track when we see, when we see uh, what happens. So I'm also looking forward to seeing a bit, of, a bit of leadership on the part of the government in particular, but also the ALP. It'd be good for them to come on board and say, yes, um, for those, uh, Madam, uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, cane growers in Queensland, who will be pleased to uh, see another industry that might assist with their, their incomes and, uh, and help some of those regions with new jobs. Um, we'll, we'll all be looking forward to seeing progress on, uh, on this, uh, this important sector of, uh, of uh, transport fuel. So I won't um, prolong debate. Uh, we do all want to get home at um, some, some early stage. Uh, so um, just to indicate that we'll be supporting the bill. Question, Minister. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I was just about to say thank you <laughs> uh, before uh, Senator Conroy uh, intervened. Uh, this is good legislation, uh, Madam Deputy Acting, Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, it's something which uh, uh, deals with the import of ethanol and uh, locally the use of ethanol, bringing it into line with, uh, with petrol. It uh, has been adequately canvassed by other senators. Uh, the previous return to order has been dealt with, uh, we believe, in a satisfactory manner. And uh, I would urge the Senate to, uh, to pass the bill without delay. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Call the clerk. Customs Tariff Amendment Bill No. 2, 2003. Excise Tariff Amendment Bill No. 1, 2003. I call the minister. 
I move the bill be, bills be read a third time. The question is that the bills be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Excise tariff, tariff Amendment Bill No. 1, 2003. Customs Tariff Amendment Bill No. 2, 2003. Government Business Order of the Day No. 2. Textile Clothing and Footwear Strategic Investment Program Amendment Bill 2004. Adjourned debate on the motion for the second reading of the bills and the amendment moved by Senator Carr. Senator Buckland. Thank you, uh, Acting, acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, the Textile Clothing and Footwear Strategic Investment Program Amendment Bill goes some of the way to assist the textile clothing and footwear industry, but we shouldn't become complacent and think this is uh, all that is required to stabilise the whole industry or to protect workers in the industry. It is important to note that the leather and technical sector of the industry are the only beneficiaries of the bill and the whole of the industry remains in a precarious position in relation to the long-term uh, future. And of course, it is an industry that offers only limited security for workers. While for South Australia the industry is not a major employer of people, about 4,000 in total, it is important in that it adds to the diversity of job opportunities and, product, and the Productivity Commission and anecdotal accounts indicate we have the available skills to become more competitive and make a greater contribution to the overall state and uh, national uh, economies with very little notice should we be able to trigger an upturn in trade opportunities. But the longer we go without addressing the problems facing the entire TCF industry, the sooner we will lose the skill base. To do that, we need to improve market access arrangements for TCF exporters. We need to continue funding the strategic investment program uh, for the sector, and we need to consider reversing the government's planned reductions. And if we are serious about staying in this uh, competitive industry, we need to resource an effective um, textile, clothing, and footwear industry council to focus on jobs in the industry and have a focus on high value exports. In government, Labor would do these things. Labor's position in relation to the textile, clothing and footwear industry is not a case of going back in time. It is not a matter of doing something uh, for ideological reasons and it is a matter of doing something uh, for sound policy reasons, good policy policy aimed at encouraging greater innovation, exports and competitiveness. In government, we, establish, we will establish a review panel to get the policy and the industry right. And it will be a panel that will include employer-employee representatives. That way everyone will get to have an input. Labor used this method with the steel industry under the Hawke government in 1983. Having been directly involved in that process, uh, that is the steel uh, uh, industry, the framework of which uh, is still in use today, in that industry we can be confident that the TCF industry will grow and thrive under labour, grow and thrive with good policy. This is in stark contrast to the Howard government's approach to the uh, textile, clothing and footwear industry which abolished Labor's Labor Adjustment Program in 1996, and it is, an it is important to consider the effects of that um, ill-conceived move. In South Australia alone, we saw 1,015 jobs go between 1996 and 2001. That equates to a change in employment share of manufacturing jobs for, for the industry from 8.2 per cent to just over uh, uh, seven per cent, and that's not a bad effort for a government, um, the Howard government, who pretends to care about families and workers. So bad was this move, the government uh, has now somewhat belatedly put up the Structural Adjustment Fund, Labor's Labor Adjustment Program in disguise. This new lap. 
um, is worth $50 million over 10 years. And Acting Deputy President, um, this uh, simply is not enough for an industry as important as the textile, clothing and footwear industry. Labor will have a proper lap with an appropriate funding level, not one that is plucked out of the air. This lap is not going to be, a means, test, not going to be means tested and will aim to assist TCF workers in improving their English and language skills, vocational skills and in finding new employment opportunities. I will support the bill as a means of providing a degree of interim relief for the industry. And I urge all senators to support Labor's second reading amendment. Senator Haradine. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I seek leave to uh, continue uh, with this speech that I was delivering last evening on this particular matter. If leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Harrod. <coughs> thank you. And I thank Senator Buckman for uh, taking uh, my place and uh, thus not wasting the time of the Senate. Um, last night I was talking about a number of things, about the importance of uh, the textile, clothing and footwear industry. Uh, to Australia and particularly to Tasmania and uh, the number of employees that are still, the uh, number of workers in the industry that are still uh, there despite uh, substantial cuts. Uh, I uh, addressed uh, the issue of uh, out workers and uh, the concerns that people have uh, about the uh, type of sweated labour that is um, um, uh, that is imposed upon uh, a number of workers in the industry uh, and of course particularly uh, uh, overseas. Um, I wanted to, I was um, talking about um, the government's uh, provision of assistance to the TCF co uh, companies mainly in the form of the strategic investment program. Uh, this strategic investment uh, program uh, funding is obviously vital to ensure that companies can invest in their equipment to become as competitive as possible. My concern is that the Australian Government um, um, seems to be planning uh, to further reduce tariffs in future years with no reference to the tariff levels of our competitors. Um, I don't think it's reasonable to risk the jobs and lifestyles of uh, TCF workers for the sake of economic purity if our competitors are not matching the tariff reductions. The government should delay the planned 2005 tariff reduction to both allow companies the maximum time to promote efficiencies and to ensure that Tasmanian workers uh, are not forced to leave the state looking for work. Over the past decade, 36 per cent of jobs in the Australian TCF industry were lost as part of the reduction in tariffs. At the same time, Australia's competitors have not been reducing their tariffs at the same rate. Of course, most TCF imports uh, to Australia come from China, a country not known for its uh, commitment to workers' rights or to human rights in general. For example, about 70 per cent of clothing imports are from China. It upsets me that we are seemingly all too willing <coughs> to sacrifice Australian jo workers' jobs to facilitate the export market of a country that pursues continual and blatant human rights abuses, including not permitting workers to organise themselves into independent unions. Chinese workers are only allowed to join government-sanctioned unions. China also jails workers for organising demonstrations. This bill uh, facilitates $747 million provided over 10 years, most of which is for the Strategic Investment Program, to help the TCF industry to continue to develop efficiencies and become more competitive. It targets the SIP 
SIPs are grants to those parts of the TCF industry facing the greatest challenge from tariff reductions. <clears throat> the $747 million is, uh, unfortunately, an effective reduction in the annual SIPs funding. The SIPs scheme is a good program to help the survival of TCF industry, but it needs to provide more investment funds to a stable industry which is not having to deal with tariff cuts. The industry has for many years been undergoing substantial change and adjustment. They, need something, so, so they do need some time for consolidation. I appreciate that following the P Productivity Commission recommendation, tariff levels are now to be held at 2005 levels until 2010. I'm prepared to support the bill, with, uh, together with the second reading uh, amendment by the opposition, as the bill facilitates further, though inadequately, funding for the industry. But I call upon the government, in turn, to support the TCF industry and the whole and the thousands of individuals who work for the industry, each of whom is a real person with real concerns about losing their jobs by halting all tariff reductions until 2010. I thank the Senate. Uh, Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Can I just say, I just want to say a few brief words with regard to this uh, bill, um, but more importantly about the uh, textile clothing footwear industry in this country. And of course, as we've seen over time, the process of tariff reductions have uh, created a lot of difficulties for the industry. Um, and the further tariff reductions proposed will even create more difficulties because we have had to experience international competition and often from very low wage economies um, and often uh, in the case of some uh, producers, some manufacturers, um, almost uh, no wage uh, uh, costs to them and being importers or being exporters into this country have created very serious difficulties for the Australian industry. The proposal to uh, reduce tariffs and continue to reduce tariffs is just one aspect of competition. And to just throw money at the problem without any real strategic view, I have to say, is not a solution. Yes, the SIPs program is a good program, but can I say what we are not doing is that we are not helping the industry look at markets overseas, particularly the smaller producers, the smaller manufacturers. And Austrade, I have to say, has as one of its great failings no capacity demonstrated yet to really assist small and medium enterprises get into markets overseas. And, that, and markets do exist, even in countries like China. If you go to Beijing, for instance, and you go to any of the department stores in Beijing, you will see that many of the clothes, if not the great majority of the clothes, for sale in those department stores are more expensive than they are here in Australia. And that's in Australian dollars. In some cases, for name brands, far more expensive. We do have some opportunities for Australian products to be very successful in what we would generally consider to be third world developing countries. In some of those countries, India, China, uh, have far more wealthier people, far more wealthy people than we have in this country. There would probably be in excess of 300 million millionaires in China. And those people, like anywhere else in the world, look for different products than those that are necessarily manufactured domestically. So, 
That's why I say, in terms of Austrade, in terms of how we support our manufacturing industries into the future, we have to ensure that departments like Austrade, rather than just being interested in $25 billion gas deals, or oil deals or coal or, or iron ore deals, actually have some focus on small to medium enterprises. Because it is not difficult when you try, for instance, to break into the Chinese market. It is a difficult process. There are some serious opportunities that exist in all of those countries, but yet we, we seem to be not taking those opportunities very seriously. And the government departments, in terms of expenditure, saying, well, look, here's another assistance program, sort it out for yourselves, you know, okay on the one hand, but really failing miserably on the other. Because if you look historic, historically at a lot of these programs, you ultimately see the decline of an industry and the loss of an industry. And we really should take a different approach. So I would just say, Madam Acting Deputy President, yes, I will support the bill. I, like Senator Harradine, uh, believe there ought to be a hold on further reduction in tariffs, um, and I will also support the opposition amendments. But uh, I find it very disappointing in respect of uh, government departments like Austrade that seem to have their focus well above the interests of what uh, businesses that make up the vast bulk of business in this country, and that's the small to medium-sized enterprises. Senator Nettle. I begin the Greens' contribution to this debate by putting the bill in its, in its social and economic context and the current challenges that are facing the industry. This bill provides a support package for an industry whose workers have suffered significantly through, reducing, through rolling tariff reductions. Despite the growing evidence of the damage to individual workers, their families and their communities that are caused by rolling tariff reductions, federal governments since the Hawke Labor government seem determined to pursue an ideological market-driven agenda that dictates that tariffs must be, sla must be slashed regardless of the social costs. It's not surprising that there's been a direct linkage between lower tariff rates since 1986 and the lower rates of employment in the TCF industry. Given the nature of the industry, the impact on workers from regional areas, women and those from non-English speaking background has been devastating. The government has relied heavily in their, on the recommendations of the Productivity Commission review in designing this assistance package in the bill. However, as um, the Textile Clothing and Footwear Union and others have pointed out, the Productivity Commission review was based on a number of flawed assumptions. Not the least of these was the laughable assumption that all TCF workers who lose their job as a result of tariff cuts will find a new job. It's an assumption that's simply not borne out by the evidence or the experience of the workers in the industry. The University of Melbourne study has found that one third of all sacked TCF workers will not find another job, and another third will gain only part-time or casual employment. Often the only work experience of these workers has been in the TCF sector, so their skill base outside the industry is minimal. The Department of Employment and Workplace Relations acknowledges that much of the employment loss in the industry has been in occupations not requiring formal education, so these workers are not in a position to be able to easily transfer to another job. A recent report on retrenched TCF workers prepared by Monash University's Centre for Work and Society in the Global Era, known as the Wage Study, also bears this out. For nearly 25 per cent of those surveyed, the job from which they were retrenched was their first job. 36 per cent had worked in their last job for 10 years or more prior to retrenchment. It's entirely unrealistic to expect most TCF workers to move easily into another job as the assumptions of the Productivity Commission review suggests. Most TCF workers are older women and many come from a non-English speaking background. Full-time female TCF employment has been the worst affected by tariff reductions since the late, late 1980s. 
falling from 67,000 workers in 1985 to 30,000 workers in 2002. These are the workers who will be most damaged by the impending tariff reductions. The wage study by Monash University reported that many TCF workers experienced physical ill health, frustration, family tension and marriage breakdown post-retrenchment. It's not the regular pattern of this government to consider the social costs of massive entrenchment of, of retrenchment of workers, particularly when the social costs are difficult to quantify. However, perhaps the federal government should or would be expected to listen to the economic costs of not supporting these workers. The TCFU estimates that the cost to the federal government of providing unemployment benefits alone will be $750 million by 2020. The additional pressures on social services from these retrenchments, the effect that they will have on workers and their families, needs to be added on top of this $750 million. Regional communities have been hit particularly hard by tariff reductions. Often the closure of TCF factories in regional areas results in a loss of jobs for a significant proportion of the community. The effect on factory closures in these areas devastates not just the workers and their families, but can lead to the breakdown of entire regional communities. A work from Bendigo quoted in the Monash University study said, and, and I quote, when I started, there was six to seven textile factories in Bendigo. There's only one left now. You think, where's the job? Where am I going? To, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? End quote. This quote reflects the lack of options available for TCF workers in regional communities. Melbourne University study found that 75 per cent of workers grew up in the communities in which they lived and worked. They were often forced to make a choice when they'd been retrenched. Travel 120 kilometres to work each way, move to another region or remain unemployed. The social dislocation faced by these workers is enormous. Another ramification of TCF tariff cuts has been the fundamental shift in the, mood of TCF, uh, in the mode of TCF manufacture away from factory-based production in favour of home-based production by outworkers. It's estimated that there are, more now than th there are now more than 300,000 home-based workers in the TCF industry, and most of these outworkers are female and many are migrants. The nature of outwork makes it extremely difficult to regulate, and the enforcement of minimum wages and standards is virtually impossible. The entitlements that all workers should expect—sick pay and superannuation, for example—are non-existent for outworkers. A study of Victorian home-based workers that was conducted by Christina Cregan of Melbourne University's Department of Management in 2001 found that the average pay rate was $3.60 an hour although some people were paid less than $1 an hour under piecework. This compares with a federal minimum hourly rate of $11.80. The women surveyed worked three to 19 hours a day, and 62 per cent of them worked seven days a week. In many cases, their families relied on the income to meet essential expenses, and their partners and children helped complete the work. There continue to be reports of home workers being paid $3 for an item of clothing that later retails for $50 or even $100. The federal government's continued tariff cuts will only increase the use of outworkers in the industry and further undermine employment standards. I've stated before that the Greens do not assume that all companies, using, that all companies in the clothing and textile industry are using outworkers or that they intend to exploit these employees. But there is no shortage of evidence of gross exploitation of many outworkers. This happens because large corporations put a distance between themselves and the workers who produce the goods that are sold by the company. It's clear that the government does not deem it necessary to address the exploitation of outworkers in any meaningful fashion. Instead, this important task has been left up to community groups such as the Fair Wear campaign. The Fair Wear campaign that was launched in 1996 is a coalition of churches, community groups and unions that aims to address the exploitation of Australian outworkers. Fair Wear's latest campaign is designed to encourage TCF employers to sign the Home Workers Code of Practice, which states that employers will provide outworkers with the same conditions as their factory worker counterparts. 
The work of Fairwear and the union involved in supporting them means that it is no longer possible for corporations to claim ignorance of the poor working conditions, the unsafe hours of work and the appalling low rates of pay that TCF workers endure, particularly outworkers. In addition to these challenges faced by TCF workers, it has now emerged that the TCF industry is yet another sector that will lose out in the fine print of the US-Australia Free Trade Agreement. The government told us that this free trade agreement will be a win for the sector, as they told us with so many sectors and as they have proven to be wrong. The government told us that Australian-made goods would receive tariff breaks from the United States in this particular industry. The US definition of country of origin will mean that the US will not define many of our TCF products as being Australian-made, and so our TCF manufacturers will lose out on any export benefits that may have eventuated from such an agreement. Yet again, the Free Trade Agreement is letting Australian industry down and it is Australian workers who will suffer. So the Greens will be supporting this bill because it aims to bring relief to the TCF industry, an industry that has gone massive structural change and will now suffer further under the US-Australia Free Trade Agreement. But we have never, and we will never, support this government's adherence to an ideology that dictates that tariffs should be slashed regardless of the impact on Australian workers, their families or the community at large. Thank you. Call the Minister. Senator Ellison. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And, uh, I thank senators who have contributed to the debate on this textile, clothing and footwear strategic investment program amendment bill 2004. Uh, this debate is focused not so much on the bill itself uh, than the government's uh, post-2005 policy. The government has announced a long-term strategy for the industry underpinned by $747 million in support. The government believes that this strategy offers the best opportunity for the industry to adapt to the changing global market. I note Senator Carr's amendment. This government's industry policy has always been focused on supporting innovation. There is no doubt that innovation and investment are the sources of lasting competitive advantage. Given that the current industry program provides a subsidy of up to 90 per cent for innovation, the government has long ago demonstrated its commitment to supporting innovation in the textiles, clothing and footwear industry. Firms in the leather and textile industries will welcome the passage of this bill, which will provide them with the opportunity to claim greater support from the current strategic invest investment program. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator. So the question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Carr be agreed to. They have been say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the um, second reading be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Textile, Clothing and Footwear Strategic Investment Program Act 1999 and for related purposes. Minister. Now we're at a third time. Question is that motion be agreed to? That being said, aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Textile, Clothing and Footwear Strategic Investment Program Act 1999 and for related purposes. Thank you. Minister. Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that the intervening business be postponed till after the consideration of Government Business Order of the Day No. 4, Intelligence Services Amendment Bill 2004. Does that motion be agreed to? Those opinions say aye. Those opinions say no. I think the ayes have it. Thank you. The clerk. Government Business Order of the Day No. 4, Intelligence Services Amendment Bill 2004, Second Reading Adjourned Debate. Yes. The whip. Your attention to the state of the chamber, uh, Chair. Yes, there is not a quorum present. Uh, ring the bells. So now.
Four to go. been already here. There's quorum present. This one. Quorum present. Call Senator Faulkner. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, over the past few years, our security services and agencies have had to operate in a changing and increasingly high tempo environment. I'm sure I can speak uh, for all senators when I say we recognise the professionalism and dedication shown by the staff of these agencies as they meet the challenges posed by shifts in our security priorities. And from time to time, these new challenges reveal the need for amendments to the legislation governing our security and intelligence agencies. The Intelligence Services Amendment Bill 2003 is a case in point. Put simply, it will allow ASIS to train its officers and agents to protect themselves, and it will allow ASIS officers and agents to carry weapons for that purpose of self-defence. ASIS will be able to protect its own staff and the staff of other agencies, such as the Australian Federal Police or the Australian Defence Forces, and work with these other agencies to provide a coordinated approach to tackling terrorism and transnational crime. The current prohibition on ASIS agents and officers carrying weapons, even for the purpose of self-defence, dates back to the recommendations of the 1983 Hope Royal Commission. I'm sure that uh, many senators will remember the Sheraton Hotel incident, which formed part of the Royal Commission's terms of reference. In that bungled training exercise in hostage rescue, 
ASIS trainees, armed with submachine guns, stormed the Sheraton Hotel and pointed guns at and, and manhandled hotel staff and members of the public, all of whom were unaware that this was in fact an exercise and that the uh, masked desperados holding them at gunpoint were actually the good guys. So Justice Hope's uh, report on the Sheraton Hotel incident recommended that ASIS be excluded from carrying out covert action or training for such covert action and that ASIS uh, cease, um, uh, uh, cease to use weapons and that their stocks of weapons and explosives be disposed of. Now, in implementing the report, Prime Minister Hawke emphasised that ASIS would no longer hold weapons nor would they have a capability for special or covert operations. At the time that that was considered by no means unreasonable, uh, 20 years ago conflict was between uh, nation states. It's not national governments but transnational terrorist organisations which pose a threat to Australian interests today. To detect and counter those threats, ASIS officers and agents often find themselves operating in insecure and unstable environments. Their targets are frequently extremely dangerous, not only to the population at large, but to the agents collecting intelligence on those targets. In these circumstances, ASIS operatives need the ability to protect themselves. The basic uh, provisions of the Intelligence Services Amendment Bill 2003 enable ASIS officers and agents to be trained uh, in the use of weapons only for self-defence purposes. There are a number of conditions attached to the provision of a weapon to an ASIS officer. It is important to remember that these provisions relate to the use of a weapon or a self-defence technique outside Australia. ASIS agents or officers will not be authorised to use a weapon inside Australia. A weapon can only be provided to an ASIS officer or agent for the purpose of uh, self-protection, for the protection of other ASIS agents or officers, for the protection of individuals assisting ASIS operations, or for training purposes. Now, this extension of physical protection to individuals assisting ASIS operations covers individuals in other organisations acting in support of ASIS activities such as the Australian Federal Police. Uh, I can't make this uh, clear enough. This provision of the legislation only covers members of an approved organisation, as defined in the bill, engaged in agreed cooperative operations. In addition, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Minister for Foreign Affairs must provide written notice to the Director-General approving the provision of a weapon to an ASIS agent and authorising training in the use of that weapon. A copy of this approval must be provided to the Inspector-General of, of Intelligence and Security. The bill also clarifies the position of ASIS agents as far as cooperation with other organisations is concerned. It is possible that ASIS agents will need to work together with other Australian organisations and with approved foreign organisations to plan and undertake joint operations. This primarily relates to the uh, new challenges arising from terrorism. For example, if Australians were to be taken hostage in a foreign country, operational cooperation with other agencies would be essential. The current Intelligence Services Act 2001 does not make it clear whether ASIS can participate at all in such operations because of the constraints contained in the original Act concerning the use of violence. The bill clarifies this by introducing the words, quote, this subsection does not prevent ASIS from being involved with the planning or undertaking of activities covered by paragraphs A to C by other organisations provided that staff members or agents of ASIS do not undertake those activities. 
Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, there has been some concern expressed that ACES's uh, potential cooperation in joint operations may lead to um, uh, ACES involvement in operations that include assassination. Uh, we welcome the Foreign Minister's commitment and assurances that ASIS involvement in joint operations that involves the assassination of an individual or individuals will not be allowed under any circumstances and that internal protocols will be issued prescribing any involvement by ASIS in any activities intended to lead to assassination. I'd also point out that the accountability mechanisms recommended by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on ASIO, ASIS and DSD and accepted by the government place secure boundaries on the approval of joint operations. When we provide greater levels of security for our officers and agents deployed overseas, we must also make sure that these new powers have appropriate safeguards. And it was for just that reason that Labor supported the referral of this uh, Intelligence uh, Services Amendment Bill to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on ASIO, ASIS and DSD. Uh, the committee's report, of course, was tabled uh, in the Senate on Thursday, the 11th of March, and it was tabled in the House of Representatives on the uh, 23rd of March this year. We usually find, of course, when legislation is referred to a committee, that the processes of parliamentary scrutiny produce better legislation. And uh, that's been uh, the situation in relation to this particular legislation. It's certainly been the case on this occasion. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on ASIO, ASIS and DSD made a range of unanimous recommendations uh, improving the safeguards on these additional ASIS powers and strengthening accountability. Uh, without limiting the required operational flexibility of ASIS. A number of these recommendations dealt uh, with uh, explicit definition of the terms used and the regimes set up by the bill. The committee recommended that training and logistics guidelines be developed in consultation with the relevant departments and agencies. Uh, be agreed by the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security and be approved by the National Security Committee of Cabinet. These guidelines, in the committee's opinion, uh, should make up a detailed policy framework covering training, handling, use, storage and logistics. The committee recommended that the guidelines include a detailed protocol for the planning of or conduct of activities with foreign organisations and which might uh, involve the use of force, a detailed understanding of what self-defence means in the context of the bill, a definition of the range of weapons permitted under the bill, uh, which the committee recommended be limited to uh, semi-automatic handguns and pistols. The the committee further recommended that the Minister for Foreign Affairs authorise the specific type of weapons to be used on each operation, and that uh, when the Director General of ASIS uh, designates uh, um, an ASIS uh, position as, as one requiring uh, uh, weapons, uh, and self-defence training, the Department of Foreign Affairs and uh, Trade be consulted. The committee also recommended development of a training and skills assessment regime to be approved by the Minister for Foreign Affairs and managed by the Director-General of ASIS with a copy of uh, the training program uh, provided to the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, as well as recommending a clear and explicit regime uh, surrounding training in the use of weapons and the authorisation for the use of weapons. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on ASIO, ASIS and DSD recommended a range of 
measures to increase accountability. The committee recommended that when an operation with a foreign organisation that uh, might involve force, when such an operation was under consideration, the approvals process include not only uh, the foreign minister but also the prime minister and the attorney general. A request by ASIS to the Minister for Foreign Affairs for approval of an operation should, in the committee's unanimous opinion, include a detailed assessment of the risks to ASIS staff members and agents involved and to Australia, as well as advice from DFAT on possible effects on bilateral relationships. The committee recommended that the Minister for Foreign Affairs approve the deployment of an armed ASIS staff member overseas or the training and arming of an agent already overseas. Uh, finally, the committee unanimously recommended that the Director-General of ASIS be required by the legislation to provide the Inspector-General of Intelligence and Security a report on any operational incident with the potential to embarrass Australia. Mr Acting Deputy President, the committee made nine unanimous recommendations in total, and the government has indicated that it is taking up seven of the uh, nine recommendations. This will increase the accountability of ASIS in undertaking operations that may involve the use of force and will also put in place safeguards to make sure that ASIS agents and officers are fully trained and fully aware of their responsibilities under this new legislation. Labor regrets that the government's response to the Joint Committee's recommendations gives the Inspector-General of Intelligence and Security only a consultative role in developing the guidelines for the use of weapons and participation in operations with foreign organisations. The Parliamentary Joint Committee recommended that these guidelines be agreed by the Inspector-General of, of Intelligence and Security, and Labor believes that the Inspector-General should have more than merely just a consultative uh, role. In regard to the definition of the types of weapons provided to uh, ASIS officers and agents under this legislation, the government has agreed that the definition will note that the provision of weapons will normally be limited to semi-automatic handguns, pistols and lesser or non-lethal weapons. However, the government is reluctant to be restrictive as far as specific weapons are concerned. If weapons other than those normally provided are to be issued for particular operations, Labor strongly hopes that this variation will be scrutinised by the Director-General of ASIS, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the uh, Inspector-General of Intelligence and Security. Uh, on balance, uh, however, Mr Acting Deputy President, this bill provides a solution to a uh, real problem confronting our intelligence and security services. Our security and intelligence agents operating overseas uh, in dangerous and unstable uh, situations need to be able to protect themselves. At times, they need to be able to participate in joint operations with other organisations. And at the same time, we must be sure that all agents issued with <coughs> weapons be properly trained and fully aware of their responsibilities and the expectations of the Australian community when it comes to using those weapons. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, in the view of the opposition, the Intelligence Services Amendment Bill 2003 strikes that balance. Labor will be supporting the bill. Thank you. Senator Greg. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I too rise to speak on the Intelligence Services Amendment Bill 
on behalf of the Australian Democrats. The bill will invest officers of the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, or ACES, with the power to carry and use firearms for the purpose of self-defence and to participate in paramilitary operations in conjunction <coughs> with other agencies. The express objective of ACES is to protect and promote Australia's vital interests through the provision of unique foreign intelligence services as directed by government. Under the current legislative regime, ACES is expressly prohibited from planning or participating in paramilitary activities or activities involving violence or the use of weapons. This was a central feature of the original bill and one which was specifically highlighted by the Minister for Foreign Affairs who said the following in his second reading speech. I quote, it is important to emphasise that ACES is not a police or law enforcement agency, nor does ACES have para paramilitary responsibilities. Additionally, ACES does not, in its planning or conduct of activities, allow for personal violence or the use of weapons. Such activities are not relevant to the role and function of ACES. These <coughs> limitations are made explicit in the bill, end quote. The government is now seeking to remove those limitations. It argues that ACES is now operating under different conditions as a consequence of terrorism and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. The fundamental issue associated with this bill is whether it will ultimately change the character of ACES from an intelligence gathering agency to a paramilitary organisation. As the Bill's Digest argues, this legislation represents a significant change in policy regarding the use of force by the government in less than three years. Of course, one of the difficulties that we Democrats have in assessing the merits of the bill is that we have only limited access to information concerning the operations of ACES, yet such information is crucial to a proper consideration of the bill. How can we really know whether ACES should have the power to participate in paramilitary operations if we don't know which organisations it is conducting joint operations with. Similarly, how can we determine whether ACES officers should carry weapons if we're not aware of the kinds of security threats they face? For obvious reasons, this is not information which can readily be made public, but that doesn't mean that it can't be provided in confidence to elected members of parliament. As the parliament has demonstrated for some time, it is entirely possible to provide intelligence briefings to non-government members of parliament without compromising national security. Unfortunately, we have a situation where government and opposition uh, collude uh, to ensure that they have a monopoly over high-level intelligence briefings. Currently, the opposition is the only non-government party available to receive such briefings. We Democrats do not see uh, any reason for that limitation. We believe intelligence briefings should be made available to non-government parliamentary parties also. Once again, we're dealing with a piece of legislation which has been scrutinised uh, on the Joint Committee on ASIO, ACES and DSD. The composition of the Joint Committee has been a, a concern of the Democrats for some, some time. The committee is entirely comprised of government and opposition members, yet in nominating members, the Leader of the Government in the Senate is required to give consideration to the desirability of ensuring representation of various political parties. So the point I'm making here is that the Democrats, and indeed the entire crossbench, is in a very difficult position in considering the proposals contained in the bill. Our role as legislators is compromised by the lack of information we have access to. It is impossible for us to properly assess the justifications for the bill or its implications in a vacuum of any contextual information. While the government may have provided briefings to the opposition on the reasons as to why these powers are necessary, and while the Joint Committee has the benefit of speaking directly with ACES officers, the Democrats have not had the benefit of such briefings, nor has the government offered any, so any comprehensive consideration of the bill has been very difficult. Giving ACES the power to engage in paramilitary operations and to carry and use weapons for the purpose of self-defence does represent a significant change of policy on the part of the government, and let's be honest, these are serious powers we're talking about. We Democrats believe that in these circumstances the government does have an obligation to persuade the parliament of the need for change and it needs to demonstrate very clearly why these new powers are needed and as far as we're concerned it hasn't met that threshold. 
But while the Democrats remain unconvinced of the need for these new powers, we do acknowledge that the bill contains a range of important safeguards and limitations. For example, ASIS will still be prevented from planning for or undertaking paramilitary activities or activities involving the use of force against a person or the use of weapons by staff members or agents of ASIS. What it does permit ACES to do is to plan or participate in such activities when they are conducted by other agencies. The new provisions relating to the use of weapons also contain limitations. ACES staff members and agents uh, can only be provided with weapons and weapons training for the purposes of self-protection, the protection of other ACES agents or the protection of a person who is cooperating with ACES. The Foreign Affairs Minister must approve the provision of weapons for particular staff and for particular purposes. Ministerial approvals relating to weapons must be provided to the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security. The Director General of ASIS must develop guidelines regarding the use of weapons by ASIS agents, and these guidelines must be provided to the IGES. We Democrats welcome these amendments, recently introduced by the Government, in response to the recommendations of the Joint Committee. These amendments address a number of our concerns and have therefore negated the need for us to proceed with amendments which we might otherwise have intended to move. The Democrats do, however, have one outstanding amendment which we intend to move during committee stage. The amendment seeks to enhance the accountability of ACES in the exercise of its new powers, and I'll be advocating to that, that to the committee stage shortly. Thank you. Senator Ray. Thank you, Mr. Directing Deputy President. I listened to uh, Senator Grigg's complaint that the Democrats are not open to briefing on this particular matter, and I'm entirely sympathetic to that point that he made. Um, it's not, I'm not sympathetic to the point that they, they're, they're at the moment they're not on the Joint Intelligence Committee. That was carried by statute in this place. I'd, there may have been an amendment by the Democrats, I don't recall it, and that statute says until you're of such a size in the place, um, you don't warrant representation on that committee. But that is an entirely different point to being properly briefed on legislation before this chamber. And I'm disappointed, and maybe the minister in his response may address the question why uh, the Democrats weren't given a good briefing on this legislation and, and, and why it's before us. Uh, to that, I can only say that uh, I'm sorry that didn't occur. Now, to understand this, particular piece of legislation, you really have to go back 20 years, and it's about 21 years since we had the Sheraton Hotel incident in Spring Street, Melbourne. And what was quite clear that came out of both that training fiasco and related matters was that ASIS was not under sufficient control and accountability, as should have otherwise been observed. And uh, after a full, uh, uh, full uh, inquiry into the activities, it was decided to deprive ASIS of all capacity for paramilitary activity. And that decision has basically stayed through till today and will continue in many senses after today when this legislation <coughs> is passed. Now, <coughs> it wasn't the only inquiry into ASIS. There was another inquiry into ASIS in the mid-90s, conducted by uh, Samuels and Codd. And this was mostly prompted by internal matters within ASIS, disaffected staff members. And it's, the, it's typical that this might have emerged after the discipline of the Cold War evaporated. I mean, there would have been enormous pressure not to allow dissent, leaking or other matters occur during the Cold War climate. But once that went, we had this sort of outbreak from people complaining about conditions and preferential treatment and a whole range of those normal internal tensions that exist in most organisations. Coming out of that Samuels Cod review was a recommendation to put ASIS on a, onto a statutory basis. Now that was well underway in 1995. The biggest objection were those elements applying to the media because there were provisions in that legislation that heavily penalised the media for disclosing certain activities and identities of ASIS employees and what they were up to. I mean, we had tried, of course, to go through the D-notice route, 
And by the mid-1990s, D-notices had virtually fallen into disrepute. And I can remember getting all the leading um, publishers and editors of uh, TV, radio and newspapers to Canberra for a discussion on this. And what became absolutely clear to me is that they all wanted to sign up to D-notices unless they got the big scoop themselves and then they'd just blatantly ignore it. And the worst offender, the most blatant offender, was Mr Johns from the ABC. He led the charge. And I, I eventually reported back to the Foreign Minister, don't even bother with D-notices. The press in this country were not responsible enough to sign up to it. It's ironical that uh, six years later, the legislation as proposed by this current government, the penalties there are equally severe and absolutely give no concessions whatsoever to the media. So they had their chance and they blew it. But I digress. The decision to set up uh, ASIS under a statutory uh, basis was made in 19, 1995. It couldn't be completed before the election, and then we went into a long interregnum of silence on it. Eventually, this current government got round to doing something about it in 2001. Indeed, once the legislation was produced, a joint select committee was set up—I think it had 15 members on it from memory to consider this, and it went through it line by line. And it was quite a good committee and produced, I think, a very positive and unanimous report. But during that inquiry, of course, one of the key issues was the question of immunity. What immunity should ASIS employees have? And of course, we were at the time given the assurance, well, yes, immunity from any Australian extra territorial laws that will apply overseas that ASIS employees break. And we were, of course, hurriedly reassured, of course, this didn't include the use of violence, paramilitary activities or anything associated with it. Yet this legislation partly reintroduces, only in part, some of those activities. Um, so we really have to ask, why the change? We have to recognise we are facing a changed world. Nothing remains exactly the same. Principles that, and good practices that applied five or ten or twenty years ago may have to be modified according to circumstances. We now have terrorism as one of the major features in the ASIS activity, tracking down, anticipating and providing government with collected information on terrorism is absolutely crucial. International cooperation in this regard has become more and more important. We can't just do it ourselves. We have to cooperate with a whole range of other intelligence agencies, not just in the old traditional club, but much, much broader. And of course, in addition to that, the one thing that has developed in, uh, in, at a fairly rapid rate is our commitment to tactical and operational intelligence. Now, we all know strategic intelligence has been a bit flawed of late, but there's no doubt that the development of operational and tactical intelligence has improved. And often that means that the ASIS officers associated with collecting that need to, in fact, accompany others because they're the only ones that know the geography or the personalities or the, or the situation. They, are, they become the experts to give advice to other agencies implementing government policy. Let me say that I should explain that the uh, Joint Intelligence Committee report was a little late in coming into parliament. We expected it to be in in December last year. But of course, the reason for its delay was not uh, indolence on behalf of the committee. The fact is that ASIS, I think, badly misinterpreted one aspect of its own bill. It needed to go away and think about it and come back to us, hence the delay. The second matter in delaying our report is a traditional one. We need, in fact, to report through to the minister so our report is cleared to make sure inadvertently we haven't put any intelligence material in there that may embarrass Australia or this parliament. And uh, the report was promptly cleared uh, by Mr Downer, the, the foreign minister. And of course it was tabled in the Senate, quite out of order in, in the sense that it normally would go in the reps, but we wanted to get it in as quickly as possible so everyone could assess it and it eventually was, was put down in the House of Representatives some days later. It was good to see that there was no early preview of our report in the newspapers. 
Of course, the only time that's ever happened was when a copy was given to the Prime Minister's office, but I can't assert that that's where it got out from. But on this occasion, there was absolutely no mention of our report before it was tabled in Parliament. For that, I'm entirely and eternally grateful. Now, there are three key elements, in my view, to this legislation. It, it allows ASIS officers to accompany other Australian agencies who are armed. Currently, they can't. Let me give you an example. I'm not going to give a specific one, but a generalised example. ASIS officers may need to deploy in the field with the SAS or the Federal Police who are armed. It doesn't mean the ASIS officers are, but currently under the legislation they are not permitted to do so in a direct sense. And this legislation will allow them to do so. That makes absolute common sense. Or there may be circumstances in which ASIS has to go into the field and either the Federal Police or SAS go with them to give them armed protection. Why would any reasonable legislator want to object to that? I don't think anyone will. And it's good that that particular matter has been put to rest. A second major aspect, this legislation gives ASIS employees the capacity to be armed for self-defence purposes only. We have to think, if we are sending people into harm's way, we have a responsibility for them to be protected. We know, you can only have to read in this week's bulletin the references made, to the potential uh, vulnerability to violence on behalf of those that service overseas on behalf of ASIS. It is always present. And giving a capacity for those people to defend themselves is absolutely essential. And of course, related to that, we therefore have to give a capacity for training. And the right people have to be trained in the use of self-defence methods. It doesn't necessarily have to be firearms, but essentially that will be the major area. And what, this, what the, the committee has been able to do and what the government's agreed to, of course, is to develop the necessary protocols associated with training. I think they're going to rely very heavily on the AFP methods. They're consulting with defence. They're making decisions about appropriate firearms that can be concealed. All those particular matters, in my view, are most appropriate. The original legislation required the Foreign Minister to authorise each individual training. I think we've now gone to a more general regime at the suggestion of the committee. Absolute common sense. We don't want to bog the Foreign Minister down with requirements that really are standard administrative practice. What we want to do, re, re, uh, re, uh, reserve for the Foreign Minister, of course, is to make the crucial decisions as to when someone should be armed when they're deployed overseas. Now, the third and more controversial matter that came out of uh, the Joint Intelligence Committee report and a view of the legislation is that this legislation will authorise ASIS employees when to participate in the act alongside foreign agencies uh, in either the planning of potential paramilitary activity or accompanying them and will be armed for self-defence in those circumstances. Now, this is quite a difficult area because the legislation, and I think the second reading speech, refers to legitimate activities. The key here is we're talking about legitimate activities by overseas agencies, not by Australia. And there are definitional problems associated with this. I have to say that ASIS's understanding of what their own proposed legislation was was quite opaque. They didn't seem to comprehend the full potential of some of these amendments to the uh, legislation. However, when they were drawn to their attention, when when these matters were drawn to their attention by the committee, uh, they fully cooperated with the committee. They sought solutions to the problems that were raised. I mean, it was refreshing to deal with an agency that just didn't dig in, didn't just say, well, this is our property, we're going to defend it to the last. They did cooperate with the committee when the ultimate realisation was there as to what the potentialities of the legislation could be. Now, why they didn't understand the original legislation and all its implications is a mystery to me, and I hope they give it a bit of thought. Because any, what we know in this case, 
This isn't legislation initiated by a government trying to wedge anyone or anything like this. This is legislation that comes at the request of the agency, and there is no political taint to it whatsoever. Therefore, they should give some thought to why they didn't think the full implications of the legislation through. Of course, one thing's for sure. You can't legislate for every contingency. And the critical change requested by the Joint Intelligence Committee is now in the legislation. That is, when ASIS employees need to be armed and are operating overseas in armed circumstances, the authorisation needs to be beyond just the foreign minister. Remember, there's no sunset clause in this legislation. I don't think there should be. But therefore, one always has to look to the future. You don't get an automatic review via a sunset clause. Now, there's no implied criticism here of Mr Downer. I am sure he would exercise the powers under this legislation responsibly. That fits his track record in regard to ASIS. But, I mean, what about the future? There could be a different foreign minister in future. I don't want to put these powers in the hands of Mr Abbott or Senator Abetz at the table. Maybe I don't trust them enough. Oh, and it could be someone from my side of politics that I don't trust. Who knows? So you have to be very, very careful. You can't legislate for every contingency. The authorisation previously was going to reside with the foreign minister. Now I think it, it, it reflects that both the prime minister, the foreign minister and the attorney general will be, will be involved in the approval process. I think that is much wiser. wiser. It also means we don't have to be absolutely specific and trying to rule in and rule out every set of circumstances. It means three people will take responsibility for this decision. In many ways, I think, we have assisted the foreign minister rather than restricted the foreign minister by that particular change. Of course, scrutiny of this legislation will be critical. Now, the Inspector General um, of, of uh, Intelligence and uh, Security will, of course, have a major role here. We have asked, and uh, I think the government hasn't included it in their legislation, but has implied that that's right, that if there is an, uh, an issue that's likely to embarrass Australia in regard to this, it will be brought to the attention of IGES. There will also be supervision of this particular aspect of the legislation by the Security Committee of Cabinet. And I hope at times there will be proper briefing of the Leader of the Opposition, especially if a major incident occurs so that the, the at least the Leader of the Opposition will be aware of it. I have expressed some concern that an incident in 1997, allegedly, and I only say allegedly concerning ASIS operations overseas, was never reported to the then Leader of the Opposition. That should have been done so. I have checked with him. He said it was not. I really do draw attention that those are the very sort of matters that should be drawn to the attention of the Leader of the Opposition. And, you know, maybe the Director General of ASIS could write us a letter about that. He's had a bit of practice recently. Now, once again, this Senate is dealing with legislation uh, dictated to by the necessity to deal with terrorism. Um, and I think it does reflect a degree of constructive bipartisanship. The approach to this particular legislation was to refer it to the Joint Intelligence Committee, which I think was sensible. It had a full examination there and gave a report recommending a variety of changes, nearly all of which have been in, in, incorporated in the legislation. I mean, this is regrettably not often reciprocated by the government. We had this spectacle this week of the Minister for Justice coming in here talking about the next draft of legislation and trying to attack the Labor Party over it before we've even seen the legislation. We've already given a promise to give that legislation coming out of the State Attorney, Attorneys General meeting and Police Ministers meeting full consideration. But what do we get? We get slagged off by this government trying to earn a few cheap political points. And I think that's highly, highly regrettable. I mean, we've heard the, con the constant refrain from some, only some opposite that the Labor Party is soft on terrorism, not argued out other than in an emotional way. I mean, we've heard it uh, from Mr Slipper, we've heard it from Mr Cameron, we heard it from Senator Knowles the other day that in some ways we aren't loyally supporting the Australian Defence Forces. I, I find that highly offensive. I don't believe our track record 
in any way would sustain it. Well, I think this is a form of modern-day McCarthyism, and I think it's most unfortunate. However, this piece of legislation is, I believe, necessary for the good of, a, of our country and for ASIS as a whole. I do, I do think there are a variety of safeguards contained into, in it. I do thank the Foreign Minister for accepting most nearly all the recommendations coming out of the Joint Intelligence Committee report, and where he hasn't, he's given assurances, as I read his response, that these matters are already covered. These are necessary powers. We must protect our, uh, our employees overseas. I think the scrutiny methods will ensure that whatever this parliament authorises will be carried out responsibly and will be carried out in a way with full probity. Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting uh, Deputy President, can I thank honourable senators for their contribution to this debate? Uh, I think this is another example where uh, the processes of the parliament seem to have worked effectively with the government introducing legislation, it then being considered by a joint committee, uh, a number of uh, amendments being proposed, the government uh, after consultation accepting those amendments to get uh, broad support for uh, legislation which seeks to allow the Australian Secret Intelligence Service to cooperate more effectively with other agencies and to better protect um, its people. Uh, the history and the need for this legislation, I think, has uh, been gone through and a reference has been made in contributions to the, uh, joint, to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on ASIO, ASIS and DSD. Um, <coughs> The uh, committee report that I've referred to does have a government response, and if I may, Mr Acting Deputy President, I seek to table that response now, and I, and I would seek uh, to simply make this uh, one uh, point uh, to restate for the record that internal ACES protocols outlining the conduct of cooperation with foreign agencies would specifically prescribe ACES involvement in any activity of a foreign agency intended to lead to assassination. Uh, I think the other points have been covered. We've got a very uh, heavy legislative timetable, Mr Acting Deputy President, so I'll curtail my comments at that and uh, commend the bill to the uh, Senate. So the question is, the bill be read a second time? Those opinions to say aye, those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Intelligence Services Act 2001 and for related purposes. It's good timing, isn't it? <laughs> is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Gregg. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I move uh, Democrat Amendment 1 circulated on sheet 4209, uh, and which goes to the heart of uh, uh, what we see as accountability. The, this particular amendment seeks to increase the accountability of ASIS in the exercise of the new powers that would be provided under the successful passage of this bill. We believe it achieves this without compromising national security in any way. The amendment applies to the guidelines which will govern the use of weapons and self-defence techniques by ASIS officers. As we know, the bill requires that the Director-General uh, to issue guidelines for this purpose, and while these guidelines must be provided to the Inspector-General of Intelligence and Security, there is no requirement for them to be tabled in the Parliament and, as a consequence, they can't be uh, disallowed. The government has argued that because of the operational detail which will be included in the guidelines, it would be uh, inappropriate uh, to make them available as a public document. The Joint Committee agreed. Obviously, this precludes the tabling and potential disallowance of the guidelines. So, in those circumstances, we believe that the Senate should be looking at other means of ensuring accountability in relation to these guidelines. And we warmly welcome uh, Government Amendment 4, in particular, which is directed at ensuring greater accountability. What the Democrat Amendment would do, however, is require that the IGES to, uh, to include comments in his annual report to the extent of the compliance by ASIS with those guidelines. So we note that Section 35 of the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security Act already contains a similar provision 
in relation to the compliance by ACES and DST with the rules relating to the communication and retention of intelligence information. While the Democrats accept that uh, what we're dealing with here is highly sensitive information in this context, we are confident that the IGES could report on these matters without compromising national security. If the IGES can currently report on compliance with rules regarding the management of highly sensitive uh, intelligence information, there is no reason why he cannot also report on compliance with the guidelines regarding the use of weapons. Uh, as those who have read previous annual reports of the IGES will know, the IGES does produce comprehensive annual reports which, while they may not include the same level of detail as other annual reports, do in fact provide an important insight into the legislative framework in which our intelligence agencies operate and thereby enhance the accountability of those agencies. So despite a relative lack of information provided to the Democrats regarding the bill and the fact that we were unable to participate in the committee inquiry, we have nevertheless approached the bill, I believe, constructively and given careful consideration to the ways in which it might be improved. So we believe that this amendment is sensible, one which will enhance the accountability of ACES in the exercise of its new powers and without compromising in any way Australia's national security interests. Thank you, uh, Senator Gregg. The Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Senator the Honourable John Faulkner. Well, thank you as always uh, uh, for that uh, forceful um, uh, call, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to briefly uh, respond uh, to uh, this uh, proposed uh, uh, amendment um, for a um, proposed uh, uh, new section uh, 35 uh, 2 C. Now, um, can I just indicate uh, that, of course, I think the committee needs to understand that um, the bill that we are debating before the Senate uh, deals with amendments to the Intelligence Services Act uh, uh, 2001. It doesn't deal with the um, Inspector General of Intelligence and Security Act uh, 1986. I note uh, that the Parliamentary Joint Committee on ASIO, ASIS and DSD uh, did not recommend any amendments to the uh, Inspector General of Intelligence and Security Act 1986. And of course, under that particular act, um, I think it is fair to say to the committee that the Inspector General does have full probity. Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy President. Can I thank honourable senators for their contribution to this debate? Uh, I think this is another example where uh, the processes of the parliament seem to have worked effectively with the government introducing legislation, it then being considered by a joint committee, uh, a number of uh, amendments being proposed, the government uh, after consultation accepting those amendments to get uh, broad support for a legislation which seeks to allow the Australian Secret Intelligence Service to cooperate more effectively with other agencies and to better protect um, its people. Uh, the history and the need for this legislation, I think, has uh, been gone through and a reference has been made in contributions to the, uh, joint, to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on ASIO, ASIS and DSD. Um, <coughs> the uh, committee report that I've referred to does have a government response. And if I may, Mr Acting Deputy President, I seek to table that response now. And I, and I would seek uh, to simply make this uh, one uh, point uh, to restate for the record that internal ACES protocols outlining the conduct of cooperation with foreign agencies would specifically prescribe ACES involvement in any activity of a foreign agency intended to lead to assassination. Uh, I think the other points have been covered. We've got a very uh, heavy legislative timetable, Mr Acting Deputy President, so I'll curtail my comments at that and uh, commend the bill to the uh, Senate. So the question is the bill be read a second time? Those opinions say aye, those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Intelligence Services Act 2001 and for related purposes. Right. Thanks. See you later. 
It's good timing, isn't it? Yes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Gregg. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I move uh, Democrat Amendment 1 circulated on sheet 4209, uh, and which goes to the heart of uh, uh, what we see as accountability. The, this particular amendment seeks to increase the accountability of ACES in the exercise of the new powers that would be provided under the successful passage of this bill. We believe it achieves this without compromising national security in any way. The amendment applies to the guidelines which will govern the use of weapons and self-defence techniques by ACES officers. As we know, the bill requires that the Director-General uh, to issue guidelines for this purpose, and while these guidelines must be provided to the in Inspector-General of Intelligence and Security, there is no requirement for them to be tabled in the Parliament and, as a consequence, they can't be uh, disallowed. The government has argued that because of the operational detail which will be included in the guidelines, it would be uh, inappropriate uh, to make them available as a public document. The Joint Committee agreed. Obviously, this precludes the tabling and potential disallowance of the guidelines. So, In those circumstances, we believe that the Senate should be looking at other means of ensuring accountability in relation to these guidelines, and we warmly welcome uh, Government Amendment 4 in particular, which is directed at ensuring greater accountability. What the Democrat Amendment will do, however, is require that the IGES to, uh, to include comments in his annual report to the extent of the compliance by ACES with those guidelines. So we note that Section 35 of the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security Act already contains a similar provision in relation to the compliance by ACES and DSD with the rules relating to the communication and retention of intelligence information. While the Democrats accept that uh, what we're dealing with here is highly sensitive information in this context, we are confident that the IGES could report on these matters without compromising national security. If the IGES can currently report on compliance with rules regarding the management of highly sensitive uh, intelligence information, there is no reason why he cannot also report on compliance with the guidelines regarding the use of weapons. Uh, as those who have read previous annual reports of the IGES will know, the IGES does produce comprehensive annual reports which, while they may not include the same level of detail as other annual reports, do in fact provide an important insight into the legislative framework in which our intelligence agencies operate and thereby enhance the accountability of those agencies. So despite a relative lack of information provided to the Democrats regarding the bill and the fact that we were unable to participate in the committee inquiry, we have nevertheless approached the bill, I believe, constructively and given careful consideration to the ways in which it might be improved. So we believe that this amendment is sensible, one which will enhance the accountability of ACES in the exercise of its new powers and without compromising in any way Australia's national security interests. Thank you, uh, Senator Gregg. The Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Senator the Honourable John Faulkner. Well, thank you as always uh, uh, for that uh, forceful um, uh, call, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to briefly uh, respond uh, to uh, this uh, proposed uh, uh, amendment um, for a um, proposed uh, uh, new section uh, 35.2c. Uh, now, um, can I just indicate uh, that, of course, I think the committee needs to understand that um, the bill that we are debating before the Senate uh, deals with amendments to the Intelligence Services Act uh, uh, 2001. It doesn't deal with the um, Inspector General of Intelligence and Security Act uh, 1986. I note uh, that the Parliamentary Joint Committee on ASIO, ASIS and DSD uh, did not recommend any amendments to the uh, Inspector General of Intelligence and Security Act 1986. And of course, under that particular act, um, I think it is fair to say to the committee that the Inspector General does have uh, extensive oversight uh, uh, of the legality and the propriety of uh, ACES's activities and, of course, ACES's uh, compliance 
with ministerial uh, direction. So uh, on this occasion, um, uh, given the uh, nature of the report to the parliament by the, the uh, joint committee uh, and uh, for the other reasons um, I've outlined, I can indicate uh, to the committee, uh, don't want to hurt Senator Gregg's feelings, uh, I guess it looked too hurt over there, but uh, on this occasion, on this occasion, uh, I think that, uh, it, uh, that it wouldn't be appropriate to pass this uh, amendment and um, the opposition uh, won't be supporting it. Thank you, Senator Faulkner. The Minister, Senator Hill. Um, well, the government doesn't support it either, Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, not because we think there's anything particularly wrong with the goal that's being sought, but just that we don't think it's, uh, it's necessary. Uh, what Senator Gregg is seeking to do is to uh, amend a provision of the, the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security Act to include this, um, this obligation. Well, it seems to us that under that legislation the Inspector General uh, has oversight and does report in any event, so it's difficult for us to see um, that it really adds much to what is already the situation. And on that basis, um, we don't see reason to support it. Thank you, uh, Senator. I put the question that the Democrats' amendment moved by Senator Gregg be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those again say no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. The uh, temporary chairman of committee, Senator Lightfoot, reports that the committee has considered the Intelligence Services Amendment Bill 2003 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. The report of the committee be adopted. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. The bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. I an act to amend the, the Intelligence Services Act 2001 and for related purposes. Minister. Um, Mr Deputy President, I move that intervening business be postponed till after consideration of government business order of the day number five, telecommunications bracket interception and bracket amendment bill 2004. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Again say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Telecommunications interception amendment bill 2004, second reading, adjourned debate. The Minister, Senator Hill. Uh, Senator Abetz. The Minister, Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, no, 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 no. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I, are we on second readers on this? Who is, oh, well, who, who's your next speaker? Right. Can, uh, are you keep drawing my attention to the condition no, of the House? No, I'm not. What I'm suggesting is that uh, if you can speak for a while, Senator Hogg, on this important bill, I'm sure he would enlighten the Chamber. Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator Hogg. Thank you very much. Uh, look, I think this is an honour bestowed upon me, which I didn't expect, seeing that Senator Ludwig is not here. But uh, undoubtedly, Senator Ludwig will be here in a couple of minutes. And... All right. Now, now I've got the, uh, the title of the bill. <laughs> we can start to get to work. Uh, this, of course, is a bill which I understand. Um, oh, look, please don't take any points of order on me at this stage. Uh, is, is going to look into warrants to uh, additional serious offences, extend the protections of the Act in relation to the text and image based communications, facilitate the recording of calls to publicly listed ASIO numbers, and to clarify the application of the Act to uh, delayed access message services. As I understand this bill, it, it takes up new forms of technology that haven't otherwise previously been available. Uh, to date and uh, extends uh, the legislation uh, covering, uh, as I say, different forms of technology. Um, here's Senator Ludwig, so I'm sure that now that he has arrived, that great speech will go down in the annals of the uh, Senate history. And uh, I thank the Chair and the, uh, the, the uh, 
Acting Deputy President of the Senate for its indulgence. The Deputy President is more than welcome. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, and I thank that contribution by uh, Senator Hogg in relation to a very important bill, the Telecommunications Interception Bill 2004. I'm sure he's uh, very familiar with the topic. Can I say, uh, having been a member of the Senate Committee which examined this bill, which reported to the Senate uh, the, only this week, as the Senate, uh, in fact, does have a very full program and uh, perhaps might be able to finish before quarter two, but uh, perhaps not, there are a number of points uh, that I would like to make in relation to this bill. Although, although uh, no, there are a couple of points that I did want to make uh, in relation to this. The uh, problem with incorporation, I think, has been uh, a little bit of a little bit of toing and froing about that this week. So I'd, I'd rather I'd rather put these on the record. And then I won't take uh, the full 20 minutes. Uh, it will then mean, though, we will deal with it later on this afternoon. But in any event, we should be able to go through it quite quickly. In summary, though, the bill does a number of things. It broadens the range of offences in relation to which telecommunications interception warrants can be sought. It broadens the definition of interception to encompass written words and images and addresses delayed access communications such as SMS, MMS, voicemail and email. It enables Asia to record telephone calls to its publicly listed numbers. It removes the requirement on Asia to provide a warrant to a telecommunications carrier in emergency uh, situations, and it enables certifying officers in an agency to terminate an interception while a warrant remains current. The majority of the committee agreed with the need for most of these measures. The committee was satisfied that the new terrorism, uh, cybercrime and firearm offences were sufficiently serious to justify their inclusion in the telecommunications interception regime. The committee also acknowledged that there could be serious matters of national security which might require Asia to perform interceptions under a telecommunications interception warrant without notifying a carrier. The committee was not overly persuaded by the need to enable Asia to record incoming calls to publicly listed numbers without a warning, but noted the limited privacy impact of such a measure and the current practice of recording triple O emergency calls the committee did not recommend any change to this provision. The key concern of the committee was with the provisions governing delayed access communication. The committee had previously examined equivalent provisions in the 2002 package of anti-terrorism legislation and concluded they were unclear and needed redrafting. And in fact, I was on the committee at that time. It seems uh, after uh, something short of two years, we're still at the same position, which is a little bit unfortunate. After hearing evidence from several organisations, including the Australian Federal Police, uh, the committee found that the redrafted provisions still leave some important questions unanswered. These concerns, uh, at least those uh, that I'll go to, are access by law enforcement agencies to copies of, re copies of red emails on an ISP server, the interaction between the bill and the powers of law enforcement agencies under section 3L of the Crimes Act, the access by an organisation to emails passing through its firewall for the purpose of internal integrity measures. We welcome, uh, however, uh, in relation to the matter of the government's agreement uh, to split the bill so that it can rectify these problems over the recess uh, and Parliament can consider the remainder of the bill before it, arise, before it rises uh, today. <coughs> what that effectively means is that the, the issues that the committee uh, sought that the government to uh, not to proceed with at this point in time until some greater clarity can be uh, produced by the government in relation to this issue uh, they have agreed to, as I understand it. Uh, it's encouraging and I think it's helpful for the government to do that. It's one of those circumstances where we didn't think in 2002 the government got it right and re it required redrafting. We think, unfortunately, they still haven't got it right and it still does need uh, a little bit more redrafting, and it's helpful to find that uh, they are going to rise to the challenge, uh, especially, I think, after the evidence given by the AFP in relation to the committee hearing. Uh, it did leave me, uh, on a personal note, a little bit confused about where the position uh, was in relation to this legislation, let alone uh, our uh, understanding of it. But I can indicate that, apart from the measures that will be uh, split from the bill and held over until the next sitting, the opposition will be supporting the remainder of the uh, Bill. Thank you, Senator Ludwig, uh, for your excellent timing. It being 12.45, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of lunchtime bills. Mr Clark.
Government Business Order of the Day, Commonwealth, Commonwealth Electoral Amendment, Representation in the House of Representatives Bill 2004, Second Reading, Adjourned Debate. The Leader of the Opposition, Senator Faulkner. Uh, no, that was that on only once, uh, Minister, but I thank you for keeping me uh, on my toes. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, Mr Acting Deputy President, the trigger for this bill was the Electoral Commissioner's February 2003 determination that the Northern Territory was just 295 people short of the population needed to retain its second House of Representatives seat. A number of reasonable concerns were raised about the determination, including that population estimates for the Northern Territory include a larger margin of error than for other parts of Australia, and that the 2003 determination was based on unpublished September quarter 2002 population estimates. The bill is the government's third attempt at sorting out problems arising from the redistribution uh, of the Northern Territory's House of Representatives seats. And uh, I always I think it's appropriate to use the slogan here, third time lucky, because after two botched attempts, the government has finally seen the sense of the Labor Party and the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters uh, positions and actually done more than just go for a quick political fix on this issue. I don't want to say that this current bill uh, before us is, uh, is a sensible uh, bill, and I do think that it deals in a fair way uh, with the three recommendations of the unanimous report of the Joint Standing Com Committee on Electoral Matters uh, on this particular issue. The bill before us, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, provides that the statistics um, provided by the Australian statistician for the purpose of making a determination are to be the most recent set of statistics in a regular series compiled and published by the Australian statistician. Now, this importantly removes any ambiguity about which is the latest set of statistics to be used. Uh, secondly, uh, when the Australian Capital Territory or the Northern Territory falls short of a quota for an additional seat and that the shortfall is within the error margin, the Electoral Commissioner is to recalculate the entitlement. Uh, the error margin is to be added to the territory's population and the entitlement recalculated. Thirdly, the determination made by the Electoral Commissioner on the 19th of February 2003 as it relates to the Northern Territory is set aside. Uh, what this means, of course, is that uh, for the uh, election uh, due uh, this year, or within the next year, uh, it will ensure that the Northern Territory uh, has two seats in the next federal election. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, if I can just sum up on this, because I know there's a huge uh, pressure of uh, business before us, and I know other senators uh, want to make important contributions on this particular bill. Uh, this, this bill allows for calculations of entitlements uh, to representation in the House of Representatives to take account of the significant margin of error in Australian Bureau of Statistics population estimates for the territories. Of course, uh, those, um, those, uh, that uh, margin of error is much uh, higher uh, for the territories. It's highest for the Northern Territory and much higher for the territories than it is uh, for the, uh, the six Australian states. I'm pleased that, uh, that uh, the parliament has been able to benefit from uh, an important report of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. I'm pleased this issue 
was placed uh, before the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters uh, when the, the first attempt by the government to deal with this issue, the, um, the private members' bill of uh, um, Mr Tolner MP in the House of Representatives was introduced. I think the right course of action was to send this to the Joint Standing Committee uh, on Electoral Matters. I think they've treated this matter uh, very seriously, and, uh, and um, I'm uh, also pleased that uh, now uh, we have uh, a bill uh, that uh, effectively picks up the three recommendations of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. We, of course, first of all had Mr Tolner's private members' bill. Uh, then the, uh, the minister introduced uh, the First Territory Representation Bill, which only picked up one of the recommendations of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. I'm pleased that the minister has withdrawn that bill, and now we have a third attempt. Uh, um, this uh, piece of legislation that we're debating today. I think it's significant now that we are debating uh, this particular legislation at a time made available in the Senate for dealing with non-controversial legislation. Because with the changes, with the recommendations of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters being picked up, we now do have a bill that I think can be properly described, at least within the parliament at least within the parliament, at least within the House of Representatives and the Senate of the Australian Parliament, we can say is, uh, is uh, not controversial in its nature. I think the bill that we are debating now, of course, has, uh, has much more credibility because it deals with the real cause of the problem. It deals with the, it goes to the root of the problem and it provides a solution the problem. It fixes the problem without the, dis the very important principles that underlie electoral redistributions in Australia, those important principles that are contained within the Commonwealth Electoral Act being distorted in any way. So again, we have a situation where I think uh, through a, com a fulsome uh, committee process, uh, through three attempts, uh, we've got a th now a third bill before us, and I think we've uh, we've got it right. I'm not critical about that, by the way. I think that uh, if these if these things um, can be improved, uh, well, we uh, we ought to acknowledge it. The opposition, for its part, found the uh, the previous bill unacceptable because it didn't pick up all the recommendations of the committee, uh, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. This bill does. And because it does, because it not only um, because it goes to fixing the uh, the weaknesses that have been identified by the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters that have led to uh, this circumstance in the Northern Territory, because those issues are addressed, I can say, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, that this particular legislation will be supported by the opposition. Thank you, Senator Faulkner. Senator Murray. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, as Senator Faulkner uh, says, this Commonwealth Electoral Amendment representation in the House of Representatives Bill 2004 does finally get it right. Um, as a member of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, I'm pleased that the government has accepted all three unanimous recommendations of the committee, and that committee has uh, four political parties uh, sitting on it. That is welcome and reflects well on the positive contribution of uh, our committee processes. The initial proposal that was put to the committee was to examine whether or not there should be an automatic guarantee of two seats in the House of Representatives for both the Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory. The committee did not accept that proposal and chose instead to look at the statistical issues with respect to the tried and tested and accepted distribution formula that is already in place in the Electoral Act and which has widespread um, support. The committee wished to test whether or not the vagaries of the statistical measure measurements, uh, their timing, the closeness of the figures, the margin of error and the problems of population estimates in the Northern Territory in particular should be given more consideration and more weight than they had been. In effect, that is what happened. The consequence will be that the second House of uh, Representative seat um, in the Northern Territory will be returned. But that is the consequence. 
It was not uh, the necessary effect uh, of the changes that are being made, because the changes that are being made do not guarantee a seat uh, to the Northern Territory, and it should be recognised that a seat could be lost in the Northern Territory in the future. I think the committee was wise not to adopt the view that the Northern Territory should be guaranteed two seats. It was also wise not to be trapped in the parallel argument that the ACT was entitled, therefore, to be guaranteed three seats. It is clear that the population estimates for the Northern Territory and the ACT are less reliable than the estimates for the states, principally because of the difficulty associated with deriving an accurate estimate from a smaller population. This is an important issue when considering cases such as the Northern Territory, as it lost a seat on a, an estimated shortfall of 295 people, which is well within the margin of error surrounding its population estimate. The report recommendations do not disturb the basis on which state and territory redistributions are, are assessed, but they do require certainty as to the periodic ABS figures to be used and the error of margin. I would now, uh, to save uh, committee time, talk briefly about the issue of political donations in respect to the Democrats' amendment that I will be moving in the committee stage on the voices. And I would signal uh, that if the uh, chamber accepts it, I would propose simply to move it and not to debate it unless people wish to do so. In our supplementary remarks to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters report into the 2001 federal election, we recommend, amongst other things, that donations from overseas entities should be banned outright. One of the main reasons for banning foreign donations is the fact that donations to political parties and candidates by foreign individuals and organisations can be used as a means of avoiding disclosure requirements. While the recipients of such donations must still disclose details of the donor if the donation exceeds the disclosure threshold, the donor is not under such an obligation and there is no way to ensure that the donor was the real source of the money. The committee report responded to Labour concerns on donations to political parties from overseas. In their submission, Labour had said it may be a mechanism to hide the source of donations and that the law was difficult to enforce because of foreign domicile. Unlike a number of other countries, foreign donations are not banned in any Australian jurisdiction. The committee, in my view, essentially fudged the issue by asking the AC only to keep a watching brief. While the issue of foreign donations has been less contentious in Australia than in some other countries, there is real concern over the issue. In its 1996 election report, the AEC found that federal disclosure laws were inadequate to ensure full disclosure of the true source of donations received from overseas. The problem being that if the overseas-based person or organisation who makes a donation to the political party was not the original source of those funds, there would be no legally enforceable trail of disclosure back to the true donor, nor would any penalty provisions be able to be enforced against persons or organisations domiciled overseas. The AEC then recommended that donations received from outside Australia be prohibited altogether, but recognised that it still did nothing to resolve the problem of trying to track and prosecute donors who are overseas. In our supplementary remarks, we were pains to stress that it is neither necessary nor desirable to prevent individual Australians living overseas from donating to Australian political parties or candidates. Just a note, uh, the word foreign in our amendment is not to be found in the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918. The definition we've used is taken from the statute book under the Ant Antarctic Treaty Act. Democrats have a considerable agenda of changes we are seeking to the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918. The opportunity to move some or all of our proposed amendments could be presented when bills to amend the Act are before the Senate. On Monday, I tested the Joint Standing Committee of Electoral Matters knowledge as to whether these bills were due to come in. Uh, they didn't know. I was pleased to discover today that two, have, two of them have been listed in the House of Representatives, being the Electoral and Re Referendum Amendment Access to Electoral Roll and Other Measures Bill 2004 and the Electoral and Refer Referendum Amendment Enrolment Integrity and Other Measures Bill 2004. However, the reason this is before you now is the Democrats are concerned that even with the prospect of the bills being introduced into the House, they may not make the legislative list for debate this financial year. There is a view that the June sittings may be the last before an election is called. So because we think this is a discreet and urgent and relatively simple issue to make a uh, determination on, we have sought to amend the Act prior to the election, but we do recognise the importance uh, of acknowledging the way in which this um, 
this particular uh, format is, is developed, so we will be happy to take the amendment on the voices. Thank you, Senator Murray. Senator Scullion. Deputy President, uh, I, I uh, recognise and acknowledge the, uh, the time constraints on the Senate today, but it would be remiss of me as Senator for the Northern Territory not to speak on this bill briefly and wholeheartedly support it. The adequate representation uh, for Territorians has been an issue throughout history, uh, that as Territorians have a slightly different view than people around Australia about the, the, the nature of their representation in Parliament. The constitutional history of the Territory since we became a, a, body, uh, a body politic, uh, subject to the rule of the Commonwealth Government, uh, has not always ensured respect for the democratic rights in terms of equity for Territorians. Um, so I think some four, 104 years after Federation, um, the democratically elected uh, Parliament of the Northern Territory can still be overruled by this place. Territorians don't count as full voting Australians in a referendum. So in that background, um, I hope that uh, members of this place can understand why Territorians may have a slightly different view to the, uh, uh, to the determination of the committee. But this bill has, whilst temporarily, fixed a very important dilemma. Um, we face having uh, the loss of our House of Representatives seats being cut by 50 per cent in our representation, but only the loss of a few percentile in terms of our population. Now, uh, as the Joint uh, Committee on Electoral Matters uh, established, the margin of error established was round about plus or minus 2,600 people, 295 people within that, I think, uh, wasn't something that was equitable. And, and the committee has very rightly pointed out that we are now going to change the way we approach our interpretations of those statistics to ensure that this particular um, uh, amount of shift in the population, because it fell within the standard deviation, won't be taken in that case again. This bill will ensure that, uh, um, that those, any change in circumstances, at least it's actually tied in with the process used by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank this, uh, the committee for its support and the support from my colleague, the Ter Territory Senator Trish Crossy. I'd like to also acknowledge uh, the tremendous work of the uh, member for uh, Solomon, Dave Toler, and he shouted long and hard about this issue and, in fact, introduced the private members' bill uh, when I think that there were several others saying that nothing could be done. The bill solved the problem for now, and I have to agree with my colleague in the other place that the Territory should be guaranteed two seats in the House of Representatives and uh, not have our democratic rights in terms of equity in percentage of population interfered with by the statistical changes or the whim of a process from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And I will continue, Mr Acting Deputy President, to fight on every forum to try to have some equity for the, for the Northern Territory, both in terms of statehood and a guaranteeing of the minimum number of seats in the House of Representatives being two. Thank you, Senator Scullion. Senator the Honourable Robert Wright. Mr Acting Deputy President, um, one thing Senator Scullion has got right, Territorians are treated differently. In the case of an error margin, they'll have a benefit that no other Australians, other than those who reside in the ACT, have. That, of course, is dictated to by the Constitution. We don't want to see the High Court tip over redivision of seats Australia-wide as they apply to states. So you're now being treated more generously, and properly so, than the states can, because we're constrained constitutionally with the states. Senator Scullion, of course, uses the word equity. I mean, what equity means is self-interest, uh, and nothing more than that. So we'll dismiss that as a bit of hyperbole that will go down well in the Territory, but not necessarily sway many votes here. Um, Senator Murray has proposed tacking on an amendment, um, the substance of which doesn't offend me, but the method does. I mean, this bill has absolutely nothing to do with parliamentary uh, uh, funding and disclosure. And just to tack it onto a bill is passing strange. I understand his point, however, when you'll get other opportunities, who knows, in terms of the other two bills. My amendment that will allow Democrats to be elected to the Senate with just 1 per cent of the vote will also have to wait, Senator Murray. So I can't help you out uh, today. Now, you enjoy it enormously. Hmm? It's your doing and you enjoy it enormously. Well, you know, I mean, you know, uh, if I can get the quota down to 1 per cent, I'll be doing you a big favour, a really big favour. <laughs> But don't let me divert onto that. Let me say there is, in my view, the crucial part of this legislation is it reflects what the parliament meant in the 1980s and early 90s. I mean, the electoral bills that came into this place 
in the 80s and 90s not only contained initial and immediate remedies to problems, they anticipated a variety of problems and tried to solve them in advance. And I think it was quite far-sighted of this parliament to do so. For instance, it allowed the electoral commissioner to count after a double dissolution as, as it was, in fact, a half-senate election to determine seniority. It's up to this chamber to know whether they want to use it or not, but they put it there. They also made provision what happens if a Senate candidate dies. And we, we covered off all these contingencies that might emerge. And the other contingency we try to uh, head off or, or deal with is territorial representation, to make sure in future it would be very difficult to stack it out, if you know what I mean, you know, to give them suddenly ten seats when they only deserve two. So the formula was put there, and the formula was where the chips fall, that's where they fall. No manipulation, no retrospective reconsideration, etc. And on the surface, this bill may be thought to be a retrospective consideration of the Territory's entitlement. But I am probably the only one with a corporate memory left here that remembers the debate. I chaired the committee, the, the, as it then was, the Joint Electoral Committee on, uh, sorry, the Joint Committee on Electoral Reform between 84 and 87, when we discussed all this. Didn't necessarily record it in every report, and the intention was to take the latest available statistics as they were published normally. This didn't happen on this occasion. Maybe out of the best of motives, the Electoral Commission got an advance copy of the next quarter. But the reason why we went for the latest published figures is it couldn't be manipulated. I mean, on one occasion the Electoral Commission could call for an advanced co copy of figures, on the next occasion it may not, and may have the unintentional effect of manipulating either a Senate or indeed a state's entitlement to a number of seats. We don't want that. We knew at the time there'd be a, eight, a six to nine month lag in the calculations, and we're willing to accept that. If the calculations in the case of the Northern Territory had been made on the June figures, they were entitled to two seats. No question of that, and that's the way it should have been. But, of course, corporate memory is lost in the Australian Electoral Commission. There's hardly anyone there that was there 15 or 20 years ago, especially in the head office area. That's not surprising. But that sort of lost, it seems it's never really affected the Bureau of Stats, so it all gets lost in the mists of time. So what the parliament today is really doing is reaffirming what it intended in the 80s and 90s to apply, and I think that's a very, very good thing that we're doing that. Sure, there's a case in terms of statistical aberrations in, uh, 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 that has been made out, but that can't be applied retrospectively and shouldn't be applied retrospectively, and I'm glad this legislation can apply it into the future, because then everyone knows where they stand. The old saying of letting the chips fall where they fall is a very good idea when it comes to these sort of decisions. It takes partisanship out, it takes manipulation out. It just means we can have a very fair electoral system. So by incorporating that uh, or reinterpreting that section of the Act that says the latest available published figures, I think, will be a great guide into the future. I wish the bill a speedy passage. Thank you, Senator Ray. Senator Crossan. Mr Acting Deputy President, I just rise to provide a few comments in relation uh, to this bill. And of course, we've uh, spoken about this issue a number of times in uh, this chamber to date, uh, and so I won't uh, hold up the passage of this legislation any longer than needs to be. There are many people, not only in this parliament but also in the Northern Territory, who are waiting for us to ensure that this passage, uh, this uh, legislation, is passed today and uh, <clears throat> retains representation in the territory of two seats. But there are a number of comments I do want to make. I'd notice uh, my colleague Warren Snowden went into some length yesterday in the House of Representatives and outlined uh, some of the detail as to how we got to the situation as to why we were looking at uh, only having one House of Representatives seat at the last election. But can I say that the uh, determination by the Australian Electoral Commission to actually uh, uh, revert back to the one seat, I think, gave us a very good opportunity to have a very close look at the way in which the Australian Bureau of Statistics conducts their uh, census. Uh, it forced us to uh, look at uh, the way in which uh, data is collected uh, in places like the Northern Territory during census time. And of course, we now know the implications of what happens when that data is not collected accurately. 
not only does it have a flow-on effect in terms of representation in places like the Northern Territory, but of course it affects uh, money that is provided through uh, the Grants Commission, because that, of course, is based on a per head of population. Uh, I, along with a number of colleagues in the Northern Territory, presented a submission to the uh, Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters last year when uh, the first bill relating to this was uh, sent to that committee for uh, inquiry. Uh, and as we know, on the um, 20th of February 2003, the Australian Electoral Commission determined that due to a population decline, the extra seat um, would be lost. On the basis of the figures provided by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the Northern Territory missed out on retaining its two federal seats by 0.0022 quota, or 295 uh, people. Now, I just want to say that through a, a lot of work that uh, uh, I undertook and my office undertook during the estimates process, questions we asked of the Australian Bureau of Statistics, we were able to finally, at the end of the day, obtain from uh, the Australian Electoral Commission uh, uh, evidence that what in fact the Australian Bureau of Statistics had provided to the Electoral Commission was not in fact the latest available public statistics at the time uh, they were requested to, but in fact, and I will quote from a letter that Mr um, Truen from the Australian Bureau of um, uh, sorry, that was sent to Mr Truen from the Australian Bureau of Statistics by Andrew Becker from the Australian Electoral Commission. And he says this, that Mr Berger from the Australian Bureau of Statistics indicated that the ABS may prepare a special version of the quarter September ERP, which is the estimated resident population figures, in a separate publication which should be made available to the Electoral Commission in advance of the programmed release of the September quarter 2002 Australian demographic statistics. And my understanding is um, that is exactly what happened. That uh, you know, if, if you, if, I suppose, if you want to be cute about this, we could say that the ABS cobbled together some statistics uh, that they believe would satisfy the requirements of the Australian Electoral Commission, uh, and uh, put together a special version of the December uh, quarter figures, as opposed to using the latest available statistics. And it was, in fact, the the, the statistics that were uh, you know somehow put together by the Australian Bureau of Statistics that were used by the Australian Electoral Commission. Senator Ray is right. If, in fact, the latest available statistics had been used, they would have been the June 2002 uh, quarter figures. And, of course, they were clearly would have uh, entitled the Northern Territory to, to obtain its uh, second seat. But I want to also, for the Hansard, say this to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, that I hope that they have listened and looked long and hard at the debate about uh, the reasons as to why the Northern Territory was going to lose its second representation in this parliament. Uh, and I hope it has read transcripts of people like Elliot McAdam, who is the member for Barclay, who said on the 27th of March in 2003 in an interview on the ABC, uh, when he was questioned about uh, the collection of the statistics, uh, he said uh, this, <clears throat> uh, that uh, very clearly a lot of people were not included. He's talking about his area of Barclay around Tennant Creek. Uh, and he is saying, uh, I got information as far as Port Keats and Wadi indicated that there were probably about 20 forms that was not uh, picked up. Now, I don't know how many people that would be, he says, but I imagine it would be probably, you know, around the 100 mark. Uh, he goes on to say, I got reports out of Borroloola. Same sort of thing. You know, forms were not picked up by the ABS and at least one community in the region was not visited. So clearly there were some very severe problems with the way in which the census was conducted in 2001 in respect of the Northern Territory. And we know that work uh, done by uh, academics at the ANU, by Taylor and Bell, when they produced a report on the Queensland Centre for Population Research, they had this to say about their study in the Cape York Peninsula. One conclusion of this study, they, says, they say, 
was that the enumeration strategy adopted by the ABS for use in remote Indigenous communities was structured in such a way as to increase the likelihood of omitting young people, the more mobile and the more socially marginal. Uh, so quite clearly, uh, sorry, and they also go on to say concerns have been expressed for some time by Indigenous community leaders, government agencies and local service providers about the accuracy of demographic data for those Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander communities in Queensland. Well, it would seem that that is also a concern that's replicated in the Northern Territory. So what this has led to, I hope, is the Australian Bureau of Statistics taking a very careful look at the way in which people in remote Indigenous communities are counted in the census. I hope they will undertake an evaluation of the way in which that work is conducted and that we see significant improvements in that by the time we get to the next uh, census in 2005. So I um, would just like to, for the record, say that uh, thanks to the work of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, we now have, I think, an outcome that we can all live with. This, this does not give the Northern Territory two seats forever. It does not mandate a minute, minimum representation in this parliament forever. What it does do, it says a mistake was made in 2003, that the latest available statistics should have been used, which would have given the Territory two seats. Therefore, the 2003 determination needs to be set aside. But it also, by virtue of this bill, ensures that the error of margin that is normally used by the ABS will be picked up and used by the Australian Electoral Commission. And it puts in place, I think, a good foundation for the way in which these figures can be utilised in the future. Now, that's not to say that at some time in the future we may well go back to one seat. That may well happen, but at least we now have a process that is much more thorough, takes much more account of the reality of what happens in the way in which these figures are used, and hopefully will stop any errors such as that that occurred last year reoccurring again. So I commend this bill to the Senate. I thank again the work of the uh, Joint Standing uh, Committee on Electoral Matters, and I'm sure that the people of Solomon in particular will be pleased to know that the representation in this chamber will continue for at least on into the next term of uh, the next parliament. Thank you, Senator Cross. And the Special Minister of State, Senator the Honourable uh, Eric Abetz. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy <coughs> President. Uh, the integrity and robustness of the Commonwealth Electoral Act and its processes lies at the very heart of our uh, democratic system and the Australian people's acceptance of the outcomes of uh, our elections. And uh, the speakers that have involved themselves in today's debate have, uh, with slightly different slants, um, indicated uh, the history and the background to this legislation. Uh, put very simply, um, the member for Solomon, David Tolner, uh, raised the issue uh, publicly and, as Senator Scullion indicated, when other people raised their hands in despair and said nothing could be done, Mr Tolner championed the cause. He introduced a private member's bill and uh, confronted uh, with that as uh, the responsible minister and having been trying to work through the process myself as to what an appropriate outcome ought to be, I was of the view that the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters should be seized of the matter, look at it and come up with a proposal. And can I uh, commend the committee and uh, the representatives on that committee from four different political parties for coming up uh, with a solution and a robust solution that is transparent and uh, one which uh, we as a government were willing to adopt. In relation to the uh, three recommendations, one which was to guarantee uh, the Northern Territory, not guarantee, but give, for the short term at least, the Northern Territory uh, its second seat back again was something which we as a government thought was important as a result of which we were prepared to move simply on that recommendation on the strict understanding and a promise that we would be legislating in relation to the other two recommendations as well. The opposition took a view, which I fully accept, that the one bill should have included all matters, so uh, we got our skates on and uh, put all three recommendations into the one bill. That is what is before us today, and I thank honourable senators for their cooperation 
in assisting us in getting the bill through. Can I uh, refer to uh, Senator Murray's amendments uh, and simply indicate there are substantial technical amendments, uh, technical problems with his amendments. I won't seek to delay the Senate uh, today. Time is of a premium. Uh, and uh, simply indicate that there are problems. Uh, I'd be happy to discuss them with him further sometime in the future. But uh, uh, well, in relation to the principle, it's interesting because the concept of foreign donations, I must say, was somewhat foreign to me until I had a look at the Australian Electoral Commission website. And I then found out who the major beneficiaries of foreign donations were. And it's in fact a political party that is not represented in the chamber at the moment uh, by their two representatives. And uh, so it is interesting that those who uh, call themselves uh, with the title Australian as a prefix to their name uh, are in fact the major beneficiaries of uh, overseas uh, contributions. But uh, I won't traverse that path too far because it is non-controversial legislation that we are debating. And uh, can I thank honourable senators for their contribution and can I indicate to the deputy president who's looking at his clock, I'll be finishing it uh, after four minutes speaking as opposed to Senator Crossan who took about eight minutes to repeat the one sentence a hundred times. But uh, I thank honourable senators for their contribution and commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, uh, Minister. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 and for related purposes. Thank you. Is it the uh, wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is the bill stand as printed. Senator Murray. Mr Chairman, uh, I move the uh, um, amendments listed on sheet 4207 revised. The question is that the amendment one on sheet 4207 revised be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The noes have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The, time wasn't the temporary chairman of committee, Senator Hogg, reports that the committee has considered the Commonwealth uh, Electoral Amendments representative representation in the House of Representatives Bill 2004 and has agreed to it without amendments. The Minister. Thank you. I thought Senator Hogg was in fact a permanent fixture and not a temporary chair, but uh, we won't uh, traverse that. I think he is chairman of committees. But having said that, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day No. 9, Taxation Laws Clearing and Settlement Facility Support Bill 2003, second reading, adjourned debate. Thank you, Clerk. Senator Ludwig. You're on my speaking list, Senator Ludwig. Oh, it's only in the sense of uh, I'm representing the. Uh, Happy to go to uh, the Minister. Uh, the, uh, no, I was just going to indicate our support for the bill. Thank you, Senator Ludwig. The parliamentary secretary, Senator Troth. Thank you. Uh, just to say that this bill ensures that no taxation consequences will arise as a result of a payment out of the National Guarantee Fund under section number 891A of the Corporations Act 2001. And I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank Senate's you, opinion. Senator Troth. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to negate tax consequences relating to payments under section 891A of the Corporations Act 2001 and for related purposes. Mm. Yes, the parliamentary secretary, Senator Troth. Yes, I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to negate consequences relating to payments under section 891A of the Corporations Act 2001 and for related purposes. 
Government Business Order of the Day No. 10, Superannuation Legislation Amendment, Family Law Bill 2002, Second Reading, Adjourned Debate. Thank you, uh, Clark. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you. Uh, in relation to uh, uh, this particular bill, the representative uh, that normally deals with Super Legislation Amendment, Family Law Bill, uh, unfortunately couldn't be with us uh, today. He's got another engagement. He has asked me, though, uh, if, uh, if the uh, Senate would grant him leave to. Uh, to incorporate his speech in relation to this. I have shown it to the, uh, whip, the government whip in relation to this matter, and it might just uh, save us a couple of minutes rather than me uh, uh, go through the uh, salient points. And so I is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The parliamentary secretary, Senator Truth. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, this bill proposes amendments to a number of acts that deal with superannuation ar arrangements for members of the Commonwealth Civilian Schemes and members of the Australian Defence Force Schemes. The bill will provide a framework within the relevant schemes for dealing with a superannuation agreement or family court order in relation to the division of the member's superannuation following marriage breakdown. It will enable a separate superannuation benefit account to be created in the relevant superannuation arrangement for a member's former spouse in these circumstances. This will allow for a clean break of superannuation entitlements between the parties at the time of marriage breakdown and also provide both parties with control over their respective individual benefits. I thank members for their contribution for the debate and I have um, some government amendments which I fair shadow. I will be moving in the committee stage. Thank you, uh, Senator Troth. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark? A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to superannuation and for related okay. purposes. I'm off. Is it the uh, wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President, Mr. Chairman. I table a supplementary memorandum, a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill. The memorandum was circulated in the chamber on the 1st of April 2004. Parliamentary Secretary, oh, uh, Senator Ludwig. Thank you. Uh, I think that's the uh, group that I have before me, which is a VW222 and the uh, supplementary explanatory They haven't been moved. Uh, oh, I see. No, no. The, I was waiting for the parliamentary secretary to stand and move. You moving those? You're seeking leave to move them together? Yes, leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Parliamentary secretary, you're moving them? Oh, I, I move those amendments. They're moved. Senator Ludwig? I can indicate uh, support on behalf of the opposition in relation to those amendments. And the question is that amendments 1 to 11 on sheet VW222 be agreed to. That those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Ludwig, what, you, are you, you're not proceeding with your amendments? Curious as to whether or not I have to advise uh, that we won't be proceeding with those amendments, or if I don't you, move you've them, now they won't, then they won't I'll be moved. I'll take it as advice from you that you're not proceeding with your amendments. The question, therefore, is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The uh, chairman of committees, uh, Senator Hogg, reports that the committee has considered the superannuation legislation amendment family law bill 2002 and agreed to it with amendments. Parliamentary secretary. Yes. Is that the report of the committee be adopted? And the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Parliamentary secretary. I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question time. is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. For an act to amend legislation relating to superannuation and for related purposes. Uh, Government business order of the day number 11, Dairy Produce Amendment Bill 2003, consideration in committee. Into those state. No, we can't. Oh, we can't. It's in committee. It's in committee. It's all right. <coughs> I 
Order. The committee is considering the Dairy Produce Amendment Bill 2003. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that, sorry, Senator Ludwig. We might. Um, the uh, the bill in relation to dairy, of course, is a very interesting uh, amendment that's been uh, that's uh, that before us in committee. The uh, dairy industry, of course, uh, if I can go back to my state in Queensland itself, has been. Uh, one of those uh, states that has had a long history of uh, involvement in relation to dairy. And in fact, the area that I, uh, I uh, went to school in, Boona, was a, a dairy area. But over the last uh, couple of years, I got to say that when I first was there in 1978, it was a significant dairy area. However, over the last uh, number of years, which are more than I'd care to count, the area has in fact moved away from uh, dairy into uh, other interests. In fact, it's um, now. Have I? Then, uh, well, in fact, I actually don't mind uh, in sharing my history with dairy because it's one of these problems that this government, I think, has uh, failed to uh, really understand sometimes the people involved in the dairy industry because that was an area that was in fact uh, quite. Uh, Quite a significant dairy area. It's now moved uh, away from that area. It's been uh, reduced, and of course, uh, I think the government has uh, failed. I think the dairy industry uh, uh, quite uh, quite substantially over the time. I, I can remember the dairy deregulation package itself uh, some time ago. We, one of those issues that was uh, alive during the last election campaign. I'm sure Senator, Senator Boswell is familiar with it too. But uh, it is a shame, in my view, that the government hasn't been responsive enough to the dairy industry needs. But without, without, saying, without saying any more, I will uh, leave the debate. The question is uh, that the bill stand is printed. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The uh, temporary chairman of the committee, Senator Ferguson, reports that the committee has considered the Dairy Produce Amendment Bill 2003 and agreed, agreed to it without amendments. Parliamentary Secretary. The report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. Parliamentary Secretary. I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Bill for an act to amend legislation relating to the dairy industry and for related purposes. Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, I move that the sitting of the Senate be suspended until 2 p.m. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The Senate stands suspended until 2 p.m.
Thank you. Order, would senators please take their positions? I have received through the Governor, uh, through the Governor General from the Governor of Victoria a facsimile copy of the Certificate of the Choice by the Houses of Parliament of Victoria of Mitchell Peter Fifield to fill the vacancy caused by the resignation of Senator Richard Alston. I table the document. Will the Honourable Senator please come to the table and make and subscribe the oath of allegiance? I, Mitchell Peter Fifield, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, according to law. So help me God. Please now sign the test roll and the senator's roll. Questions. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Patterson as Minister for Family and Community Services. Order. Is she here? Order. Now we're going to start our que last question time for this session with this, that sort of noise. I won't, I'm, I'm not going to accept it today. We'll just have some peace and quiet. Order. Well, here was I suppose. Senator Jones. Uh, Senator Collins. <laughs> Order. It's not. Does the minister recall the leaked cabinet minute of the 17th of December 2002? which stated Cabinet had noted, and I quote, that pressures remain on families in transition to parenthood, including a particularly sharp fall in income against which families receive varying levels of government assistance. Why has the government still not acted on this 2002 Cabinet Minute note, which recommended improving financial assistance at the time of birth of a child? Will the government now deliver on its three-year-old promise to help families balance their work and family responsibilities by developing an alternative policy which would deliver timely assistance at the birth of a child? Senator Patterson. Much, Mr. President. Well, it gives me the opportunity to remind honourable senators and to remind the community about what we have done for families in assisting them to balance work and family. What we have done is give families $19 billion a year assistance, $19 billion a year assistance 
almost $2 billion a year more in family assistance since the introduction of the new family tax system. What we've also done is to give families assistance, particularly where one, one member of the family chooses to stay at home, through the Family Tax Benefit B, almost $2,900 for each child under five. We've also given families assistance with childcare, doubling the amount of funding that's been spent on childcare since we came into government, from, eight, from $4 billion to $8 billion. Senator Collins doesn't want to hear this, uh, but uh, she's going to have to listen to the fact, because she doesn't like to hear that we have actually doubled spending on childcare. We've increased the number of childcare places by 210,000, from now up to 530,000 childcare places. We have assisted families also. Order. We have also assisted families to balance work and family by introducing much more flexible workplaces to enable families to mix work and family. Labor, Labor is so inflexible with their slavery to unions that actually means that families don't have the opportunity to have workplaces that are flexible, workplaces that deal with balancing their work and family. Unlike uh, Labor, who fails, has always failed to cost and fund their policies, and when they are in government, racked up $60 billion worth of debt, on which we were paying almost $5 billion a year in interest. And you'd think they'd learn that when you borrow money, you have to pay interest. Five billion dollars in interest. That is money we can now spend assisting families through the Stronger Families and Community Program, assisting families in, in ways that will assist them to actually uh, care for their families. But Labor didn't care. They borrowed from the next generation of children. They didn't build for the future. Senator Collins shrugs her shoulders and closes her eyes because she doesn't want to hear that we've actually assisted families and increased assistance to families by uh, $2 billion a year, or almost $2 billion a year, since the introduction of the new family tax system, doubled spending on childcare, increased the number of childcare places by 210,000, increased flexibility in the workplace so, to assist families to balance work and family. Senator Collins, supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr President. Is the minister aware that there are no budget papers or portfolio statements in existence that can verify the Treasurer's extraordinary claim that the baby bonus spending has been revised down by $347 million in the forward estimates. Has the government hidden these budget numbers because there is a secret plan to scrap the baby bonus, or is it just that Mr Costello can't admit that a policy that he once described as the centrepiece of the government's election platform was a massive flop. Senator Patterson. Senator, Mr. President, I always say that as soon as Labor hasn't got a policy or has got a policy that's got a problem and their child care payment policy has got a problem, they concoct a conspiracy. That's typically all scaremonger. One or the other concoct, concoct a uh, conspiracy or scaremonger. What you ought to be worried about, Senator Collins, is that you've got, you've got uh, role because you've had your side going out all the time talking about a paid maternity leave scheme and it's gone off the agenda. Where is the Labor Party's paid maternity scheme? What they have done is surreptitiously get rid of that, surreptitiously get rid of that and substitute this uh, baby care payment which is not fully funded. Senator Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate and, Senate and Minister for Defence, Senator Hill. And I ask, is the Minister aware of claims today by the Opposition Leader that the immediate withdrawal of Australian troops from Iraq would have no consequences? Will the Minister outline the consequences that such a reckless action would have for Australian diplomats and officials in Iraq and for the people of Iraq? And I further ask, is the, is the Minister aware of any information provided by the Defence Department officials which may have led the Opposition Leader to have made such a foolish remark. Thanks, Senator, Senator Ferguson. And, um, let me answer the last question first. There have been no operational briefings on Iraq to Mr Latham from Defence officials. None, Mr President. In fact, as far as our records show, Mr Latham has never even asked for an operational briefing on Iraq let alone received one. 
Mr. President, in light of that, Mr. Latham's verbaling of Mr. Benighton yesterday was disgraceful. Following a request made through the Prime Minister's office, my office arranged for Mr. Latham to receive the standard briefing that all new opposition leaders receive on the general roles and responsibilities of DSD and Pine Gap. That briefing was done by Mr. Benighton, a senior and respected public servant. Mr. Benighton gave the briefing and, on returning to Canberra, wrote and signed a note outlining the areas which were covered in detail in the briefing. Mr. President, not surprisingly, they were the areas which are covered in all such standard briefings. Current operations in Iraq were not mentioned in that note. Mr. President, this is not a politically convenient reconstruction done months later. It was written and signed while the meeting was still fresh in Mr. Benighton's mind. Mr. President, the Prime Minister has offered to show Mr. Latham that note. Not surprisingly, Mr. Latham has not taken up the offer. In contrast to Mr. Benighton's recollection of the briefing, which was backed up by the contemporaneous note, we have an opposition leader making wild, unsubstantiated claims. In doing so, he was he what he basically said was that Mr. Benighton briefed against the government of the day. Shocking allegations against a highly respected and professional public servant. And I might say in passing, Mr. President, a public servant that still has the full confidence of this government. This was an invention by Mr. Latham for his short term political objective of trying to get himself out of the mess he had created. And we know that he couldn't have been briefed on operational matters. If he had, how could he have made the statement this morning? that the immediate withdrawal of troops would have no consequences. Mr President, the immediate withdrawal of our troops would leave Australian diplomats, Australian officials and Australian businessmen Order. completely without protection. The immediate Order. withdrawal of our troops would leave the new Iraqi army short of professional trainers. The immediate withdrawal of Australian Senator troops and Senator would Evans. punch holes in the provisional authority, the coalition headquarters in Baghdad and the United headquarters, the UN headquarters, UK headquarters in Basra. Mr. President, Mr. Latham told the Parliament yesterday that he relies on Senator Evans for getting regular updates on defence. Last week it was Mr. Beasley. I've been advised by Defence that, according to their records, the last operational briefings given to Senator Evans on Iraq by the head of strategic operations was on April 14, 2003, almost 12 months ago. Mr. President, Mr. Latham told the parliament he relies on Mr. Rudd because Mr. Rudd's travelled to Baghdad and he's been briefed there. The only problem with that is that after those briefings, Mr. Rudd didn't call for an immediate withdrawal of the troops. He called for more military trainers to go to Iraq. He called for police trainers to go to Iraq. He called for election commission workers to go to Iraq. Mr. President, Order. today the government is announcing the appointment of Major General Jim Molan as the, as the uh, Deputy Chief for Operations within the Multilateral Force Headquarters in Baghdad to be established as part of the transition to Iraqi Order. governance. Order, I congratulate him, Mr. Time, President. Time it's an important the question position. Has expired. Senator Ferguson. Yes, yeah, supplementary question, Mr. President. Uh, could I ask the minister uh, to inform the Senate of the new, any further new contributions that the ADF is making in Iraq, and how would an ill-conceived policy of the immediate withdrawal of all troops negate the benefits of this contribution? Senator Hill. I think, because I was just uh, just saying, Mr. President, the appointment uh, of uh, Major General Molan to such a highly important. Uh, position in the new in the new military headquarters that will be established after the transitions demonstrates how important Australia is regarded as part of the coalition that is helping rebuild Iraq for the Iraqi people. What the opposition is arguing is that that, that contribution should be withdrawn. We should cut and run. We should turn our backs on the Iraqi people in their time of need. We should fail to make a contribution that has at the hope 
of creating a stable and democratic country in the Middle East, an area that is of such strategic importance to the whole global community. Why would you turn your back and fail to meet that responsibility when Australia is being recognised as doing such a good job? Mr President, Mr Latham should think again about this ill-conceived policy. Order. Senator Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I have a question to Senator Hill, the Minister of Defence. And I, uh, it follows on from his selective and misquoting of uh, Mr Latham uh, in the previous question. And I also remind him that we had a long discussion about Iraq at the estimates meeting on the 18th of February, which Order. we discussed the condition of the troops and their role and when they'd be coming home. But putting that to one side for the moment, can the minister confirm that he requested the Secretary of the Department of Defence, Mr Rick Smith, to provide him with advice on briefings of the Leader of the Opposition by members of the ADF or officials of the Department of Defence. Were Mr Smith or his Deputy Secretary, Mr Benighton, given any directions about the contents of the letters? Were they provided with draft letters? Senator Hill. I don't remember Mr Latham saying yesterday, yesterday that he got his information from the Hansard, Mr President. He said he got it from Senator Evans. The whole world had the opportunity to know what happened in the Estimates Committee. I suspect Mr Latham didn't read the Hansard. I suspect he is ignorant of these matters. I suspect until very recently he had no interest in these matters. If he had an interest, why would he have made this silly policy, this dangerous policy on the run? If he had order. Point of order, Senator. There goes the question of relevance. The minister did his Dorothy Dixer and his rave. What I asked him was a specific question about whether he gave the instructions of the request of the Secretary of Defence. Will, yep. will you ask the Minister to refer to the question Senator Camp and Senator ask Campbell. Senator Campbell to Senator sit down Campbell, and pipe down? Come to order. Senator Campbell, are you reflecting on the Chair? Well, I'd ask you to, to remain silent. Senator Evans, your point of order it was regarding relevance. As I stated, Mr President, the Minister hasn't attempted to answer the question at all. Well, He's continued on with his Dorothy Dixer. I'd ask minister, you to bring his attention yeah, well, to the, the question. The Minister has three and a half minutes of uh, time left to answer the question. I'd remind him of the question. Senator Hill. Well, Mr President, I, thought, I actually thought that Senator Evans raised the issue of the Estimates Committee. He was, trying to, he was trying to provide real room for Mr Latham because Mr Latham said he took advice from Senator Evans and Senator Evans hadn't had a briefing for a year. So Senator Evans on the run says, oh yes, but it must have come out of the Estimates Committee. But that's not a briefing, that's advice to the world. The point I was making... Don't smile, Senator Evans. The point I was making is, Order, is that Senator this opposition Evans. leader is not interested in facts. He made this policy on the run. He thought there was some short-term political advantage, some popular position, some popular gain he could get from this policy. And without thinking, without thinking about the consequences to Australian forces, without thinking about the consequences to Iraq, he let this policy go, and since then he's been trying to wriggle out of it. Senator Evans. It says now at another minute and a half, uh, I draw your, question, to draw your attention to the question of relevance. I asked him a specific question about the request made to the De Defence Secretary, whether he made it and what, uh, whether he gave instructions about what the letter should contain. I'd ask you to draw his attention to the question. I've ruled and other presidents have ruled that I can't instruct the minister how he's to answer the question. All I can do is remind him of the question and remind him that he has two and a half minutes left. Senator Hill. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. Order, Senator Cook. Senator Cook. Mr. President, Mr. Latham claimed to have been briefed by by defence officials on operational matters in Iraq. I, through my office, asked the secretary of my department whether that is correct. He, Mr. President, asked around the department and said no. No evidence of any briefings for Mr Latham. Similarly, Mr Benighton is on the public record as indicating, through the, the letter that's been tabled, that there was no operational briefing from him. So, so yesterday, Mr Latham just totally invented this story. Or, uh... Just totally invented this story. And in doing so, in doing so, in doing so, did serious damage to a highly respected and professional public servant. 
This is the Labour Party. This is the Labour Party that was telling us how important it was to protect the integrity of public servants only, only a week Order. or so Senator ago. Faulkner. What short memories, Order. what double standards. Order, Minister. Senator Faulkner continually shouting across the chamber while the Minister is trying to answer the question doesn't help. Yeah. Senator Hill. Mr. President, Mr. President, if, if it's one thing for Mr. Latham to invent, invent an explanation to try and get himself out of this mess, but what right has he got to undermine the credibility of a highly respected public servant? How many, of, how many on the other side did Senator Ray go to Mr. Latham and say, "How dare you do this"? Did Senator Faulkner? All of those who were who demanding high standards in relation to the treatment of public Order. servants. Senator, Senator Evans, Senator Cook, Senator Balkus, continually shouting across the chamber is disorderly. It's ruled, been ruled so on many occasions. I'd ask you to come to order, and Senator Campbell, in, interjections by you don't help either. Senator Hill. The interjection was we dragged him into it. We did it. He claimed he got the briefings. He didn't tell the truth. He invented it. No one gave him the briefings. He dragged the public servants into this debate, and he was prepared to kick the public servants Senator in the guts Evans. to try and make a political point. Senator Evans, it's now four and a half minutes since the question was asked, or, and the minister still hasn't brought himself to answer the question. Now you 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 uh, keep bringing us to water in terms of interjections. What we'd like is an answer to the question. Otherwise, there's no point to question time. There's no. There's no point of order. Senator, Senator Hill, withdraw that. Senator, Senator Cook, I'd ask you to withdraw. What you just said was unparliamentary. It, it is unparliamentary. I'm I'd telling ask... the truth. <laughs> Senator Cook, I'd ask you to withdraw that unparliamentary well, language. If you want me to withdraw the truth, I withdraw. I'd ask you to withdraw that unconditionally. I've withdrawn. Mr. Look, President. I don't need your advice, Senator Faulkner. I've withdrawn my statement, Mr. Thank President. You. Senator Hill. It reminds me, it reminds me of the truth he told about the size of the deficit. We all remember that. Senator Cook, the economics minister for the Labor government. The budget is in surplus, as he said. We're $10 Order. million dollars in deficit. Well, that lie. Senator, there's no point of order. You know that. Senator Hill. Senator Hill. I said, Mr. President, my office, me, asked the Secretary to clarify the matter. My office, me, asked Mr. Benighton to clarify the matter. Order. Senator, Senator Evans, supplementary question. Supplementary question, uh, Mr. President. Uh, can the, uh, can the, I think at the end there, Minister, finally address the question. I'd like him to confirm that his office asked both Mr Smith to, uh, to respond on the 30th and that again yesterday his office went back to Mr Benighton and asked him to provide more details or, or asked him to specifically reply. Can he also confirm whether or not any specific instruction was given to Mr Benighton in terms of how the letter should be provided and what form it should take? And will the minister ensure that both Mr Smith and Mr Benighton are at the next budget estimates round in order to provide evidence to the Budget Estimates Committee? Senator Hill. They will both be at the Estimates Committee, Mr President. And I bet they're terrified at the thought of an interrogation from Senator Evans. They're quite big enough to write their own letters, Mr President. And why were they dragged into it? Because the Labor Party the Labor Party claimed through Mr Latham to have received briefings, which was never the case. Senator never Evans, the case. continually Invented. shouting across the chamber is disorderly, and you know it is. And if the, if the Senate doesn't come to order on both sides of the chamber and cut down the noise, I think I'm very seriously considering a suspending question time. Well, point of order. Point of order. Uh, the What's the point of order, Senator? Well, my point of order is this. You have called opposition senators to order continually during question time today. In my view, and I think in the view of any reasonable person, there has been as much interjection, disorderly conduct, conduct on the government side as there's been on the opposition side. Sure, sure, opposition senators have been interjecting. Fine. And I don't mind opposition senators being called to order when that happens. But I expect you also to apply the standing order, orders 
equally, equally to senators from the government side. Are you side. reflecting on the chair, Senator Conroy? Are you reflecting on the chair? Good. I can't hear him because of interjections. Well, and I would ask myself. you, Mr. President, to ensure that you apply the standing orders equally to both sides of the chamber. It is a reasonable request, it is a reasonable expectation, and it's certainly mine. Thank you for the lecture, Senator. I will continually rule the way the interjections are called. If you recall, I've called Senator Campbell to order a dozen times today. Are we, going to, are we going to continue with this racket across the chamber, or do you want me to suspend question time? It's up to you. Senator Knowles. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Family and Community Services. I asked the minister if she would update the Senate as to what the Howard government is doing to assist Australian families and what effect other options would have on government policy. Senator Patterson. Well, uh, thank you very much, Senator Niles, and I appreciate the opportunity to reiterate yet again what this government has done for Australian families. As I said earlier, we are giving families now each year $19 billion in assistance, around $2 billion more each year, $2 billion more each year uh, since the introduction of the new tax system. That means that, on average, a family gets about $6,000 a year assistance, tax-free, uh, to rear their families. The Family Tax Benefit B means that 2,900 goes to families who are eligible each year, or up to $2,900 goes to families each year for each child under five through the FTB payment if a second income earner chooses to stay at home, giving families choice. We've doubled the childcare funding uh, to around $1.5 billion a year, and we've increased uh, childcare places by around 210,000. Now, uh, at the ALP conference in January, Mr Latham said a Labor government would introduce paid maternity leave. And on February the 15th, when asked on the Sunday program by Laurie Oakes if he would introduce paid maternity leave, Wayne Swan said, absolutely, absolutely. And that's why Labor has committed itself to a scheme of paid maternity leave, committed itself. And yet yesterday, we had Mark Latham announcing a baby care payment. Now, what has happened in three months where we have Labor claiming a leaked report from the government's work and family task force? And that report proposed a baby care payment. They couldn't even get a name for their program, a new name for their program. So what, we had in, what we've had in three years is uh, no policy in three years, a commitment to paid maternity leave scheme in January at the Labor conference, a recommitment in February by Mr Swan on a national television program of a commitment to a paid maternity leave uh, scheme. And then uh, the next thing we know, we've got the Labor Party with a backflip. And I'm sure there are a few people on the other side taken off guard. We've got a no paid maternity leave and a copycat baby uh, payment policy. We have Mr Swan and the Labor Party bragging for the last six months that they were going to introduce a national paid maternity leave scheme, but they got rolled by their leader. And we have Kevin Rudd being rolled on Iraq. We've got Bob McMullen rolled on Mr. taxation. Uh, We've got Senator, Swains. Address the senators and members by the correct title. Mr Kevin Rudd rolled. I'll give you the opportunity to say it again, Mr President. Mr Kevin Rudd rolled uh, on Iraq. Mr Bob McMullen rolled on taxation, and now Mr Swan rolled on maternity leave. Uh, and yesterday, while exactly the same time as Mr Latham was out in Queanbeyan, yet again sitting down with kids, uh, was in here, uh, Senator Collins was in here bagging the Family Tax Benefit Scheme. She was bagging the Family Tax Benefit Scheme. And what do we find when we read the fine detail of the uh, policy, or so-called policy, that Mr Latham put out? It's using the Family Tax Benefit as the framework. The very Family Tax Benefit that Senator C Collins was in here. They're going to say Joan Collins. Senator Collins was Senator in here Kemp. bagging yesterday. Order, Senator Kemp. That must hurt. It must hurt Senator Collins, you know, because there she was bagging that policy, and there was her leader out there using it as a as a uh, framework for this new for their new so-called policy. No paid paternity leave, and now we have FTB as the cornerstone of Labor's copycat policy. 
Well, they've scrapped their commitment to paid maternity leave, and now we've got Labor using Medicare, using the Medicare safety net as part of their funding for their baby scheme, taking the money out of one pocket of a family and, and putting it into the other, a sort of uh, a, a, a pea and thimble trick. Um, this will mean that, in particular, low-income families will have greater out-of-pocket medical expenses. They'll scrap the safety Order net Minister. for employee Time entitlements, for and that will also affect expired. low Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question follows on the last one from Senator Knowles, is also addressed to Senator Patterson, Minister for Family and Community Services. Can the minister <coughs> confirm that the government has requested a wide-ranging federal police inquiry into the unauthorised disclosure of a number of sensitive cabinet in confidence documents relating to controversial issues in the family and community services portfolio. Does the minister agree with the statement of the secretary of her portfolio, Mr Sul Sullivan, in a departmental circular yesterday when he stated, and I quote him, it would be very disappointing if the possible actions of an individual or individuals affected the reputation of us all. Minister, is the leaking of the contents of Mr Sullivan's memo also an unauthorised disclosure of sensitive information from her department, which now has the reputation of leaking like a sieve under her stewardship? Senator Patterson. You know, I find it really interesting that Labor, when they haven't got any policies, when they haven't got any questions, would resort to that sort of question. Of course there will be an investigation. Of course. When Cabinet in Confidence documents are leaked, there is an investigation. That doesn't mean to say that those documents would have come necessarily from my department, but of course it is against the law to leak and it's inappropriate for shadow ministers to actually receive and use uh, leaked documents. But don't worry about that. Mr Swan wouldn't care about that. I remember when Senator Vanstone got a wad of stuff, a wad of stuff from Attorney General. In fact, a whole series of discs which, was shot, which actually would have just blown you apart. What did Senator Vanstone do? She had the decency to take them back. She took them back because she thought that was the approach. But would Labor have done that? Bet your bottom dollar they wouldn't have taken them back. They would have used them. They would have abused them. It is appropriate for an investigation. It reflects on every single person who has had access to that document if it, if it has been leaked. And, it's, and it, there is an investigation ongoing about a number of, of uh, documents, and, it, and the latest one will be included in that. I have no, I, I, that's the normal procedure for that to occur. Senator Faulkner, supplementary, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, doesn't the mounting flood of cabinet in confidence documents with her, within uh, her ministerial responsibility uh, indicate that uh, this actually reflects on the minister's handling of sensitive policy issues? On the minister's handling of sensitive policy issues, Concer concerns, of course, which were exacerbated after her apologies last night for bullying a senator. Can the minister inform the Senate? whether the Federal Police Leak Inquiry will extend, will extend to the possible leaking of her Cabinet documents by ministers and other ministerial officers. Order. Senator Patterson. The AFP will determine who uh, is questioned with regard to the leaking of documents. It's a, a, a process that is undertaken by the AFP. And I am sure the AFP will investigate uh, as far as the documents have been circulated and investigate the, the leaking of those documents. I'm not going to comment or interfere with the process that the AFP will undertake. Senator Ridgway. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Ageing, Senator Ian Campbell. Uh, is the minister aware that the Senate yesterday agreed that the national emergency in Indigenous health is a matter of urgent priority and called on the government to address this situation in the upcoming budget in May? Does the minister agree that the current approaches to Indigenous health care are clearly not working and what is needed is an end to defensive politics and buck passing and a new commitment to addressing this crisis immediately? How will the government respond to the Senate's call in a practical way? And will the minister commit to providing extra emergency funding in this year's budget to address the critical need for primary health care services for Indigenous communities? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Ian Campbell. 
Well, thank you uh, very much, President. Can I firstly commend Senator Ridgway for bringing on that motion uh, yesterday? Uh, and I think he did it in a true spirit of trying to raise the awareness of uh, the parliament and the people of uh, Australia um, about the plight of Indigenous uh, people. Uh, and I think it was a worthwhile debate. Sadly, as, as Senator Ridgway will know, Mr. President, I was in the chamber at the time and heard uh, a, an outrageous, outrageous contribution to the debate by uh, a, a Labor Party spokesman, I think indeed their spokesman on Indi Indigenous affairs, uh, which uh, ensured that certainly the first, the first part of that debate, Mr. President, and, uh, uh, was in fact um, turned into a, uh, a nasty, partisan, cheap political uh, debate that, that in fact uh, Senator Ridgway, I'm sure, would agree with me. Uh, denigrated and uh, detracted from his uh, initiative. Uh, the coalition, as Senator Ridgway knows better than most senators in this place, because I know he and I have worked together before he was a senator on improving the, the plight of uh, Indigenous Australians in a range of uh, areas uh, through our engagement on the land fund debate, has uh, come to uh, significantly improve the resources uh, going into Indigenous health. For example, funding for uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Program stands at more than $272 million uh, in this year, which is a growth of just under 100 per cent uh, since 1996. And I think the point that uh, Senator Ridgway makes is that even with that nearly 100 per cent increase of funding uh, directly uh, spent uh, on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, program, uh, that program, uh, that we're not getting the sort of improvements uh, that he and I would like to see for Indigenous Australians uh, in their health outcomes and in, in mortality rates, which do, uh, of course, uh, compare very badly uh, internationally uh, in terms of the health, health of Indigenous people. So to the question as to can we uh, and should we look at uh, policy options for improving the benefit that Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders receive from that substantial Commonwealth uh, assistance for uh, health, uh, the answer, of course, is a resounding yes. And I don't think anybody in this chamber uh, would, would contradict us. Um, in the uh, primary health care area, the Commonwealth in the 1999-2000 uh, budget allocated uh, $78.8 million over four years. Uh, to specifically uh, address Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's access to primary health care uh, through the Primary Health Care Access Program. That is, that is a one specific program that was developed in consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to ensure that they could get uh, good access to primary health care. And I think Senator Ridgway, Mr President, would uh, agree that that is one of the sorts of programs that we need to uh, put more uh, policy energy into and, if necessary, uh, better resources uh, to ensure that we uh, in, in increase the, uh, the, the, the outcomes. In terms of the budget question, which Senator Ridgway addresses quite properly in the uh, lead-up to the, uh, the budget in May, uh, I think he would be um, surprised if I was to answer what the budget outcome will be. We'll be back on the next sitting day. The Treasurer will bring down the, uh, the budget on next sitting week and uh, clearly uh, budget outcomes for the Indigenous Affairs portfolio will be announced quite properly by the Treasurer uh, at that time. Senator Ridgway, supplementary question. Uh, supplementary, Mr President. I thank the, uh, the Minister for his answer. I was hoping that the resounding yes was uh, uh, in anticipation of any budget announcements. Uh, is the Minister aware that uh, Professor John Diebel has estimated uh, for the Australian Medical Association that an additional uh, $300 million per year is urgently needed to address the crisis in Indigenous health, and that this estimate is comprised of $250 million to provide adequate primary health care services, as well as $50 million or $12 per Indigenous person per year for public health and preventative programs such as health promotion, health education and screening. Uh, does the minister agree that the cost of inaction now will blow out the uh, virtually unsustainable expenses into the future, uh, will the minister give some undertaking or guarantee that uh, $300 million for Indigenous primary health care uh, can and will be provided in this year's budget? Senator Campbell. 
Uh, Mr. President, I, I, I clearly can't give a commitment to what will be in the budget. That would be uh, extraordinary and uh, would be a uh, defiance of sound uh, government process. You do, do need to ensure that you have a, a proper policy review, a review of the expenditures, uh, and of course a proper focus on improving policy outcomes. And the uh, the budget outcome need, needs to affect that. One figure uh, I think I'd like to have on the record, since Senator Ridgway has given me the chance, Mr. President, is to say that uh, total Australian government funding is in fact a dollar fifteen per capita for Indigenous Australians for every one dollar spent on non-Indigenous Australians. So we are putting in a significant uh, effort to address the quite clear and demonstrable and well-documented deficit in terms of Indigenous uh, health outcomes. And we welcome Senator Ridgway's encouragement and, the, and, and other people like Professor Diebel, I think you pronounce his name, um, to uh, drawing the government's attention to Order that Minister, and proposing uh, time for action, the question is expired. Senator Ray. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Hill, representing the Foreign Minister. Minister, given that today you have confirmed you asked Mr. Smith and Mr. Benighton for letters, can you tell us who asked the Director General of ASIS for his letter regarding the briefing with the opposition leader? Was it the Foreign Minister, Mr. Downer? Was it the Department of Foreign Affairs? Or did he provide the letter of his own volition? When uh, Mr. David Irvine provided the letter, was he informed that it was going to become a public document that is released uh, by the foreign minister? And uh, was he at all appraised of the fact that it may be a matter of political controversy once it was released? Senator Hill. And in view of the detail it sought in that question, I'll refer it to the foreign minister for an early response. Senator Ray, supplementary question? Well, probably on a related matter of briefings, uh, can I ask the minister? Given the fact that today, um, both representing himself and I take it the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister, he has said there has not been an, uh, enough requests for briefing by opposition members, will in future opposition members be able to fully minute those briefings if disputation occurs? And more on the subject of briefing, why have members of the Labor Party been barred by you from visiting Amberley in Queensland uh, to try to get themselves briefed and across issues? When in fact, in the six years in which I was Defence Minister, I never refused one coalition member a base visit. Order. Senator Kemp. Senator Kemp and Senator Cook. Order. Senator Hill. Um, well, the, the first uh, part of the supplementaries raises interesting issues because, of course, I guess in future Mr. Benighton would need to be accompanied by. Uh, as an, another party, an honest broker in effect. Why did he go by himself? Because it, he didn't dream, of course, that he would be verbaled by Mr Latham in this way. Because traditionally it hasn't been necessary to have somebody vouch for the public servant. Why didn't we, why didn't we accompany Mr Benighton? Because that hasn't been necessary. That hasn't been necessary in the past either. What's, the, what's changed? What's changed, Mr President, is Mr Latham who is prepared to verbal a public servant for short-term political gain. And in, relation to, uh, in relation to briefings, Mr President, I would have thought that most in the opposition would say that I have been open and helpful. I have always sought to be. I have always sought to be, because I actually believe that the opposition has got a right to be briefed. And in most instances, I have also thought it is unnecessary to have somebody Order else Minister, attend to, to time invest for, answering the for the truth. Supplementary questions expired. Senator Lees. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Minchin, uh, the minister representing uh, the Minister for Industry. Uh, does the minister agree that Australia's needs for generating electricity uh, is actually increasing, and that, uh, as well as building new gen generating capacity, uh, we're also going to need to replace old infrastructure? Does the minister agree that new wind turbines with no greenhouse gas emissions are cheaper than new coal-fired power stations that will have to rely on, ga on gas sequestration to reduce emissions? And finally, will the government agree to increase the mandatory target for renewable energy, which will further reduce the cost of renewable energy? The Minister for Finance, Senator Minchin. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Lees for that question and acknowledge her interest in um, renewable energy and alternative forms of energy, I think something that uh, all Australians share some interest in. Uh, it should be said at the outset, however, that Australia's abundant uh, and generous reserves of uh, traditional sources of power—to uh, wit coal and gas 
uh, do give us an extraordinary uh, competitive advantage in the world. Uh, coal exports uh, are also a very, very major source of uh, income for Australia and a major source of power for many other nations around the world that need cheap, reliable sources of power. So I don't think uh, I would want to say anything that uh, uh, detracted from the importance of our traditional reliance on coal-fired and gas-fired power stations to provide the baseload power uh, which Australia very, very much needs in order to provide ordinary Australians with uh, relatively cheap and reliable power uh, and to ensure that Australian industry uh, is appropriately competitive in an increasingly competitive world. Uh, nevertheless, there is, um, we strongly believe, a proper place uh, for uh, supplementation of that baseload capacity uh, by, um, uh, by alternative forms of energy. And, uh, indeed, I was uh, recently visited in Aminka to look at the um, geothermal project uh, that's being um, tested and developed uh, in Inaminka in our state of South Australia, which I think has uh, very, very exciting uh, potential to be a source of alternative power. Um, in relation to um, the mandatory renewable energy target measure introduced by this government, it's been in place for over two years and is expected to produce a 60 per cent increase in electricity generation from renewable sources over a decade. Uh, an estimated two to three billion dollars of additional investment in renewable energy will be stimulated over the life of the uh, MRET, as it's known. Uh, the recent report of an independent review of the MRET legislation indicates that that measure is meeting its objective and that Australia is well on its way to achieving its renewable energy target. Uh, the government does remain committed to the MRET scheme and is currently examining the recommendations of the report and when we come to conclusions on the basis of that report they will be announced. Senator Lee, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I thank, do thank the minister for his interest in this area. But I ask him, is it not the case that Australia also has an abundant amount of sun and wind and that could we not lead the world in this new technology if the government was to increase uh, the MRET target? Does the minister agree that if we further encourage the use of renewable energy, that uh, by 2015 wind could be competitive, indeed will be competitive with gas and shortly after competitive with coal? And finally, I ask the minister, is it not the case that we are in fact well short of that 2 per cent target when you actually look at genera generating capacity, that it really is, so far, the amount generated by alternative sources is still nowhere near that 2 per cent? Senator Minchin. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Look, I, I don't have before me the exact proportion that has been reached to this point. Um, you know, I'm not going to repeat what I said to you about the success of the pro program, which I think has been successful. I'll have to uh, get confirmation of the question of whether it's achieved the 2 per cent at this point or not. Um, I think you know, all Australians do acknowledge the, uh, uh, the potential for solar and wind power, although both of them tend to be controversial. Uh, I certainly have some solar heating at uh, my place, but uh, I notice in South Australia there is controversy over wind, uh, wind power, the wind turbines, the effects on the environment, the uh, aesthetics of regions, but I do think Australians do expect that their governments, as we are and will continue to do, uh, put a considerable emphasis on the importance of exploiting our abundant uh, uh, reserves of solar and wind power, and something I personally am quite committed to. Senator O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Vanstone, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs. Can the Minister confirm that her Indigenous Affairs Agency, ATSIS, has withheld $640,000 of vital infrastructure funding to the homelands in the Anangu Pitjantjara lands during the current financial year? Can the Minister confirm this funding was withheld while a review of capital works projects was undertaken, denying homeland communities essential services during the hottest months of the year? Is it the case that the review was completed in January this year and in fact made favourable findings about the Capital Works Program, yet that funding continues to be withheld? Minister, why do you continue to withhold funding for essential water and power works in the AP lands, thus denying some of the most disadvantaged people in Australia access to basic services? The Minister for Indigenous Affairs. Senator Thank you, Mr Manchester. President. Um, I don't have advice with me at the moment on the $650,000 to which the uh, Shadow Minister refers, and I'll take that on notice and get an answer. But in relation to the pitlands, there are a number of matters that are important to bear in mind. 
uh, in relation to services. I note that the South Australian Deputy Premier has taken some very strong uh, steps in the pitlands and um, that he has uh, been able to deal with that problem, uh, thankfully, at last, uh, without uh, interference or political um, fight infighting uh, from the Commonwealth. Um, a lesson I would have thought perhaps the opposition at the Commonwealth level could learn. Nonetheless, uh, in relation to the pitlands, um, the Deputy Premier did speak to me about this matter before he did it. Uh, I told him that uh, I, I, I thought something had to be done, and uh, it's important to understand. Uh, I told him, and I think it's important the Senate understands, that the problems in the pitlands today frankly haven't been helped by the South Australian government. And you might ask yourself, why is not where is the Indigenous Affairs Minister at the South Australian state level? Where is Terry Roberts? Where is Terry Roberts? He's the Indigenous Affairs Minister. You know, hello, where are you? We haven't heard anything from him. And there's a reason for that. There is a reason for that. There's a reason that the Deputy Premier has taken over this matter and Mr Roberts is no longer involved. In 2001, the former South Australian government, in consultation with the Pitlands executive, appointed a change manager to tackle governance and administrative uh, problems in 2001. There were major problems there, there still are, that prompted that intervention. The change manager was appointed and was making real progress. Things, however, changed when the RAND government took office 18 months ago. My advice is that the minister, Mr Roberts, who is now no longer to be seen, went with the department head, Mr Buckskin, who used to be a federal public servant with whom I've worked, um, to support to the people that were opposed to the new government structure being developed. As a matter of interest, two gentlemen and the South Australian um, Premier's uh, former adviser, Mr Randall Ashbourne, went to the AP Council AGM when the former executive was ousted. So you had the executive of the pitlands recognising change was needed, working with the government to get a change manager, and then you had the new government minister going up with the head of his department, someone from the Premier's office, and uh, basically supporting the people who wanted to get rid of the executive who were fixing the problem. Days later, the newly appointed chair of the executive, appointed with the support of the Labor government, sacked the change manager. Sacked the change manager. We can tell you a bit more about the change manager if you'd like to go down this path. I'd prefer not to make Aboriginal politics a cheap political issue. I've known, well, I hear scoffing on the side. I've known about this for a long time, but you raised it, Senator, and I'm just advising you that there's plenty more where this came from. Plenty more. Days later, the new change manager was sacked. The state government appointed a new consultant uh, without consulting the Commonwealth and without consulting ATSIS. He was previously the CEO of the National Indigenous Development Association that shut down when it lost up to $6 million of ATSIC money. That's who the state government, in effect, helped get appointed to the pitlands by changing the pitlands, helping to change the executive Order of the Minister, pitlands that recognise the problem. The Plenty more to say expired. where this comes from. Senator O'Brien, supplementary, supplementary question, question uh, Mr. President. I note that the, uh, the minister has an extensive brief on, of a political nature on this matter. Can the minister advise why she has not been apparently briefed by her agency about the withholding of $640,000 of very important infrastructure money? for this particular region, some of the most disadvantaged people in the country. The minister says she doesn't have any information about the activities of her agency, but she wants to present to the Senate her spin on the political situation in the agency. Why does the, has the minister asked for information about the activities of her agency, or is she simply interested in making political points? Senator Van Stone. Uh, Mr President, uh, I didn't say the information isn't available. I simply said I don't have it with me now. I certainly don't have information on every dollar the Commonwealth spends in every area. Um, but uh, since I've made it clear that the former executive of the Pitlands wanted to do something about it, was in the process of doing something, 
That executive was removed with the support of the state government, and then this man was appointed, from the, who had been the National Indigenous Development Association CEO, and that was shut down when it lost $6 million. I mentioned uh, Mr. Buckskin. Mr Buckskin's brother was appointed as the general manager. The South Australian government effectively dismantled a joint Commonwealth state remedial package that was trying to do something sensible in the pitlands. Mr Roberts has done nothing since then, and that is why uh, he's now out of the picture on this issue, and Mr Foley has taken over and more strength to his arm. We have a COAG trial there. We will work cooperatively with the state government Order, and with the local people Time to fix the problems. Time for the question has yeah, expired. Yeah, yeah. Senator Santoro. President, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Immigration, Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs, Senator Vanstone. Will the minister inform the Senate of the government's ongoing commitment to delivering economic benefits to Australia through its migration program? Senator Vanstone. Thanks very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Santoro for the. Uh, a question. Uh, Queensland, like all the states in Australia, is benefiting from a growing economy and, of course, would benefit from uh, migration. Uh, I'm pleased to say that the government has been able to announce today that we are increasing both the skill level of migrants coming to Australia and the numbers that are coming, and that we'll be able to focus that increase and those skills on, on regional Australia. We're doing this by increasing the skills uh, pass mark for the general skilled independent visa categories for permanent residents from 115 to 120. Rising demand allows us to attract migrants with a higher level of skill. The pass mark was last increased in 2002. It's rising demand that allows us to do this. And the message there is people around the world want to come to a country that is well run, that has an economy going well, where they can get a job and have a, a, a more prosperous future. We will, of course, be protecting international students currently completing uh, their studies in, in Australia. Skilled migration brings benefits to us all. Our migrants with business skills have also fostered long-term links with international markets, generated jobs and exports, produced goods and services that would otherwise be imported into Australia, introduced new and better technology and enhanced commercial activity and competition. All in all, it's a very positive story. It seems only logical we'd want to encourage this type of migration. That was actually a quote from Peter Beatty, uh, the Premier of uh, Queensland. Equally, the Premier of my state, uh, Mike Rann, yesterday um, announced that South Australia's new population policy uh, was, he thinks is terribly important. He points out population growth holds the key to our state's future prosperity and sustainability, to which end the state is setting some aggressive and ambitious targets to at least double the intake of independent skilled migrants. So I'm pleased to see that the Labor states will, in fact, and I trust the opposition, will welcome the fact that we are in a country Thank now that can afford to increase uh, its immigration intake, that we can have uh, skills migrants with even better skills than before. Uh, this increase of 5,000 will be targeted uh, to where the states want to go. It will operate through uh, skills. Um, uh, visas that will be sponsored by the states, so those states that want more people will be able to have them, and those states that don't choose to sponsor migrants, uh, these migrants uh, won't in fact need to have them. Uh, it's important also to uh, understand that we will have more doctors coming to Australia, another thousand places for doctors and their families in 2004 5. Uh, it's important, I think, to understand that modelling by access economics estimates that the migration program will contribute over $4 billion to the Commonwealth budget over the next four years. This 2004-05 program will deliver the largest skill stream in Australia's history. The largest skill stream in Australia's history. Can I conclude, Mr President, by quoting from Mr Ross Garneau, who wrote the monograph Migration to Australia and Comparison with the United States, who benefits? in May 2003, and he said immigration with a high skill component tends to raise employment and lower unemployment of low-skilled established Australians. That is everything this government is about, bringing here people who will generate jobs and who will help lower-skilled Australians get more jobs. A well-managed economy can do that for you. That's why Labor should never, ever be re-elected. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Patterson as Minister for Family and Community Services. How, 
Order. Senator Hill. How does the how does the minister respond to her colleagues' expressed concerns about her serial incompetence as a minister, including, including her failure to protect families with disabled children from disability payment reviews, her failure to insist on the domestic violence advertising campaign be screened, especially in the face of the escalating number of football harassment and rape allegations? Her failure to curtail family tax breaks for upper income and millionaire families, her failure to secure confidential documents within her department and office, her failure to secure prime ministerial correspondence, her failure to come up with the barbecue stopping work and family package, her failure to fix the family tax bet bungle, and her failure time and time again to explain Order. the government's Order. agenda Order. in this parliament. Time. It's a long Should question. Order. Senator Patterson. Thank you very much, Mr. President. <laughs> Order. How Order. desperate they must be. I've repeated, How? Senator, I've repeatedly said this week that senators on both sides of the chamber to come to order when a minister or a, or a senator is asking a question and answering a question. That hasn't been the case again today, and I'd ask you to remain silent while a minister answers the question. Senator Patterson. Mr President, how desperate they must be. That didn't constitute a question. It constituted sledging. I don't think it deserves an answer. Point of order. Senator. Mr President, could I ask you to review, seriously review that question to see whether it is in fact in, uh, in, in order, under Standing Order 73? It seemed to me that it contained arguments, inferences, imputation, epithets, ironical expressions hypothetical matter, sought an expression of an opinion um, and uh, was basically and Mr and Mr President was basically out of order on about seven out of ten counts understanding order seventy three. Senator Faulkner. I think it is a good idea for you to review it and you might say you see uh, Mr President it contains an awful lot of facts. Well I will look at the question but Senator uh, Senator Collins you do have a supplementary question I believe. Yes, I do. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Whilst we're on the subject of sledging, I remind the minister of her excuse yesterday that one of her staff was overzealous in dealing with a fellow senator. The question: When will the minister accept responsibility for her own failures as a minister, instead of blaming her staff, her predecessor, the prime minister, the media, the opposition with sledging? Her department and just about everybody else except herself. Well, that's, that's another question. I don't believe. I don't believe that question's in order. I mean, it, it's just asking for an opinion, and um, I don't think that would be in order. But I will have a look at that one as well. Your point of order. Senator Collins has asked a question about when the minister, Senator Patterson, will accept responsibility. Order for her own actions, in this case her own failures, of course, and stop blaming others. Surely, Mr President, sure, well, surely, Mr. President such questions— no, I'm, I'm on a point of order. Hold, you, hold your tongue. Take your seat, Senator. Hold your tongue. Take your seat. Oh. Uh, Senator Faulkner. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I would uh, submit to you that uh, presidents have consistently ruled in such questions, consistently, certainly in the 15 years I've been here, and I'm sure before that. And I, so I, I would, I would, maybe, uh, I would ask. So, so when you, when you review it, what I'm asking you, Mr. President, given that you've been asked to review it, you've indicated you will. Fair enough. But when you do it, could I ask you to look at rulings of previous presidents in relation to very similar questions? Minister, do you wish to answer that question that, that I've ruled out of order? I don't actually accept it's no. a question, Mr. Right. Mr. President. I think it would be in the best interest of the Senate if I asked further questions put on notice. Good idea. <laughs> Senator Hill. Uh, Senator Ray asked me a question uh, which I said I'd refer to the Foreign Minister. Uh, his office has advised me that Mr. Downer requested the letter from Mr Irvine and that Mr Irvine was aware that it might become public. With those senators not seeking the call, 
leave the chamber or take their seat. I do have a brief statement to make. Uh, yesterday, um, the Deputy President, Senator Hogg, undertook to refer to me a ruling which he made on a point of order which was raised in relation to parts of a speech made by Senator O'Brien. There were two parts to the point of order that Senator O'Brien was reading his speech and that remarks he made about the Prime Minister were unparliamentary. In regard to the question, I, I have asked senators to re resume their seats or lose the cha leave the chamber. Order. In regard to the question about reading speeches, the Deputy President ruled that the prohibition on reading of speeches was not applied rigidly and that senators were allowed to refer to notes in relation to technical matters. I think that the Deputy President's ruling was correct. It is a long-standing practice in the Senate that senators may refer to notes in the course of their speeches and may refer closely to notes when dealing with detailed matters. In regard to the question about whether unparliamentary language was used, on reading the hand said, I do believe that an invitation about a member of another place may have been made. Such invitations are out of order and all occupants of the chair are vigilant about that. In the circumstances, however, senators from both sides were freely interjecting across the chamber. In such situations, it is often difficult for the chair to hear each interjection, all of which, of course, of course are out of order. It is also clear to me from reading the hand said that remarks were made by other senators which, had they been brought to the attention of the chair, would certainly have been ruled as unparliamentary. I believe that the Deputy President correctly ruled that while remarks made by Senator O'Brien, which were the subject of the point of order, were skating close to the mark, and that Senator O'Brien should be careful in describing and attributing motives to other people in his opinion, he did not regard the language used as unparliamentary. With the benefit of the, of the transcript, I do believe it is unparliamentary for, for a senator to link a member of the other place, or indeed another senator, to something that otherwise would be highly unparliamentary by su suggesting tacit support. This sort of implication is unacceptable. I make two final points. It is unparliamentary to reflect on the chair during any debate or to misrepresent a ruling made by the chair. If a senator wants to dissent in a ruling, that must be done in accordance with Standing Order 198. I also again remind senators that it is highly disorderly to shout remarks across the chamber, and it's particularly disorderly to do so when the chair is endeavouring to consider a point of order. All senators should be framed from that behaviour. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Faulkner. President, I move the Senate take note of answers to questions directed to the Leader of the Government uh, in the Senate, Senator Hill, in question time today. Mr President, Mr Howard is the only Prime Minister of Australia ever to have embroiled our intelligence agencies in domestic political debate. No other Prime Minister has ever done it. No other Prime Minister in memory would even have considered such a course of action would be appropriate. Now, Mr. Mr Deputy President, these private confidential briefings of the Leader of the Opposition by senior intelligent officials are a long-standing convention. In the case of ASIS and ASIO, they are underpinned by legislation. Section 19 of the Intelligence Services Act, for example, requires the Director General of ACES to consult regularly with the Leader of the Opposition for the purpose of keeping him or her informed of matters relating to ACES. By bringing these briefings into the public domain, the Prime Minister, Mr Howard, has compromised their value. Why would officials give full and frank briefings in future, knowing they may well be made public, whenever they might serve the supposed partisan interests of the government? Will leaders of the opposition continue to seek such briefings, knowing that their privacy and their confidentiality may not be respected by government? Is the public interest served by the politicisation and corruption of this very important convention that uh, stood until now the test of time. Obviously, that's not the view of this 
But, 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 but does the Prime Minister, ostensibly in our system, the, the guardian of these conventions, care about these matters? He does not care. What he does is coerce public servants in this country into supporting the government line, and that is now a familiar tactic of Mr Howard and the government. He's extracted a letter from the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He's extracted a letter from the Secretary of the Department of Defence. He's extracted a letter, He's extracted a le uh, a letter from the, uh, from the uh, Director General of ASIS. He's got another one from the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Defence. Poor Mr Benighton, he's probably on the rack right now as we speak. On the rack again. He's got him to sign up to no doubt he'll get him to sign up to an even more fulsome description of his briefing with Mr. Latham. The last one didn't quite do the trick, because the Prime Minister today has run away, tail between his, his, his legs, licking his wounds, because he's been bested by Mr. Latham in the Parliament on this issue, because the Prime Minister is wrong. Now this remember, Mr. Mr Deputy President, this is the same Prime Minister who used classified intelligence to try and back up his claim that kids had been thrown overboard. He's the same Prime Minister who used the Office of National Assessments to dig himself out of a hole on WMD. We all know about that. Same Prime Minister who demanded retractions from Vice Admiral Shackleton. Same Prime Minister who stood over Police Commissioner Kelty, and uh, when, of course, all these people, all these people, departed from the government line, even though they told the truth to the Australian people, even though they told this truth, and this is the modus operandi of uh, of the government: the use of public servants and the use of classified information for partisan political purposes. How low can you go? How low can you go? That is the hallmark, Mr Deputy President, of the Howard government. And there's only one way to, to stop this. That is to remove John Howard from the prime ministership. He is a person who won't change his spots. This is a pattern of behaviour, a pattern of behaviour that is utterly despicable utterly contemptible. He has indulged in this destructive behaviour far too often. And until John Howard's removed from office, he'll continue to abuse these long-standing conventions. Your time what has this expired, says is, of course, Senator Faulkner. Your time. Senator, Senator Ferguson. Uh, yeah. uh, Senator Ray. I interrupt my leader when he was so destroying the government, but Senator Brandis deliberately and maliciously on two occasions was unparliamentary. Given the homily read out by the president, I do think he should withdraw. He knows he should, and he should do it now. Senator Brandis. Uh, Senator Ferguson. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. Well, one would think that it's the last uh, taking note of answers. When you finish, Senator, Senator Faulkner, you've Senator, already had one go. Senator Ferguson. <laughs> when you've had a go. <laughs> Senator, Can I Senator, say, Senator Ferguson? Mr. Uh, Senator Faulkner, Senator Ferguson has the call. Mr. Mr. Deputy President, one could be forgiven for thinking that this is the last taking note of answers on the very last day of a uh, sitting, sitting session because, uh, can I say, Senator, Senator Faulkner said, how low can you go? Well, I'd have to say about as low as Senator Faulkner got in taking note of the answers today. About that low, because Senator, all Senator Faulkner uh, could come up with was a whole range of criticism of the Prime Minister based on some very, very loose facts. Some very, very loose facts. And what we need to remember, of course, is that Mr Latham has put himself in this position. He's put himself there because of his use of Mr Benighton uh, to justify some of the statements that he's made in relation to withdrawing troops from Iraq. He used Mr Benighton. He used a private briefing to justify every statement that he's made in his policy bungle 
and he realises it's a policy bungle to bring our troops home immediately from Iraq. And we heard from the leader of the opposition, uh, the leader of the government in the Senate today, saying how important the work is that those people are doing in Iraq, in the reconstruction uh, of Iraq, and in making sure that the people of Iraq have a better life in the future. We hear Senator Faulkner talk, talk about coercion of public servants. What rubbish! What rubbish! People who have provided information to the government of their own free will, uh, letters that are freely given, not extracted. But it sounds good for Senator Faulkner. It sounds good for Senator Faulkner to stand up and say that these people were coerced into doing these sorts of things. He says, "Mr. Benighton's on the rack." He says, "Mr. Benighton's on the rack." Well, if Mr. Benighton's on the rack, it's because of Mr. Latham, not because of anything that this government's done. It's because of Mr Latham and Mr Latham's use of a private briefing that is normally given to leaders of the opposition when they assume that role, when it's normally given to them when they assume that role, a briefing on and an overview of what the role of that department is. And so Mr Latham says he had, a, he had an express briefing, and from the information gained from that meeting from Mr Benighton, he said that he determined that our policy in Iraq was chaos. What rubbish! What rubbish! It was never said at that briefing, and Mr. Benighton has already said, Mr. Benighton has said that there was, um, that he has already said that, that that is not the substance of what was said during that briefing. There is nothing sensitive. There is nothing sensitive about the identities or the positions held by Mr. Irvine or Mr. Benighton, uh, and the information that was provided to the House in no way compromises the identities of members of our intelligence agencies. Another issue raised by Mr Latham today, and one which nobody in this place believes, and Mr Latham is spending all of yesterday, all of today, trying to get out of a policy position that he espoused, I guess without any consultation with his colleagues, because uh, he hasn't consulted the caucus with any other of his major decisions in relation to defence and relation to uh, withdrawal from Iraq. Well, plenty of your guys say so, Senator Ludwig, plenty of your guys say so, so we know that it must be true. Um, but the, lead, the leader of the opposition's claims and the claims made here by Senator Faulkner today, when Senator Faulkner stoops to the same old record, you know, back we go to the history of this government because he can't find any other way to justify what Mr uh, Latham has said. But Mr Latham's um, uh, uh, claims are completely unfounded and they only serve to confirm his ignorance about the operation of our intelligence agencies uh, and the associated conventions that have been developed in this parliament and have been conventions that have been uh, recognised by governments uh, for a long time now. The Prime Minister provided the information to the House yesterday uh, and the day before to clarify the contents of briefings, because Mr Latham used those briefings, his so-called briefings, lengthy briefings, he said, which we know now weren't lengthy briefings. He used those because Mr Latham used those to justify the policy position that he took in relation to our troops in Iraq. The troops in Iraq don't agree with his position. Scarcely any public commentator in Australia agrees with the policy decision taken by Mr Latham. Scarcely any policy, uh, any policy commentator, and certainly the people of Australia don't agree with Mr Latham. The people, the, the people of Australia, the people of Australia don't agree with Mr Latham. At least 61 of them percent of them have said, we want our troops to stay in Iraq because we want them to finish the job. And so Mr Latham's, Mr. Latham's policy on the run, this ridiculous policy Sen of withdrawing Senator our troops, Ferguson, is one that should be refuted. Your time has expired. Senator Ray. Well, uh, let me first answer the question posed by Senator Ferguson on the 61 per cent. I any analysts know that was a ridiculous question to ask, because the proposition that was put do you believe you should stay till the job is done or pull out immediately, which isn't a really a question posed by anyone in politics in Australia other than maybe the Greens? So it was an absolute sham of a poll. The second point I'd uh, like to make, Senator Hill said at question time today he was quite generous with briefings. Well, I have no reason really to disagree with that, that he has been generous. He might set an example, in fact, for some of his other colleagues who are not so generous in terms of briefings, that won't allow uh, newspaper clipping services to be delivered to shadow ministers like I and many others ensured occurred when we were in government. But I'll accept his basic point. 
that he is generous. But I do remember my colleagues saying in the first quarter of 2003 that the briefings they got on Iraq were shallow and next to useless. They didn't tell me what was in the briefings, quite properly. But they did say they learned a lot more out of newspapers and television than they did from those briefings. And sometimes, sometimes you get immune from those sort of briefings if you think they're not enough value. And that was a problem. I ensured in 1991 that there was a daily brief of the opposition defence and foreign affairs spokesman on, the, on events in that first Iraqi conflict. I ensured that that happened and I ensured that they were top quality people that gave the opposition a full briefing on that. Of course, on some occasions, oppositions don't want to be briefed. They don't want to be locked into a confidential discussion. And that's fair enough because that restricts their public comment and therefore can be avoided. I did make the point today that not always is it available to members of parliament to go and get briefed. I used one example. Senator Hill or his office vetoed a colleague of mine going to Amberley. I find that passing strange. I don't find it typical of Senator Hill's behaviour. But he's complained to me and I've no reason to disagree. I never once as defence minister over six years stopped a opposition member going on a base. On two occasions I got an urgent phone call from the gatehouse saying opposition spokesmen had turned up with candidates in tow. Can they have permission to go on base? And I automatically ticked it. That generosity apparently is not always reciprocated. But the real problem we're facing here is in order to get political advantage we are seeing a tendency to politicise the public service, all of which may be an irreversible trend. But it shouldn't happen with intelligence agencies. Those we do exempt. We exempt them from a degree of scrutiny. We extend them a much greater degree of trust in their behaviour than we do any other government department. And in return, we expect them to behave in an independent uh, manner. The reason I ask the question today in terms of who asked the Director General of ASIS to provide the letter, because I wanted to know whether he did it of his own volition or whether he was asked by a minister. Now, the answer given today was, well, it was Minister Downer, fair enough, but also that Mr Irvine was made aware that his letter may be made public. I doubt that. I frankly doubt that. And was he given a choice in those circumstances not to provide the letter if he knew it was going to become a matter of partisan political dispute? Therein, I think, lies part of the difficulty here. We want to trust the people put in charge of the intelligence agencies in Australia. We don't want them involved in partisan politics. I think that's true of most people on most sides of politics. It is not true of our current Prime Minister, who would do anything anything to get political advantage. This confusion between his own persona, his own political self-interest and the national in interest is indivisible in his own mind. But what is happening in this is that the whole process of politics is being debased by him and by his actions, by them ringing up the police commissioner and slapping him around, by standing over public servants to produce letters for their own partisan uh, requirements. None of this is healthy for the body politic, Mr. A Mr Deputy President. Most of it denigrates some of the great jobs done by our intelligence agencies over the last two decades. I find it very, very sad that it's slipped into this thing. We will now need to have note-takers and minute-takers at every briefing in future so we won't have our views distorted by government. We're going to have Senator to either Ray, tape record them time has or expired. take them. Senator Brandis. Deputy President, uh, let us ask ourselves this question. Who is politicising the role of the intelligence agencies and the chiefs of the intelligence agencies? The person who gave a briefing? No. The person who accurately and faithfully corrected the public record, the Prime Minister? Or, or the person who misrepresented to the parliament and to the public what the content of that briefing was. I think, Mr Deputy President, that most sensible people would think that the actor in that sequence 
who drag the intelligence chiefs into po political controversy was the person who misrepresented what had been said in a, con in a confidential briefing, not the person, either the intelligence chiefs or the Prime Minister, who put the public record straight. Let me take you through it, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy President. The Leader of the Opposition, Mr Latham, made a claim that the Deputy Secretary, Intelligence and Security in the Department of Fe Defence, Mr Benighton, a respected, senior, non-partisan public servant, had in the course of a briefing attacked the government's policy on Iraq. And that claim by Mr Latham—I can't say it was a lie because that would be unparliamentary—but it was at variance with the truth. Mr Benighton prepared a memorandum shortly after that briefing was given last year, not in the heat of this political controversy in, of, the, of the past few days, Mr Deputy President, but last year, shortly after the briefing was given in January, was it, Senator Hill? Thank you. In January of this year, well before the heat of this political controversy, and that memorandum, that that, that memorandum of the briefing, the content of which, because of its security classification, cannot be put into the public domain, but the substance of which the Prime Minister summarised in the House of Representatives yesterday and offered to show on a confidential basis to the Leader of the Opposition, consistent with document handling procedures for documents of that security classification, confirms that no, there was no discussion of any operational matters in relation to the Australian military forces in Iraq given during that briefing. That is what Mr Benighton said, not this week when it had become controversial, but two months ago, before there was any suggestion of controversy about this, before the fact of the briefing was even public knowledge. That is the evidence, the best evidence, of what Mr Benighton said and, more importantly, what he didn't say. That has now been confirmed by Mr Benighton, whose integrity in this matter is beyond question, beyond a shadow of a doubt, by a letter which has been put into the public domain by the Prime Minister yesterday and corroborated by, the, um, by Mr Irvin, the Director General of ACES. So, Mr Deputy President, if you ask yourself who is more likely to be telling the truth, Mr Latham or Mr Benighton, if you ask yourself the question what is more likely to be the reliable record of that meeting that happened in January, a near contemporaneous memorandum prepared in the absence of any political heat, or the wild claims of the Leader of the Opposition lately made in order to get himself off the hook, what do you think, Mr Deputy President, would be the more reliable evidence of what was said by Mr Benighton to Mr Latham and, more importantly, Mr Deputy President, of what was not said by Mr Benighton to Mr Latham? I believe we can trust Mr Benighton. He has no motive. He has, uh, his reputation for integrity is unimpeachable. He prepared the note at a time in which there was no political heat generated by this meeting whatsoever, and the note speaks for itself. I would trust Mr Benighton, Mr Deputy President, and I think most Australians would prefer his version of events to that of the Leader of the Opposition to get himself out of a political hole. Senator Evans. Acting De Sorry, Mr Deputy President. Uh, it was a good lawyer's argument uh, produced by the previous senator, but like the, most of the government's argument, it was very selective in its use of the evidence. Uh, we had another example again today when uh, Senator Ferguson verbaled, verbaled Mr Latham by not correctly quoting from the transcript, not quoting the whole quote from the transcript of his interview on AM this morning. And that was used as a device by the minister, Senator Hill, in order to uh, make, launch a sort of preemptive strike. And he's very into preemptive uh, strike policies, but a preemptive strike on the debate that he knew he'd have to face today. Because, Mr. Deputy President, we finished this week, this fortnight of the parliamentary sittings, just as we began. 
embroiled in a debate about the government's abuse of the traditions of the public service, about its politicisation of the Australian public service. As uh, Mr Latham said yesterday, Mr Howard will use anything he can to try to hang on to power. Last week, it was uh, Commissioner K uh, Kelty, the head of the uh, Australian Federal Police. He was pressured and, uh, and uh, used as part of uh, a defence of a Prime Minister's uh, position in order to uh, uh, retract his honestly held opinions about the influence of, of uh, government policy on the risk to uh, Australians of terrorist attack. We went through that terrible uh, episode where Mr Keelty was uh, publicly humiliated and used by the government as part of its defence uh, because he had a view contrary to theirs and he was pressured uh, in a very, uh, very unfortunate way. Today, we've seen, uh, the last couple of days, we've seen the government again attempting to abuse public service processes, use uh, to hide behind public servants in order to launch an attack on Mr Latham. Now, I know they're scared of Mr Latham. I know they're terribly uh, off balance as a result of the way Mr Latham is going down in the, in the Australian public. They're concerned by the polling figures. I understand all that. And this week's exercise was about trying to grubby Mr Latham, trying to, trying to sort of mess him up a bit, trying to dirty him up a bit. And we've had false accusation after false accusation. First of all, the Prime Minister said, oh, and Mr Downer claimed, there had been no briefings. Well, when it became clear they had, they had Mr Howard went in, oh, well, he'd had briefings, but they weren't really by Foreign Affairs and Defence. Mr Latham makes it clear, well, they were actually by Office of Foreign, Offices of Foreign Affairs and Defence, puts that on the record. Oh, well, then the, then the government's claim is, but they weren't really briefings about Iraq. Well, yes, uh, then Mr, uh, Mr Latham makes it clear that R Iraq was discussed. Oh, well, then it's uh, that the, the debate, the, the meeting, the, uh, the briefings weren't enough about Iraq or enough on the, on the issues that the government thinks Mr Latham should have uh, had uh, information from the departments on before he uh, continued uh, and, inf and, and announced the, uh, the uh, Australian Labor Party's policy on the withdrawal of troops from Iraq. What absolute nonsense! Mr Latham had two briefings. In addition to that, he had a range of advice provided to him about how best to implement long-standing Labor policy. He had advi advice from Mr Kevin Rudd, the Foreign Affairs spokesman, who uh, had visited Baghdad and had first-hand experience of the situation on the ground, the role of the troops in the Australian contingent and, uh, and the functions they're providing. And he had advice from myself, which went to the, the briefings I'd had uh, earlier in the year from Defence and the stuff that's on the public record in terms of the debate with General Cosgrove and others about the deployment of troops, the dates for their planned withdrawal, what their functions are, uh, their health issues, all of those things which have been, which have been examined and discussed at length at estimates in another, in other, uh, uh, and in earlier briefings during the, during the war period. Now, he had, the, he had all that information. What we've seen, as I say, is a desperate attempt to try and, try and dirty up Mr Latham as, as the Prime Minister gets more and more desperate. And what they've done, of course, is then drag public servants into this, insist that public servants provide letters. The first day in defence, the minister got a letter from the secretary. That wasn't good enough because it didn't really establish his case. So then they had to go back and get Mr Benighton to sign a personal letter that obviously had to address a whole range of issues that he was requested to address. Now, Mr Benighton's a good officer. I make no criticism of him. But what, we, what we've seen is the constant uh, politicisation of the public service and defence has suffered very badly. Who can not forget the, the incident involving Paul Barrett, the former secretary, the misuse of intelligence over Timor and the DIO, the children overboard affair, Andrew Wilkie, and the, and the, and the concern by a lot of former defence chiefs and senior officers about the government's misuse of intelligence in, in, the, in its public statements leading up to its involvement in Iraq. We have seen defence constantly uh, misused, constantly politicised as part of this government's desperate and attempt Senator to hang Evans, on to power. Your time it's not has good enough. Expired. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Faulkner be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Yeah. Mr Deputy President, uh, during question time on the 31st of March 2004, Senator Harrodin asked me a question in my capacity as the Minister representing the Attorney General concerning sexual harassment in the workplace and advertising. I undertook to provide further information in relation to certain advertisements and seek leave to incorporate an answer, a, a, an answer in Hansard. Uh, which has been provided to me. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Um, moving on, any urgency motion or 
ministerial statements. Any ministerial statements? Presentation of other documents. I present a response to the recommendations which relate to the responsibilities of the presiding officers of the report of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee on Australia's relations with Papua New Guinea. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask that the response be incorporated in Hansard. I'm just a little bit confused as to who's standing there. Senator Ferris next. Senator uh, Ferris. Thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report that's just been tabled. That, sorry. Is, sorry, I missed what you're moving the motion. Seeking leave. I'm seeking leave to move a motion in relation to the document that's just been tabled. All oh, right. Is leave granted? There being no objection. Leave is granted. Senator Ferris. Um, what I'm seeking leave to do is to continue my remarks to enable people to speak on the report when they've had the opportunity to look at it. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Ferris. Senator Ellison. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I seek leave to make a short statement in response to a Senate order to produce documents. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Ellison. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, this statement is on behalf of the Hon. Peter McGoran, the Minister for Science. This order arises from a motion moved by Senator John Cherry, as agreed by the Senate, on 30 March 2004, and it relates to genetic genetically modified organisms produced as part of the 2002-2003 Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation cross-divisional program entitled Ecological Implications of GMOs genetically modified organisms. CSIRO has advised the Minister for Science that it has interpreted the criteria set out in the order to refer to the published documents and that it can produce 21 documents that meet these criteria. The Department of Environment and Heritage has advised the Minister for Environment, the Hon. David Dr Kemp, that five documents held by the Department meet the criteria set out in the motion. I table the documents. Are there any, any reports of committees? No. Are there any documents to be presented by the clerk? Documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to senators. Any committee memberships? No. Nothing else? Clerk. Government Business Order of the Day, Telecommunications Interception Amendment Bill 2004, second reading, adjourned debate. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Um, Senator Allison. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, uh, this is an important bill which will uh, enhance the powers of the Australian Federal Police, of course, in the carrying out of its duties. And uh, There are counter-terrorism provisions in here which are vitally important to the, the interests, uh, national interests of this country. Uh, in relation to the uh, Senate uh, committee report. Uh, I thank uh, senators for the work they did on that, the Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee, uh, and uh, the government is minded to accept the recommendations of that uh, of that committee, which has recommended that uh, sections uh, six, uh, subsection one, five, six, and seven, as I recall, uh, should be deferred, and uh, the government has uh, indicated that it will be moving amendments in the committee stage to. Uh, to reflect that recommendation. Uh, what we have is a situation where uh, uh, the Australian Federal Police has raised some issues. We're keen to, to work through those and bring back amendments which deal with those. But in the meantime, we should not hold up this bill. It is important, and uh, I, I thank senators for their contribution. I can say, uh, Mr Deputy President, that um, in relation to this question uh, of uh, intercepts of emails and the like. We are entering into a new age in Australia in relation to law enforcement and technology. And I think that this, uh, this deferral will allow us to examine some of these issues uh, in a, a more detailed and appropriate fashion. I commend uh, this, this bill to the Senate. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. For an act to amend the Telecommunications Interception Act 1979 and for other purposes. Government amendments and one demo amendment. 
Is it the uh, wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Minister. Oh, sorry. Uh, we're, in, we're in committee, aren't we? We're in committee. Yes, Senator Ludwig. I'm not moving in a minute, but I, I, can, I can say something. Yes, in you're, committee. you're, you're most I'm sure welcome. I can. Well, yes, we always enjoy your <laughs> contributions. It was only a brief. I, in, in, in one of these instances, being a member of the Legal and Constitutional uh, Ledge Committee, I do thank uh, the uh, minister for taking on board those recommendations made by the committee, and uh, I appreciate the effort that the uh, department has uh, put into this particular bill and uh, the necessity in this instance. Uh, hopefully, the department will be able to uh, come back within a reasonably short uh, time with uh, amendments which clarify the position that's been provided uh, in the bill. And uh, I once again uh, uh, appreciate that. Uh, it is a difficult issue in, in terms of being uh, progressed. Uh, we understand that it has gone on since uh, 2002, and of course the next attempt or the last attempt, which uh, is before us, has now been split. But I'm sure uh, the government will be able to come back within a short while and clarify the amendments, and we can uh, proceed uh, again to have a, another close examination of the, uh, the telecommunications issue. And I'm sure. Uh, in fact, I've got no doubt that it will go back to the Senate Legal and Constitutional uh, Ledge Committee for that to examine again. So I do appreciate the minister's uh, uh, cooperation in, in uh, this process. Um, I just draw to the attention of the committee the fact that I've just been supplied with a running sheet. So uh, I don't know this. It's it's just. Just being circulated this very moment, uh, Senator McCoy. Yes, one one will go your way. Um, according to my running sheet, uh, according to my running sheet, uh, the first amendment for consideration is Government Amendment One on Sheet uh, QS two five five. That's to oppose an item. And that's to an oppose oppose items five to nine, and then there's Government two and three on sheets QS. Two five five by leave together, Minister. Uh, I move Government Amendment One. Uh, this, in effect, uh, uh, recognises or or puts into effect uh, the recommendation made by the Senate uh, Legal and Constitutional Committee. In fact, all these government amendments do that. Uh, it is rather strange, though. In moving this amendment, I'll then vote against it uh, because um, what we're doing is. Um, as I understand it, uh, the, the motion is that items five to nine stand as printed. We will oppose that uh, in a, so that it will give effect to what the Senate committee has recommended. Um, so that's what we'll be doing in relation to this amendment. And uh, the other, the remaining amendments, uh, all go to the uh, the same recommendation. Uh, basically, uh, the situation is that. Um, in relation to the question of uh, viewing and reading in relation to um, emails and the like, uh, the Australian Federal Police raised some issues uh, in relation to uh, the, as to what they would be able and not able to do. Um, there have been discussions between the Department and the Australian Federal Police. Uh, advice has been uh, obtained and I think was put to the Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee. But there's some operational aspects. It's not a question of them disagreeing with each other. It's a question of improving uh, the situation so that operational matters can be accommodated. Uh, and I think that the, uh, the Senate uh, Committee's recommendation is an appropriate one. I will expand on my previous comments. Uh, and in subsequent government amendments, I, I'll keep my comments very brief and, and make my overall a submission at this stage. Uh, we are entering a, uh, a, a sta an era where, or an age, where we have information technology being used uh, frequently and by more and more people. Uh, the question arises uh, when you send an email, is that email uh, a letter to be treated as a letter or a, or a telephone call? Well, of course, an electronic uh, transfer uh, and uh, it comes under the telecommunications power of the Commonwealth, one would think, well, obviously it's a, a telecommunications matter. But your telephone intercepts 
have operated on the, uh, the basis of a telephone call. We're now entering the stage where emails can be stored, uh, where they can be rejected by filters. Uh, the question of whether you should be able to access those, those emails, how do you do it? Can you access emails in your own system? I mean, that is one of corporate governance which was raised during the course of the hearing. And uh, of course, uh, there is a, a plausible argument made out by uh, the private sector and organisations such as the Australian Federal Police that they need to keep certain standards, and in doing that, they need to be able to review emails that are being received by members of their organisation, and to do so without having to uh, uh, obtain a warrant. There's also the situation that in the general circumstances of a search warrant, uh, you may have a situation where uh, the police have access to a computer, uh, the warrant allows it. In the course of examining the computer, operating it, uh, they come across uh, an email which could be of probative value in relation to the prosecution. Uh, at present, they would be unable to access that email without having another warrant obtained, an intercept warrant, tele on the basis of a telephone intercept. Now, I think there are some issues there which we need to uh, address. We'll be doing that over the, uh, the break, and we hope to return uh, to Parliament at the budget sittings with amendments uh, which will deal with these and other issues. And I think it's sensible that we do not uh, defer or hold up this bill, a very important bill, uh, by virtue of, uh, uh, of including these provisions uh, which would do that. So uh, that's what we're seeking to, to do today, Mr. Ag Mr. Chairman. Uh, and uh, I uh, thank the opposition for its cooperation on this matter. The question, Senator Ludwig. I only want to add, uh, I think I really preceded the debate with uh, my comments. I wasn't sure if the minister was going to uh, go to some of the detail, but I thank the minister for going to the detail of uh, this particular issue and in joining the opposition in the unusual step, at least for the government, in voting against their own, uh, own amendments. But it is one of those areas which uh, does require a certainty. And uh, with, with the uh, coming uh, session uh, coming to a close, and allowing us a month or so to, uh, to be able to provide uh, the government to uh, utilise that time to provide certainty. Uh, I'm sure that by the, uh, the May sitting there, they will have had sufficient time to uh, provide certainty and to ensure that the AFP do have the uh, tools available to uh, undertake all their range of tasks that they, uh, they do do. And uh, we appreciate the, uh, the cooperation and the minister taking on board the comments made in the uh, the Legal and Con uh, Ledge Committee uh, report, and I think it's one of those times. I think it's worthwhile saying that where the Ledge Committee, uh, they have been uh, criticised by, uh, I think, both sides sometimes. But I think in this instance, they have demonstrated the worth of a Ledge Committee to look at legislation, to have a hearing, to be able to call witnesses and examine uh, clauses. And, uh, and I'm sure Senator Greg recalls uh, the. Uh, Monday night when we had the witnesses from the AFP and the AG before us. I think it did provide a, a, a worthwhile uh, a forum for the, uh, to examine the bill in a little bit more detail and provide a, uh, a clear picture as to uh, what was intended by the legislation. And of course, what was intended by the legislation, I, I don't know whether, and uh, we're waiting really for the government to be able to clarify that over time. But whether the words that were expressed in the amendment actually reflected the government's intention. And uh, clearly on the, uh, the uh, position, of course, now is that there will be uh, sufficient time for that to happen in relation to that. As to the other uh, parts of the bill, I think it, is, uh, it, it was a, a uh, particularly uh, good approach that the government has taken in splitting those amendments out to allow the other uh, areas to proceed because they are, uh, as I'm told, required by the AFP in this environment, and they are amendments that the, uh, to the uh, telecommunications inter interception legislation that the opposition accepts. Senator Gregg. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I think I'll make some, um, some, some generic comments, really, in terms of how we Democrats are approaching the, uh, the, the, the broad range of government amendments we have before us today. We do remain concerned of, in terms of the current situation regarding access to email, SMS and voicemail by our intelligence and law enforcement agencies. And we're particularly concerned by the government's previous indications that it believes that under the current regime it does 
have the power to access stored communications without a warrant. The most contentious provisions in the bill have been described by the government as clarification clauses. In other words, they clarify the government's current interpretation of the legislation. We Democrats are deeply concerned that this status quo, a status quo in which the government can access and, and probably is accessing SMS, email and voicemail communications between individual Australians, has applied since this issue was first raised and in the context of the government's original package of anti-terror legislation from 2002. At that time there was considerable community concern and outrage at the government's proposal to permit law enforcement and intelligence agencies to access electronic communications without a warrant. The government put those provisions aside and only very recently reintroduced them, and that was despite the fact that the government had 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 the opportunity to clarify the issue last year when it introduced a number of other amendments to the Telecommunications Interception Bill. Yet, once again, the government is putting these provisions aside, and on this occasion it's because of issues that have been raised by the AFP regarding their current practices, and that remains unresolved. So the Democrats agree with the government that the provisions do need to be clarified. However, we're arguing for an entirely different clarification, one in which intelligence and law enforcement agencies are not entitled to access private communications between individual Australians without a warrant. So we would call on the government to resolve those issues as soon as practical with the AFP and so that the parliament can finally achieve some, some certainty, some real certainty on the use of these invasive powers. Question, the question is that items five to nine stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no, the noes have it. Those have it. Minister? Uh, I'd seek leave to move government amendments two and three together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister? Uh, Mr Chairman, these, uh, act, uh, these relate to the reading or viewing that uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, it is an amendment which uh, adds that to the recording. Uh, again, it gives effect to the Senate committee's recommendation. And uh, I commend the amendment to the Senate. The question is that the amendments moved by the minister be agreed to. They, do you want to speak, Senator Gregg? Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Gregg. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair, I would uh, withdraw Democrat Amendment 1 and uh, Democrat Amendment 2 and uh, now move Democrat Amendment 3, if I may. Uh, Let's, before we do that, we st let's stick to the running sheet. Uh, let's take uh, Government Amendment 4 on sheet QS255. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I move Government Amendment 5, uh, sorry, 4. Uh, this deals with stored communications, which I mentioned earlier in relation to the example being a stored email. Again, it gives effect to the Senate Committee's recommendation. Right. The question, the question is that the amendment moved to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister. Uh, Mr Chairman, uh, I move Government Amendment 5. Uh, this is, again, one of those unusual circumstances where I move the amendment, but the government will oppose it in order to give effect to the Senate Committee's recommendation, and uh, I so move it. The the question is that item 11 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. Now, Senator Gregg. Thank you, Chair. I move Democrat Amendment 3. Uh, under the uh, current telecommunications interception regime, ASIO exercises its interception powers in a virtual accountability vacuum, and that concerns us. ASIO's entire accountability in this context is limited to scrutiny by the Attorney-General. The disturbing situation that this creates is one in which the power to authorise the extensive bugging of private conversations between individual Australians rests with the same minister who presided over the Truth over Overboard scandal. We Democrats believe that there is a desperate need for greater accountability in relation to the exercise of telecommunications interception powers by ASIO. At present, the Australian community has no idea of the extent to which ASIO is exercising these powers. Given the massive violation of privacy associated with the powers, we believe very strongly that some degree of accountability is vital to safeguard against their abuse. 
In advocating this, I am not naively suggesting that ASIO should be treated in the same way as any other government department. Clearly, as an intelligence agency, uh, ASIO cannot achieve the same level of public uh, uh, scrutiny or accountability or transparency as we would hope or expect from other government departments. But that's not to say that they should be free from accountability in relation to its inception powers. So we Democrats firmly believe that ASIO should be required to provide the parliament basic information about its use of interception powers, for example, the number of warrants issued uh, to it by the Attorney-General. And we don't believe that this would impinge in any way on ASIO's ability to promote or protect Australia's national security. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Greg be agreed to. Minute, uh, Senator Ludwig. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. The opposition will, <laughs> well, well, I was caught uh, unaware. The opposition will not be supporting this uh, this particular amendment. There is uh, significant amendments to the. Uh, it is, in fact, a significant amendment to the telecommunications interception legislation. I think Senator Grigg uh, knows that. It changes the, uh, the reporting regime uh, required by ASIO to use its telecommunications interception intercepts uh, warrants significantly. I think it's fair to say we all agree that ASIO should be accountable to the parliament and, in fact, we do recognise the spirit upon which it's been um, put forward. But I think in these instances you do have to be careful about uh, the type of uh, requirement that you may impose on ASIO, particularly where it might have the uh, potential to in fact reveal uh, information about ASIO's operations which could, which could prejudice those operations themselves. And when you look at that, without more, I think the opposition isn't in a position to support the particular amendment. But of course, on the other hand, we do we, we have noticed the Prime Minister's um, behaviour in recent days about making uh, public confidential intelligent briefings and information about operations and the like, uh, particularly about our intelligence agencies in Iraq, uh, which could only be described as, uh, as base politics to score cheap political points against the opposition uh, leader. But Putting that aside, uh, we hope this uh, parliament will exercise uh, greater caution than the Howard government has on this issue. Uh, but it's not enough in that instance to persuade us. We will take the principle in, uh, as being more important in this instance, and we, uh, we think that you have to be very careful about the potential that I outlined uh, earlier, and that is why. On this instance, we will not vote, it, vote uh, for the amendment. Minister. Uh, Mr Chairman, uh, the government opposes this amendment uh, and uh, for the reasons outlined by uh, Senator Ludwig uh, and also on the basis that um, uh, Mr Tom Sherman conducted an independent review of parts of the telecommunications interception regime in June last year. Uh, he recommended that ASIO publish in the public version of its annual report the total number of warrants applied for, refused and issued in the relevant reporting year. The government uh, has not yet made any decisions in relation to whether and in what form Mr Sherman's recommendations are to be implemented, and we believe that uh, to do so on the run would be inappropriate. Uh, I understand the concerns that uh, Senator Gregg has. We do think that these are sweeping uh, amendments and would result in that uh, to the Act. But we believe that a considered approach is the way to go, to consider Mr Sherman's report. And uh, we also note that the Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee uh, did not recommend that ASIO be required to report publicly in relation to the number of telecommunications interception warrants it obtains. Uh, we think perhaps this is better left for a, a considered approach uh, for another day. Uh, and uh, the government will be voting uh, against this uh, amendment. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Gregg be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the noes 
Sorry, the noes have it. Yes, yes, it's Democrat Amendment Three, if I may. Uh, let's before we do that, we st let's stick to the running sheet. Uh, let's take uh, Government Amendment Four on sheet QS two five five, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move Government Amendment Five. Uh, sorry, Four. Uh, this deals with stored communications, which I mentioned earlier in relation to the example being a stored email. Again, it gives effect to the Senate Committee's recommendation. Right. The, question, the question is that the amendment moved uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Minister. Uh, Mr Chairman, uh, I move Government Amendment 5. Uh, this is, again, one of those unusual circumstances where I move the amendment, but the government will oppose it in order to give effect to the Senate Committee's recommendation. And uh, uh, I so move it. The, the question is that item 11 stand is printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. Now, Senator Gregg. Thank you, Chair. I move Democrat Amendment 3. Uh, under the uh, current telecommunications interception regime, ASIO exercises its interception powers in a virtual accountability vacuum, and that concerns us. ASIO's entire accountability in this context is limited to scrutiny by the Attorney-General. The disturbing situation that this creates is one in which the power to authorise the extensive bugging of private conversations between individual Australians rests with the same minister who presided over the truth overboard scandal. We Democrats believe that there is a desperate need for greater accountability in relation to the exercise of telecommunications interception powers by ASIO. At present, the Australian community has no idea of the extent to which ASIO is exercising these powers. Given the massive violation of privacy associated with the powers, we believe very strongly that some degree of accountability is vital to safeguard against their abuse. In advocating this, I am not naively suggesting that ASIO should be treated in the same way as any other government department. Clearly, as an intelligence agency, uh, ASIO cannot achieve the same level of public uh, uh, scrutiny or accountability or transparency as we would hope or expect from other government departments. But that's not to say that they should be free from accountability in relation to its inception powers. So we Democrats firmly believe that ASIO should be required to provide the parliament basic information about its use of interception powers, for example, the number of warrants issued uh, to it by the Attorney-General. And we don't believe that this would impinge in any way on ASIO's ability to promote or protect Australia's national security. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Gregg be agreed to. Min uh, Senator Ludwig. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. The opposition will... <laughs> well, well, I was caught uh, unaware. The opposition will not be supporting this, uh, this particular amendment. There is a significant amendment to the... Uh, it is, in fact, a significant amendment to the telecommunications interception legislation. I think Senator Gregg uh, knows that. It changes the, uh, the reporting regime uh, required by ASIO to use its telecommunications interception intercepts uh, warrants significantly. I think it's fair to say we all agree that ASIO should be accountable to the parliament and, in fact, we do recognise the spirit upon which it's been um, put forward. But I think in these instances you do have to be careful about uh, the type of uh, requirement that you may impose on ASIO, particularly where it might have the uh, potential to, in fact, reveal uh, information about ASIO's operations, which could, which could prejudice those operations themselves. And when you look at that, without more, I think the opposition isn't in a position to support the particular amendment. But of course, on the other hand, we do. We, we have noticed the Prime Minister's um, behaviour in recent days about making uh, public confidential intelligent briefings and information about operations and the like, uh, particularly about our intelligence agencies in Iraq, uh, which could only be described as, uh, as base politics to score cheap political points 
against the opposition uh, leader. But putting that aside, uh, we hope this uh, parliament will exercise uh, greater caution than the Howard government has on this issue. Uh, but it's not enough in that instance to persuade us. We will take the principle in, uh, as being more important in this instance. And we, uh, we think that you have to be very careful about the potential that I outlined uh, earlier. And that is why, uh, on this instance, we will not vote, vote uh, for the amendment. Minister. Uh, Mr Chairman, uh, the government opposes this amendment uh, and uh, for the reasons outlined by uh, Senator Ludwig uh, and also on the basis that um, uh, Mr Tom Sherman conducted an independent review of parts of the telecommunications interception regime in June last year. Uh, he recommended that ASIO publish in the public version of its annual report the total number of warrants applied for, refused and issued in the relevant reporting year. The government uh, has not yet made any decisions in relation to whether and in what form Mr Sherman's recommendations are to be implemented, and we believe that uh, to do so on the run would be inappropriate. Uh, I understand the concerns that uh, Senator Gregg has. We do think that these are sweeping uh, uh, amendments and would result in that uh, to the Act, but we believe that a considered approach is the way to go to consider Mr Sherman's report. And uh, we also note that the Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee uh, did not recommend that ASIO be required to report publicly in relation to the number of telecommunications interception warrants it obtains. Uh, we think perhaps this is better left for a, a considered approach uh, for another day, uh, and uh, the government will be voting uh, against this uh, amendment. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Gregg be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the noes, sorry, the noes have it. Yes, yes. It's just that my ears were not hearing too well. It was a soft no. Um, Senator Gregg. Uh, thank you, Chair. Before we um, leave the committee stage of this, um, I take it there are no further amendments. So before we leave the committee stage. I wonder if I could just ask, uh, when the, we resumed on this bill only just a short while ago, uh, I, I wasn't aware, my office wasn't aware that Senator Lugwid wasn't going to continue with his second reading speech, which he began earlier in the day. And as a consequence, I wasn't here for the call to give my second reading speech uh, to this bill. Then we went straight to the ministers wrapping up and then into committee. So you'd like to leave for your second reading it, speech? I haven't had an opportunity right? to confer with the whips. Uh, but if they're comfortable, I'd like to seek leave to have my second reading speech incorporated. I'll put in the that answer. request. Uh, uh, Senator Ludwig wants to clarify something first. Senator Ludwig, what had actually happened? I'd finished my speech at 12:45, uh, right on the dot. So I hadn't actually. I was not in continuation, and I noted you weren't in the chamber at uh, the resumption, and thought that you might have been. Is leave granted for the incorporation of Senator Gregg's second reading speech? Leave is granted. The piece is broken out, Senator Gregg, so you're lucky. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The, uh, Chairman of Committee Senator Hogg reports that the committee has considered the Telecommunications Interception Amendment Bill 2004 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. Deputy President, I move the, committee, the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Interception Act 1979 and for other purposes. Clark. Go government Business Order of the Day, Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 2003, Consideration and Committee of the Whole of the Message from the House of Representatives. Minister. I move that the committee does not insist on the Senate amendments disagreed to by the House of Representatives and agrees to the amendments made by the House in place of the Senate amendments. 
The question is that that motion be agreed to. Are you speaking to it, Melbourne? No, no, I'm just saying no. All right. Those, uh, Senator Forshaw. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, I um, seek to move uh, amendments which have been circulated in the name of Senator O'Brien on uh, sheet 4213. I seek leave to move those um, three amendments together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Forshaw. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is an important piece of legislation uh, because it goes to the heart of the integrity of Australia's quarantine regime. Uh, it was for that reason that Labor sought to amend this bill uh, when it was first before the, uh, the Senate to ensure that we continue to enjoy the highest level of protection from the threat of uh, imported pests and diseases. When this bill was last considered by the Senate, the government proposed two changes to our quarantine regime. The first change was to um, make provision to allow for the appointment of state quarantine officers to perform functions within the meaning of the Quarantine Act. Uh, Labor was uh, very uh, happy to support that, uh, that first change. The second proposal was to uh, extend quarantine powers to contract pool staff. And we opposed that proposal and uh, our opposition uh, was uh, supported by the, the Senate um, by virtue of the amendment that we moved. Now the government has chosen to reject uh, Labor's amendment, reject the Senate's amendment. Um, they've chosen to do that uh, in the other place. And they've now and they've moved a number of new amendments, uh, which have now come before us today. What the government is proposing to do with these new amendments is to add three new categories of persons able to perform quarantine functions within the meaning of the Act. The first category uh, are police officers, including members of a police force or police service of a state or territory. The second category to be given these uh, these powers. Uh, um, to perform quarantine functions within the meaning of the Act are protective service officers as defined under the Australian Protective Service Act. The third category uh, is uh, the category of employees of a body corporate established or continued in existence for a public purpose by or under a Commonwealth law. We're happy to, uh, of course, uh, accept the first two categories, uh, but we do have um, grave reservations about the third category of employees um, uh, identified in the government's um, uh, amendments. It's a very general category, and it's certainly not clear to us just what the implications of such a provision might be. We've been provided with a draft a schedule of organisations that may fall under this clause, but uh, we haven't had sufficient time um, to consider how appropriate those organisations might be as providers of quarantine services. And let me just give a couple of examples. Firstly, the, the minister's list of uh, or draft schedule of organisations uh, that may fall into this uh, category includes the Wheat Export Authority. Well, that organisation is based in Canberra. It has around 12 staff with skills that relate to the monitoring of the single export desk for wheat. For wheat. I'm not sure, frankly, uh, therefore, just what role we would expect or it would be expected uh, uh, that they would play or the Wheat Export Authority would play in um, terms of, uh, for instance, uh, being given powers to search property, to seize material. Um, in, uh, in respect of enforcing our quarantine uh, laws. Similarly, uh, the, another organisation or authority that's uh, on the minister's list is the Australian Fisheries Management Authority. That organisation already draws on state police forces for much of its compliance work. So one can, uh, can conclude that, uh, I think logically, that AFMA, the Australian Fisheries Management Authority, may well really be an organisation on the list that, uh, that largely would be redundant when it came to actually implementing uh, 
uh, what the government seeks to, uh, to do. Now we'd be interested also to hear from the minister just what level of consultation has taken place with these organisations um, prior to uh, uh, the government putting forward these uh, these proposals through their amendments that were moved in the other and carried in the other place. And I have to say, I suspect, given the, uh, the time frame, there's probably been very little, if any. So, Mr. Uh, Acting Chairman. Um, the minister has argued that he needs flexibility in the quarantine system in order that it can do its job properly. We believe that uh, there is already considerable flexibility under the existing arrangements. And certainly um, that flexibility is extended by adding, in, uh, adding to uh, the groups that can enforce uh, or um, um, use quarantine powers by extending that to police officers and protective service officers. So we're quite uh, willing to support the government in relation to those categories. But no case has been made out to this stage to put in place what is almost an open-ended arrangement where I suspect tens of thousands of people would be given specific powers under the Quarantine Act. So Mr uh, uh, Chairman, Deputy Chairman, where uh, moving amendments uh, to require the government to bring to the parliament a regulation that lists those bodies that it proposes to give the quarantine powers to under that uh, specific third category. Of course we support any improvement our, in our quarantine arrangements, but we cannot support just splashing those uh, powers around willy-nilly um, to all sorts of groups and uh, organisations simply for the sake of it. We must be more rigid uh, um, and certain in ensuring that uh, those persons or bodies that can um, enforce quarantine uh, laws and powers uh, and utilise the, the powers of search and um, seizure uh, under them um, are appropriately uh, 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 qualified and appropriately uh, and are appropriate organisations to uh, to use those enforcement powers so mr deputy chairman requiring the government to bring forward a, regu a regulation will allow this place the opportunity in future to consider in detail just what is being proposed and if necessary and if necessary of course use its power to disallow any such regulation thank you the question is that the amendments moved by the opposition be minister. I just wish to indicate that the, the government will be agreeing with the um, opposition amendments. Senator Gregg. Uh, likewise, Chair, that is the position of the Democrats. The question is the amendments moved by the opposition be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. The ayes have it. Question, question, the motion is amended. Be agreed question now is that the motion. The amendments moved by the House of Representatives. Question now is that the motion to accept the uh, amendments of the House of Representatives be agreed to? As amended. Be As amended? Be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Question, question, question now is that uh, the bill be reported. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Is it with amendments now or as amended? With amendments. Yeah, yeah good. That's good. Order. The temporary chairman of committees, Senator Chapman, reports the committee has considered message number 549 from the House of Representatives in relation to the Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry Legislation Amendment Bill number 2, 2003, and has resolved to not to insist on its amendments disagreed to by the House of Representatives and to the amendments made by the House in place of the Senate amendments with amendments. Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Parliamentary Secretary. I move that the bill be... Oh. Oh. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day, Communications Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 2003, second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. This bill uh, makes amendments to the Telecommunications Act 1997, the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act 1979, and the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act 1977. It strengthens the national security arrangements for Australia's telecommunications industry. This bill increases the power of the executive to exert control over Australia's telecommunications infrastructure. Labor accepts that in our heightened security environment, stronger national security provisions are required over these telecommunications facilities. While broadly supporting the, the bill, we did have some concerns with the fact that the bill was expressed to apply to individuals. We were concerned that individuals' phones could be cut off under the bill. This week, the government has responded to Labor's concerns, and the government will now move amendments to remove these provisions. The Democrats are also moving an amendment we are advised, taking into account Labor's concerns in this regard, which Labor will consider. Labor welcomes this change of heart, this change of approach from the government. We will support amendments removing individuals from the ambit of the bill. We will also support most of the bill. The bill has two main components. First, the bill amends the Telecommunications Act 1997 to require the ACA, the Australian Communications Authority, to consult with the Attorney General's Department before issuing a carrier's licence. The Attorney General, in consultation with the Prime Minister and the Minister administering the Telecommunications Act, can direct the ACA to refuse a carrier licence on national security grounds. The grounds for refusing carrier licences aren't limited under the Telecommunications Act, but the ability to refuse to grant a licence on national security grounds isn't provided for expressly. Labor supports these provisions as a sensible tightening of the national security arrangements applying to our carriers. Second, the bill does allow the Attorney-General to direct a person to prevent or cease the supply of a service for itself or any other person on national security grounds. This direction may be issued to individuals, groups or industry participants where their activities are deemed to pose a risk. It is this reference to individuals that is now to be removed. The bill amends the ASIO Act to provide an appeal to the AAT against any adverse or qualified security assessment ASIO has provided to the Attorney-General. The Attorney-General, in turn, will be required to notify a person of an adverse security finding except where such notification would be contrary to the interests of national security. However, the bill also amends the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act 1977 to exclude the same decision from judicial review under the Act. Such national security decisions aren't usually open to judicial review under the ADJR Act. Certainly, this is the case with the ASIO Act, the Intelligence Act and the Telecommunications Interception Act. However, judicial review will also be available in both the Federal Court and the High Court. Given the government's proposed amendment to remove references to individuals, Labor no longer objects strongly to this provision. The bill clarifies the existing obligations of carriers and carriage service providers (CSPs). It introduces new obligations on carriers and CSPs on data disclosure and interception arrangements. Carriers and CSPs must provide all relevant information associated associated with interception warrants. This includes call durations, the time, date and location calls, along with call content. This amendment further clarifies existing obligations and Labor supports it fully. The bill updates and arguably loosens the definition of senior officers who can certify the disclosure by carriers and CSPs of call data. This will accommodate current law enforcement agency structures and classifications. The commissioners, deputy commissioners or CEOs of relevant agencies will be able to nominate most categories of senior officers. Labor also has concerns with these amendments, which I'll come back to later. The Telecommunications Act 
will be amended to ensure that all carriers and CSPs have an interception capability. Applications for exemptions from this requirement will be considered within 60 days, with a further interim extension facility if needed. Labor supports these amendments. The current requirement for carriers and nominated CSPs to provide annual interception capability plans will be amended. These will now require statements about current and continued compliance with their interception obligations. This will ensure such plans are signed by or on behalf of the carrier or nominated CSP's CEO. The date for lodgement of such plans will be changed from 1 January to 1 July to ensure compliance with lodgement dates. Labor supports also these technical amendments. Having made those supportive comments on the bill, I will now speak to Labor's main concern. Labor's key concern with the bill now centres around the definition of senior officers who will have the power to certify cool data. The widespread access to cool data by inappropriate persons acting under the guise of law enforcement has recently been exposed in the media. In June this year, it was reported that Australia's police forces are using telephone taps at 27 times the rate of their US counterparts. It was reported that in Australia, 2,514 court warrants were issued for telephone taps last financial year. It suggested, therefore, that the need for this measure may be overstated. We need to ensure that relatively junior officers do not inappropriately access call data. There have already been various media reports that relatively junior officers have sought to obtain such information for non-law enforcement related purposes. Labor, Labor therefore does not support sections 17 and 18, which widen the definition of senior officer for the purposes of certifying the disclosure of cool data. The other amendment Labor will move at committee stage is provision for a five-year sunset clause in the bill. This will also provide for a review of the legislation four years after assent. While the bill's general provisions are justified under the current security environment, a sunset clause would allow the bill's continued relevance to be reviewed. It is important that the bill is considered in the light of experience. May I assure the Senate that Labor wants to improve the national security arrangements in our telecommunications industries. We have no desire to obstruct the great majority of the important amendments contained in this bill. We want our national security environment to be robust and responsive to the terrible threat of global terror terrorism against innocent civilians. But we need, to balance, we need to balance the need to strengthen our national security with the need to preserve our traditional rights. Labor supports absolutely the government's moves to tighten the national security checks against telecommunication carriers. But we also consider telecommunication services as essential services. That is why we are pleased that the government has relented on the extension of this bill to the rights of individuals without adequate appeal rights. If left intact, this would have contradicted the government's own majority report and the ev evidence given to the committee by the Attorney-General's department. Labor is pleased the government has seen the light and supported our original position. We welcome the fact that the bill no longer applies to individuals. We give credit to the government for conceding in the interests of good public policy. In conclusion, Labor supports the government's initiatives to improve national security arrangements in our telecommunications sector. We will not ultimately seek to defeat this bill, but we ask that the government give our amendments due and careful consideration. Thank you. Senator Gregg. Thank you, Chair. The Communications Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2 is the latest in a series of legislative measures which the government has proposed to protect Australia's security. We Democrats are committed to keeping Australians safe from terrorism, and for this reason we have given careful consideration to each of the government's proposals to combat terrorism. Some of these proposals we have supported and some we have not. In each case, we have considered whether there is any justification for the new powers being proposed by the government. This involves looking at, firstly, whether there is a demonstrated deficiency in existing law, secondly, 
whether there is any evidence to suggest that the new powers will be effective in addressing threats to security. Thirdly, whether any infringement of rights and liberties associated with the proposal is vital and necessary in order to protect the safety of Australians. And fourthly and finally, whether the government has considered alternative measures that might be more effective or appropriate in the circumstances. Unfortunately, the vast bulk of the government's anti-terror proposals have failed these tests, even after extensive amendment by the Senate. So accordingly, the Democrats have voted against them, although there have been a number of worthy proposals which the Democrats have been willing to support. The threat of terrorism is real and has serious implications for Australia's security. However, national security is also a vague concept which can be relied upon as a blanket justification for increasing powers and winding back the rights and freedoms of individuals. As parliamentarians, we are charged with the responsibility of making laws for the peace, order and good government of the Commonwealth. Clearly, this includes a responsibility to ensure that the government has the legislative capacity to protect Australia's national security, but it also includes a responsibility to ensure that the fundamental rights and freedoms of Australians are not violated. What I want to do today is to take a look at how this bill fits in with the current legislative framework for protecting Australian security. It's important that we don't simply consider this bill in isolation, but that we look at it in the context of the government's existing powers. Since the terrorist attacks in the United States on September 11, 2001, this parliament has passed at least 15 new bills specifically relating to terrorism. We have legislation which enables ASIO to monitor our telephone conversations, our SMS messages, email and voicemail messages, without proper accountability measures. We have legislation that enables ASIO to lock up and interrogate any innocent Australian who might have information to them. We have legislation that enables the government to prescribe organisations as terrorist organisations, whether or not they have been listed by the United Nations. We have legislation that enables APS officers to stop individuals and subject them to a search or require them to provide their personal details. We have a range of new strict liability offences where individuals can be prosecuted for an offence and imprisoned for many years regardless of whether they intend to commit the offence or not. We have non-disclosure offences which impede the freedom of the press and the ability of human rights organisations to ensure that the government does not violate human rights in the exercise of powers. And now, on top of all these measures, the government wants to invest the Attorney-General with wide-ranging powers to control access to telecommunications services. Moreover, it is seeking this, vital, uh, seeking this power rather, via a poorly drafted bill characterised by ambiguities and broad definitions. One of our major concerns with this bill is that it will, in its current form, allow the Attorney-General to issue a direction that telecommunications services can no longer be supplied to an individual. However, at the Senate inquiry into this bill, a senior departmental official informed the committee that the legislation was not intended to, to target individuals. They nevertheless uh, confirmed that it would be used to do so. The Attorney-General's department explained that the intention behind the bill was to address the risk to telecommunications industry in executing warrants and not about individuals. And we are pleased to see that the government has taken on board these concerns of the Senate committee and will be seeking to amend the bill to address those concerns. But despite the government amendments, we believe that the bill still lacks certainty and clarity. And in particular, we're concerned that the grounds upon which the Attorney General can exercise his or her powers under the bill are not adequately defined. The definition of security is too broad for the purposes of the bill and creates the potential for telecommunications services to be cut off for reasons that extend well beyond the threat of terrorism. There is little scope for a meaningful review of an adverse decision and the bill does not provide full statutory immunity for carriers, carriage service providers and their officers, employees and their agents in relation to compliance with some provisions. With respect to the Attorney-General's powers, the bill provides that the Attorney-General may exercise his or her power under section 5813 if, after consulting with the Prime Minister and the Minister, uh, minister uh, sorry, administer, administering the Act, the Attorney-General considers that the proposed use or supply of a service would be prejudicial to security. 
Now, given the significant and intrusive nature of the Attorney-General's powers under this section, we Democrat Democrats believe that the grounds for their exercise needs to be much more clearly defined. <coughs> Firstly, the Attorney-General is only required to consider that the proposed use or supply would be prejudicial to security. <coughs> And secondly, the bill does not require a security assessment to be prepared before the Attorney-General uses the proposed new powers to direct that a carrier licence not be issued or that a service not be supplied. Now, this seems quite extraordinary that the Attorney-General can make a decision regarding national security without a national assessment, particularly given the lack of adequate review processes. Vodafone, in its submission to the Senate inquiry, called for an express legislative requirement that there is evidence or demonstrated grounds before the Attorney-General uses the power. An example of demonstrated grounds could be, for example, a security assessment from ASIO. Given the intrusive nature of the powers contained in the legislation, we Democrats firmly believe that the threshold for exercising them should be set sufficiently high. <coughs> Obtaining a security assessment from ASIO is uh, rendered even more imperative, uh, given the severely limited rights of review. In the bill's present form, the only right to review under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act is in relation to the ASIO assessment, security assessment itself. No such opportunity for review exists in relation to the decision of the Attorney-General, although it would still be possible to seek a review of that decision in the Federal Court under Section 39B of the Judiciary Act and in the High Court under Section uh, 75 of the Constitution. Given that the more accessible and cheaper version uh, for review under the ADJR Act is restricted to the ASIO security assessment. We Democrats believe that such an assessment should be a prerequisite condition for the exercise of the Attorney-General's power. I'll be moving amendments in the committee stages to address those issues, but regarding the definition of security, at security the bill under section 5813 states that security has the same meaning as in the ASIO Act. Section 4 of the ASIO Act defines security as including the protection of and of the people of the Commonwealth and the several states and territories from 1. Espionage, 2. Sabotage, 3. Politically motivated violence, 4. Promotion of communal violence, 5. Attacks on Australia's defence system, or 6. Acts of foreign interference, whether directed from or committed within Australia or not. <clears throat> On the basis of that information, we Democrats share the concerns of the New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties that the Attorney-General could exercise his or her powers in relation to political protests, industrial action and consumer boycotts. We note that Section 17A of the ASIO Act provides that this Act shall not limit the right of persons to engage in lawful advocacy, protest or dissent, and the exercise of that right shall not by itself be regarded as prejudicial to security and the functions of the organisation shall be construed accordingly. So, accordingly, ASIO would be constrained by this provision in preparing security assessments for the Attorney-General. However, this constraint would not extend to the actual decision of the Attorney-General, which is particularly concerning given that security assessments are not currently a mandatory prerequisite to that decision. We believe that the bill should be amended to incorporate an express exemption for such activities and we'll be moving an amendment to uh, deal with that during the committee stage. With respect to lack of review mechanisms in the bill, the Democrats do share the concerns of the Scrutiny Bills Committee, which observed that decisions by the Attorney-General to refuse to grant a, license, uh, a carrier licence or to direct a carrier not to supply telecommunication services can only be made if the Attorney-General considers that the grant of the licences or the use of telecommunication services would be prejudicial to security. However, there is no means by which that decision can be tested before any independent body. The fact that the Attorney-General's decision is not reviewable, coupled with the ambiguous grounds on which that decision can be made, leaves the Attorney-General with a broad discretion and no accountability. Therefore, we will be opposing the government's amendment to exclude judicial review. Our final concern is that the bill does not provide statutory immunity for carriers, carriage service providers and their officers employees and agents in respect of acts done or omitted in good faith in relation to a direction under 5813. Vodafone argues that uh, this is unjustified and inconsistent 
uh, as the current legislation grants immunity for acts done in good faith in relation to sections 313 and 315. In its submission, Vodafone argued, uh, and I quote, carriers and carriage service providers could potentially be exposed to very significant claims and damages and on other bases for ceasing or refusing to supply telecommunication services to their customers in compliance with the direction under section 5813. It is clearly essential to afford them such bare minimum statutory protection against such claims." End quote. In response, the department argued that compliance with a direction under that section, 5813, would frustrate uh, the contracts of carriers and carriage service providers so that they would not attract any liability. And while that might be the case, we Democrats believe that uh, uh, immunity from liability should be expressly included in the bill in order to avoid any doubt. Uh, this is a matter that should be determined by the parliament and not left to the courts. And accordingly, we will be moving the amendment in the committee stage to address that issue also. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, I thank Senators uh, Bishop and Gregg uh, for their contributions, and uh, it now falls to me to uh, uh, sum up the uh, debate and uh, end the second reading uh, part of this legislation. The uh, Communications uh, Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 2003, amends the Telecommunications Act 1997 and the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act uh, 1979 and the Administrative Decisions uh, and Judicial Review Act 1977 to enhance the security <coughs> of Australia's uh, telecommunications services and networks and to improve existing arrangements relating to call data disclosure and telecommunications interception services. The Telecommunications Act provides the legislative base for Australia's open and competitive telecommunications industry. The telecommunications industry is attracting significant new investment which increases the potential for national security and law enforcement issues to arise. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, the objectives of the bill are to uh, one, improve national security by allowing national security issues to be considered before the granting of a carrier licence, uh, two, provides the Attorney General with uh, discretionary powers to prevent a carrier or carriage service provider services from being used for purposes against the national interest. Three, improve the efficiency and effectiveness of current call data disclosure and interception arrangements under the Telecommunications Act. Uh, four, update relevant definitions to accommodate current uh, law enforcement management structures. And five, improve arrangements related to interception uh, capability plans. The bill was drafted primarily in response to the government's consideration of a number of recommendations of the review of the long-term cost effectiveness of telecommunications interception uh, voucher review and uh, concerns of law enforcement agencies about the potential ownership of telecommunications companies by entities whose activities may pose a risk to national security. The bill seeks to address heightened uh, concerns about the need to enhance the security of Australia's telecommunications services while still preserving the balance provided for in the existing legislative framework between the need to protect an individual's privacy and confidentiality and the public and national interest in having protected information disclosed in limited authorised circumstances. Uh, I would like uh, to thank uh, members of the Senate Environment, Communications, Information Technology and Arts Legislation Committee for their report on the bill. After carefully considering the Senate Legislation Committee's report, the government, uh, as befits a consultative government, uh, which this government is, uh, we are proposing to uh, move amendments that will clarify that the bill intends to address potential security risks to the Australian uh, telecommunications industry and not risks that may be posed by individual users of the telecommun telecommunication system. The package of amendments contained in the bill will lead to more secure telecommunications networks and services and, uh, we believe, improved arrangements for the provision of assistance of law enforcement agencies by telecommunications carriers and carriage service providers. Mr Acting Deputy President, I note that both the Opposition and Democrats are proposing amendments to the bill. The government, uh, I should flag, and hopefully to save some time, 
uh, will not be supporting these amendments, believing that they are unnecessary uh, changes to the legislation that would not improve its operation. In summary, the bill contains a range of measures which will enhance the security of Australia's telecommunication services and networks and improve arrangements for the provision of assistance to law enforcement agencies by telecommunications carriers and carriage service providers. Mr Acting Deputy President, the government considers that it is important for the bill to be passed as soon as possible to ensure the security of Australia's telecommunications services and networks, and I look forward to the cooperation of the Senate. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation related to communications and for related purposes. Is it the uh, wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Gregg. Uh, thank you, Chair. I move uh, Democrat Amendment 1 to the legislation. Uh, as I said in my second reading speech, the fact that the Attorney General's decision is not reviewable, coupled with the ambiguous grounds on which a decision or that decision can be made, leaves the AG with broad discretion and no accountability. The lack of review, review mechanisms of the bill was also raised as a concern by the Scrutiny Bills Committee in its deliberations and uh, uh, published in Alert uh, Digest No. 8 of 2003. We Democrats remain concerned that there is no uh, easy review process and therefore will be opposing the government's amendment to exclude the Attorney-General's actions under 58A and 5813 from judicial review. Uh, so it's our, it's, uh, our contention uh, that the item uh, be opposed uh, in terms of standing on the uh, uh, in, in standing in the legislation. Senator Bishop. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Democrat Amendment 1 opposes Schedule 1, Item 1, which excludes decisions made under this Act from the scope of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act. Labor was to move a similar amendment before being informed that the government was to remove individuals from the ambit of this bill. Given the bill no longer applies to individuals, we are less concerned about the exclusion of the ADJR Act from decisions made by the AG under this Act. Nonetheless, there is still merit in the Democrat amendment, and on balance, we'll support it now. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Acting Chair. Uh, let me just make a couple of uh, points. Uh, judicial review under the Administrative Decisions uh, the Judicial Review Act. Uh, we don't believe it uh, is appropriate for decisions made, up, uh, made uh, under national security grounds. The provisions in the bill are consistent with existing policy that decisions made on grounds of security or which have security implications are excluded from judicial review under the ADJR uh, Act. For example, decisions under the following acts are currently exempt. Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act 1979 uh, brackets the ASIO Act, in, uh, the Intelligence Services Act uh, 2001, and the Foreign Acquisitions and Takeovers Act 1975. The ADJR Act provides a streamlined and expedited form of judicial review that is not designed to deal effectively with the review of sensitive material. The Security Appeals D D Division of the um, AAT provides a more appropriate mechanism for review of decisions based on security matters. The AAT Act contains a range of specific mechanisms to quarantine and effectively protect security sensitive information. The amendments contained in the bill ensure that security assessment forming the basis of a direction will be reviewable on their merits by the AAT. Uh, as I said, we will not be supporting the amendment uh, moved by the Democrats. Uh, we note that some wavering on the Labor Party's position, as uh, stated uh, by Senator Mark Bishop, uh, but I think on balance, Senator Bishop, you came down on the wrong side. The question is that uh, item one stand as printed. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. We now move to amendment, uh, government amendment. Number 
Uh, with the uh, approval Mr. of the Senate, I would uh, seek to move uh, government's amendments uh, one, two, and three. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. Uh, prior to moving them, I let me. Uh, uh, table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved uh, to this bill. The memorandum was circulated in the chamber on the 30th of March 2004. On uh, 20th of August uh, uh, 2003, the Senate referred the bill to the Senate Environment, Communications, Information, Technology and Arts Legislation Committee for inquiry and report, and the committee reported on the 15th of September 2003. The committee supported the bill. However, the committee suggests that the government consider clarifying whether or not the bill is intended to apply to carriers and carriage service providers as well as individuals or only to carriers and carriage service providers and not individuals. The government proposes amendments to the bill that addresses the concerns raised by the committee and also by the opposition during the debate in the House of Representatives. The amendments clarify that the bill is intended to address uh, potential security risks related to the Australian telecommunications industry and not the risks that may be posed by individual users of the telecommunications system. Amendment 3, in combination with Amendment 2, requires uh, that a direction given under proposed subsection 5813 uh, in brackets relate to a carriage service generally and would preclude the Attorney General from issuing a direction to a carrier or carriage service provider to cease supplying a carriage service to a particular pers uh, person. Uh, amendment 1 makes consequential amendments and also omits an unnecessary provision. The question is that government amendments. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Chair. Labor supports government amendments 1, 2 and 3. These amendments address Labor's key concerns with the original bill. Under the original bill, the government could have cut off an individual's telecommunications services. Labor identified this weakness in the bill during the Senate inquiry into the bill. We called for the bill to be, to be amended to remove references to individuals. The government has responded to our call through these amendments, which we are now supporting. Government amendments 2 and 3 amend item 27 to ensure that the Attorney-General cannot give a direction to a carriage or carriage service, carriage service provider not to supply or to cease supplying a carriage service to a particular person, particular persons or a particular class of persons. Rather, the attorney may only issue a direction in relation to the use or supply of carriage services generally. Amendment 1 is a consequential amendment that removes provisions of the bill no longer necessary following amendments, uh, the other amendments. Again, Labor welcomes this acknowledgement from the government that the bill should not apply to individuals, and accordingly, we support these amendments. Question is, Senator Gregg. Uh, thank you, Chair. The Democrats agree with the government's argument in relation to this amendment, and we will be supporting it. Question is, the amendments moved by, by the minister be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. We now move to. Democrat amendments two and four. Senator Gregg. Thank you, Chair. By leave, I uh, ask that we take these amendments together. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Gregg. Uh, thank you, Chair. Again, as I said in my second reading speech a little earlier, we Democrats are concerned that, given the significant and intrusive nature of the Attorney General's powers under this section, uh, we feel that the grounds for their exercise need to be much more clearly defined. The attorney is not only required to consider that the proposed use or supply would be prejudicial to security. Um, there is no uh, requirement that the attorney general's view be based on reasonable grounds or demonstrated grounds. Secondly, uh, we feel that the phrase prejudicial to security is ambiguous, and we believe that this phrase uh, should be replaced with an alternative form of words which imply a more specific threshold. For example, the requirement could be that the attorney uh, believes on reasonable grounds that the proposed use or supply would seriously threaten Australia's security. Democrat Amendment 2 redrafts pro proposed provision 58A1 to ensure that the attorney general's decision is based on demonstrated grounds, and ideally that would be uh, an ASIO security assessment, and that the attorney general believes on reasonable grounds that the proposed use or supply would seriously threaten Australia's security. 
Question, Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Chair. Democrat amendments two and four, amongst other things, require the Attorney General show there are demonstrated grounds to protect national security when exercising directions under the Act. Labor supports these amendments. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Acting, Acting uh, Deputy Chair. Um, the government, as I flagged in the second reading speech, does not support the amendment uh, proposed by the Democrats. Uh, we believe an amendment uh, in these terms uh, is unnecessary. Uh, it's currently drafted. In our view, the bill would ensure that a direction may only be given where the issue of a licence or the supply of a service would be prejudicial to uh, security. In addition, I point out that the bill includes a range of measures through which security considerations may be addressed during the licensing process. The issue of a direction will therefore only arise in cases where those measures have been um, unsuccessful in resolving security issues. I would point out, uh, Mr Acting Deputy uh, Chair, that the um, Attorney General would also be required to consult with both the Prime Minister and uh, the Minister administering the Telecommunications Act before directing the ACA to refuse to grant a licence or directing a carrier or carried service provider not to use or supply or to cease using or supplying a carried service to all carried services. Uh, Senator Gregg, I think, raised the issue of um, uh, the meaning of the term prejudicial to security. Uh, the bill adopts uh, the definition of security in section 4 of the ASIO Act, which includes the protection of Australia and its people from espionage, politically motivated violence and other dangerous activities. It is not appropriate, however, to develop a specific set of criteria that could be used by the Attorney-General to determine what is prejudicial to security. An inflexible set of criteria uh, would limit the government uh, to respond to specific and generalised security issues that may arise from time to time, and we will not be supporting the amendments moved by the Democrats. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator Gregg be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now move to um, Democrat amendments three and five. Senator Gregg. Uh, thank you, Chair. Again, by leave, I ask that these amendments be taken together. Leave granted. Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Gregg. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, as I uh, uh, said in my second reading speech. Uh, we Democrats do share the concerns raised in the Senate inquiry, uh, particularly by the New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties, that the Attorney-General could exercise her or his powers in relation to political protests, industrial action and consumer boycotts. Democrat Amendment 3 goes to the heart of that and seeks to ensure that the rights of persons to engage in lawful advocacy, protest or dissent shall not be regarded as a risk to national security. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Democrat Amendments 3 and 5 place stricter limits on the definition of national security so that lawful advocacy, protest or dissent is not included in that definition. Labor is comfortable with these provisions, which clarify when the AG can exercise powers conferred upon him or her under the Act. Labor supports these amendments. Minister. Uh, the coalition does not support these amendments uh, for the reason we believe they are unnecessary. As currently drafted, the bill makes it clear that a direction uh, may only be given where the issue of a licence or the supply of a service um, would be uh, prejudicial to security. Security is clearly defined by item 9 of the bill to have the meaning given in the ASIO Act. The Act uh, separately specifies that it does not limit the right of a person to engage in lawful advocacy, protest or dissent and the exercise of that right shall not by itself be regarded as prejudicial to security. Now, that's the advice I've received, and I think it's, uh, it's significant. The functions uh, of uh, the organisation, in, including a relation to the pre preparation of security assessments, are uh, uh, construed uh, accordingly. The question, question is that the amendments moved by Senator Gregg be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now move to uh, Democrat Amendment number six. Senator Gregg. Uh, thank you, Chair. Again, as I uh, uh, outlined in my second reading speech, 
It's our view that the bill uh, does not provide statutory immunity for carriers, carriage service providers and their officers, employees and agents in respect of acts done or omitted in good faith in relation to a direction under 58, uh, uh, 5813, despite the fact that such immunity attaches to sections 313 and 315 of the Act. As I also said in my second reading speech to the bill, carriers and carriage service providers could potentially be exposed to very significant claims in damages and on other bases for ceasing or refusing to supply telecommunication services to their customers in compliance with the direction under section 5813. So the Democrats believe that um, uh, immunity from liability should be expressly included in the bill and Democrat Amendment 6 goes to the heart of doing just that. Senator Bishop. Thank you, Chair. Labor is also comfortable with Democrat Amendment 6, which limits the legal liability for carriers and carriage service providers who comply with requests under the bill. Labor supports this amendment. Minister. Uh, we don't believe that, again, that this amendment is uh, necessary. In the event uh, that a direction is issued, the carriage or service, uh, carriage service provider would be compelled to act in accordance with that direction. In doing so, the carrier would comply with a lawful order and, and uh, could not be liable for damages for such action. The common law principle of the doctrine of frustration uh, I've advised would provide a defence to any action for damages in uh, contract uh, as a result of the failure to provide a service due to compliance with a lawful direction. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator or the amendment moved by Senator Gregg be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. No. We know We now move to um, opposition amendments three and four, and they'll be divided uh, in terms of the vote, as I understand it, items 17 and 18. Senator Bishop. Uh, do I need to seek leave to move these together, Chair? No, no. no I'll put the question separately. Oh, okay. so. All right. uh, thank you, Chair. I move uh, just put that Labor Amendments 3 and 4, which oppose the Bill's provisions regarding the definition of an officer who may certify the disclosure by carriers and carriage service providers, or CSPs, of call data. The Bill updates and arguably loosens the definition of senior officers who can certify the disclosure by carriers and CSPs of call data purportedly to accommodate current law enforcement agency structures and classifications. The commissioners, deputy commissioners and CEOs of relevant agencies will be able to nominate most categories of senior officers. As stated in my second reading speech, Labor has problems with the extension of the definition of senior officer for the purposes of certifying disclosure of cool data. The widespread accessing of cool data in Australia by inappropriate persons acting under the guise of law enforcement has been exposed in the media. We need to ensure that relatively junior officers do not inappropriately access call data. Again, drawing on my second reading speech, there have been various media reports regarding relatively junior officers who have sought to obtain such information for non-law enforcement related purposes. Item 17 of the bill widens the definition of senior officer to include people who may not even work for an enforcement agency but may be, on may be on secondment, for instance. This widens the definition of officer considerably. Labor is uncomfortable with this provision and opposes it. Item 18 allows for greater flexibility in the range of persons that may be specified as a senior officer. Currently, only senior officers authorised in writing by the head of an agency are allowed to issue disclosure certificates for the enforcement of the criminal law. These certificates authorise the release of otherwise confidential communications. Item 18 widens the definition of senior officer and allows most categories of senior officers to be authorised or nominated in writing by the commissioner, deputy commissioner, CEOs of particular agencies. Confidential communications, <coughs> Labor believes, should not able should not be able to be disclosed by relatively junior officers. These provisions, as they stand, may allow for this scenario. 
Labor is uncomfortable with this widening of the definition of senior officers, doesn't believe it is warranted as it currently stands, and accordingly opposes item 18. Senator Gregg. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair, we Democrats always take the view that in dealing with legislation uh, that broadens powers uh, and goes to fundamental questions of civil liberties and human rights, that definitions are critical. And so we take the view that uh, better prescribing the definitions in the way that Labor is proposing here uh, enhances the bill, and we will therefore be supporting them. Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy Chair, uh, the um, changes to the definition of senior officer better align the Telecommunications Act definition to current law enforcement agency management structures. The proposed changes do not relax the authorisation process or expand the ability for officers to authorise disclosures. The Telecommunications Act contains a number of strong provisions to protect the personal privacy of people using telecommunications services while recognising the needs of law enforcement agencies to obtain protected information, for example, to uh, conduct criminal investigations. The bill does not water down these provisions, and all existing protective mechanisms will be maintained. The government does not support uh, these amendments, uh, as it would frustrate, we believe, the ability of law enforcement agencies in the performance of their functions. The existing definitions of senior officer and officer present significant difficulties uh, for some enforcement agencies in efficient processing of certificates due to changes that have occurred to law enforcement agency structures and officer classifications. Those changes have effectively reduced the number of officers who can certify a call data request than was the case when the definition was enacted. The bill makes essential updates to the classifications in the Telecommunications Act to reflect current law enforcement management and operational structures. The bill also requires most categories of senior officers to be authorised uh, or nominated in writing by the Commissioner of Police, Deputy uh, Commissioner of Police or Chief Executive Officer of the relevant agency. This ensures senior con uh, consideration of whether a person is appropriate to undertake the responsibilities involved. We will not be supporting the amendments. The question is that items 17 and 18 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. We now move to opposition amendments one and two. Senator, Senator Bishop. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I now move Labor Amendments uh, 1 and 2, which relate to a review of the operation of the Act. Leave granted uh, oh. for Senator Bishop to move them together? Of course. No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, as I was saying, I move Labor Amendments 1 and 2, which relate to a review of the operation of the Act and a provision for a five-year sunset clause for the Bill. Amendment 1 allows for a review of the legislation four years after assent. This will allow the minister, in consultation with the AG, to review the operation, effectiveness and implications of the Act. It'll, it will allow for the, any unseen outcomes of the bill to be reconsidered after four years. It will allow for the bill to be reconsidered in the light of experience and amended if appropriate. Amendment 2 allows for a five-year sunset clause for the bill following that review. While the bill's general provisions are justified under the current security environment, a sunset clause would allow the possible repeal or amendment of the bill should the security environment improve over the next five years. Again, it is important that this bill is considered in the light of experience. Senator Gregg. Chair, in relation to opposition amendments one and two, given the concerns that we Democrats have raised about the bill, uh, in the Senate committee report and again here in the chamber today, we do think it's appropriate that the bill be reviewed and therefore have no difficulty in supporting Labor's amendments one and two. Minister. Uh, the government opposes this amendment. Uh, this bill will enhance the security of Australia's telecommunication services and networks and improve arrangements for the provision of assistance to law enforcement agencies by telecommunications carriers and carriage service providers. The security of Australia's telecommunications systems is not a short-term issue. The amendments appropriately provide longer-term measures to limit the risk to security within the Australian telecommunications networks and enhance the effective operations of law enforcement agencies. These measures include extensive consultation um, to ensure that security issues are appropriately considered in, in uh, telecommunications 
licensing issues. These measures will assist in ensuring that all relevant considerations are taken into account at an early stage in the licensing process. In terms uh, of review, there is no need to add further review requirements, given that most, uh, most of this uh, bill uh, is itself the, out the um, outcome of extensive review procedures. Much of the bill responds to recommendations of the review of the longer-term effectiveness of telecommunications inception. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The uh, temporary chairman of committee, Senator Kirk, reports that the committee has considered the communications legislation amendment bill number two, two thousand and three, and agreed to it with amendments. Minister, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it, Minister. I move that the, the uh, bill be read a third time. Yeah. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation related to communications and for related purposes. Clark. Oh, we've got some messages. Messages have been received from the House of Representatives acquainting the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate in the following bills, Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Bill 2003 and Military Rehabilitation and Compensation Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2003. A message has been received from the House of Representatives returning the Migration Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1 2002, acquainting the Senate that the House has disagreed to the amendments made by the Senate and requesting the reconsideration of the amendments. Minister. Uh, I move that uh, consideration of message in committee of the whole be made an order of the day for a later hour. For, uh, the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. A message has been received from the House of Representatives returning the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Extension of Time, bills, time, lim time Limits Bill 2003, acquainting the Senate that the House has disagreed to the amendments made by the Senate and requesting the reconsideration of the amendments. Minister. I move that the message uh, be considered in committee of the whole immediately. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the committee does not insist on the Senate amendments disagreed by the House of Representatives. The question is that the Senate does not agree with, does not insist upon the amendments. Does that opinion say aye? Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the resolution be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The uh, temporary chairman of committee, Senator Kirk, reports that the committee has considered message number 560 from the House of Representatives in relation to the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Extension of Time Limits Bill 2003 and has resolved not to insist on the Senate amendments disagreed to by the House of Representatives. Minister. Uh, I move that the report of the committee uh, be adopted. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Um, uh, I move that the uh, that the intervening business be postponed until after consideration of the, the Kyoto Protocol Ratification Bill 2003, number two. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. General Business Order of the Day No. 71, Kyoto Protocol Ratification Bill 2003 No. 2, second reading adjourned debate. Senator Lundy. Thank you. I rise today on behalf of the opposition to once again call on the Howard government to finally fulfil its obligation to act as a responsible international environmental citizen and pass the Kyoto Protocol Ratification Bill. 
Climate change due to global warming is without question one of the most serious environmental issues that is currently facing the planet. A major contributing factor to global warming is greenhouse gas emissions. Both developed and developing countries have acknowledged the need to dramatically cut greenhouse gas emissions as part of a coordinated international response to limit global warming. To their credit, many countries, including developing countries, have adopted the Kyoto Protocol and are making significant headway in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This makes the Howard government's ongoing refusal to ratify when we have secured such a good deal from the Kyoto negotiations and now have so much to lose an international embarrassment. Why, when the Howard government has committed Australia to meeting its Kyoto target of an 8 per cent increase, they still refuse to ratify Kyoto and bring into force a protocol that will benefit this country in so many ways defies logic. For too long, the Howard government has rolled out the abysmal excuse that we don't need to ratify Kyoto because we have a greenhouse office and we are giving them millions of dollars to deliver emission reduction programs. The problem for the government, as, as a recent ANAO, Australian National Audit Office report showed, is that the Australian greenhouse office's emission reduction programs are totally ineffectual. The ANAO report levelled some sharp and very accurate criticisms at the performance of the Australian Greenhouse Office. In a key criticism, the ANAO questioned whether the greenhouse gas abatement claim from the Greenhouse Challenge was, accurate, was an accurate reflection of what had been achieved as a direct result of um, Australian Greenhouse Office programs. In short, the Audit Office said, if the, said we can't tell if the AGO's programs are really getting the emission reductions they claim they are or not. The Audit Office also showed that the government's claims about spending $1 billion on greenhouse programs are entirely misleading. The Australian National Audit Office showed that the original budget for the seven key programs it investigated was $873.7 million to 30 June 2003, but the actual amount spent since 30 June was in fact just $204.4 million, less than a quarter of the original total. At this rate of spending, $200 million over four years, it will take 20 years to spend the $1 billion the Howard government talks about. By then it will be too late for the Great Barrier Reef, for our alpine ecosystems and for our farmlands. Enough time has already been wasted. While the Howard government has continued to shirk its international responsibilities, greenhouse gas emissions have continued to grow. It is time that Australia joined the world effort to tackle climate change and its damaging consequences. In fact, it's way past time. Labor is committed to tackling global warming, an issue that is so serious it was recently described as a threat to global security in a Pentagon commissioned report. Labor has made the commitment to act as a responsible environmental citizen, and Labor now calls once again on the Howard government to finally do what is right and ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, which they will be required to do upon the successful passage of this bill in both houses. So we're on the brink of um, seeing this matter treated, uh, dealt with in this chamber. But I, um, I obviously understand that its future will be contingent upon the Howard government's approach to this in the lower house. So I commend the bill to you. It's the only way forward if Australia is going to be treated with any respect and credibility on the global stage when it comes to protecting our environment. Thank you, Senator Lundy. Senator Brown. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The former head of the Bureau of Meteorology in Britain has recently stated that global warming is a greater threat to the planet than global terrorism. We must take it seriously, and this government must take it seriously. And this begins with the ratification of the Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol. One thing that uh, has been established through the short hearings of the Senate inquiry into this bill is that there is no alternative. Those businesses that are opposed to this, this treaty uh, all say that global warming has to be tackled. None of them have an alternative international process which can lead to the objective of turning the world around from its prodigious use of fossil fuels and production of global warming gases, which is now headed for mammoth increases in the coming decades, not just in the developing countries but in the developed and rich countries. 
the, the Australian government has said that, uh, and Prime Minister Howard himself has said, that the target of the Kyoto Protocol of restricting Australian emissions to an increase of 8 per cent over the 1990 levels by the year 20, years 2010 to 2012 is what the government is going to achieve. Then why not sign the protocol? It's a, a compelling argument. Uh, to do the reverse is not only to let down this nation and the coming generations of this nation, but to let down the planet, everyone's grandchildren. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Wong. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this important piece of legislation uh, and to uh, again on, uh, support this bill. Mm -hmm. I note there are no government speakers on the, the speaking list. I'm not sure why that is. Perhaps, perhaps it is because the time uh, constraints on, upon uh, the chamber, but I note that all the speakers are cutting their their uh, contribution short for the purpose of for the for the purpose of uh, uh, truncating this debate. But perhaps it's also indicative, frankly, of the government's complete lack of interest in this pending environmental disaster of global warming, and it is um, an opportune time for this legislation to come again before the chamber. Uh, we have had this week uh, some very important information which has got a fair bit of publicity in the Australian media about the massive increase uh, in uh, carbon or greenhouse gas emissions over the last two years. Um, CSIRO figures have been released which show that the rate of emissions contributing to global warming worsened in 2002, despite a myriad of programs attempting to curb them. Uh, and uh, the uh, CSIRO warned that a continued rise in these temperatures could devastate the Great Barrier Reef by 2030 and flood Kakadu National Park. Uh, the uh, massive increase is around 18.7 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide were released into the atmosphere in 2002 and another 17.1 billion tonnes last year. Now, the average over the last decade has been 13.3 billion tonnes, so we've seen uh, a substantial increase despite uh, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, despite uh, programs which were designed uh, to curb emissions. Uh, but what has this government done on this issue? Well, very, very little. Uh, they have often trumpet uh, the fact that they have allocated spending measures uh, to uh, greenhouse gas abatement programs. Uh, the Prime Minister has uh, trumpeted his supposed billion dollar commitment. But as an ANO Audit Office report, which I think Senator Lundy referred to, shows, there has been a massive underspend, a massive underspend in those programs. Uh, as at, last, at the end of last financial year, uh, the uh, actual amount spent was just over $204 million. Uh, and which is only about 20 per cent, or 22 per cent, I think, certainly less than a quarter of the actual spending proposed. Uh, the Audit Office also found a number of problems, particularly with the Greenhouse Challenge Program, uh, where uh, it was clear that abatement targets uh, were not properly uh, part of the framework for allocating fund funding, uh, and a rather bizarre uh, case study uh, where uh, the Greenhouse AGO, the Australian Greenhouse Office, actually allocated funding uh, to purchase uh, to assist a company in purchasing a new fleet of buses, and it was determined after the project finished that in fact it had delivered no greenhouse gas abatement. So this is the state of the government's uh, agenda. Uh, their, their programs are not delivering sufficiently. It is extraordinary that this government see, is in the position of saying we will try and meet the Kyoto target, but we won't ratify it. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol is the agreed international framework to, for proceeding on what is an extraordinarily important issue, and an issue that will be important in the lifetimes of people in this place. This is not something just for future generations. This is something uh, that will confront us in our lifetime. Uh, and I, Unless the government changes its position, uh, I think we will look back on this period in history as, an, as a time where government failed to take up the challenge, uh, failed to confront the task 
uh, and failed to actually achieve any effective reform in this area. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Bartlett. That's Senator Eggleston. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, this this uh, issue of the Coyote Protocol ratification bill <coughs> is um, a matter which has caused a, or has received a, a lot of uh, interest. And the whole issue of Coyote, of course, is the Coyote Protocol, is a matter which uh, there's quite a lot of misunderstanding out there in the community about. Um, we, uh, in the Environment, Communications, IT and the Arts uh, Legislation Committee, conducted an inquiry into this private member's bill. We received uh, 39 submissions and saw 18 witnesses from 15 organisations. And I have to say, Madam Acting Deputy President, the committee received no truly persuasive evidence that Australia should ratify the Kyoto Protocol. That was the majority opinion. To the contrary, the evidence received uh, was persuasive the other way, that there is no case in Australia's interest to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. And the reasons uh, for that are, uh, are something that I'd like to go into but not at great length, considering the time and the need to conclude. <coughs> All parties agreed, on a positive note, that um, there is a problem in this day and age with greenhouse gases and global warm warming. We do um, have no argument about that. Um, and we do believe that it's necessary that countries around the world take actions to uh, do what they can to <coughs> abate greenhouse gas emissions and to prevent, as far as is possible, climate change. Um, that's not anything that anyone argues about. What is argued about is whether or not the Kyoto Protocol provides a useful mechanism to ensure that greenhouse gas emissions are reduced and climate change is thereby ameliorated. And it is the opinion uh, of the government that the Kyoto Protocol, while it is no doubt a genuine attempt to seek to control gr greenhouse gas emissions, is a flawed treaty, a flawed protocol, which really will do very little to uh, ameliorate greenhouse gas emissions and prevent climate change. The fact of the matter is that most of the world's large emitters will, are not signatories to the Kyoto Protocol. So the United States, Russia, who are the large emitters in the world, are not signatories to this protocol. If Australia signed on to the protocol, the impact of us signing on would only be about we, we only contribute we, we would only contribute about a one percent reduction and impact on world greenhouse gas emissions. The protocol won't come into operation unless um, either the United, the United States or Russia sign on and bring um, the number of signing on nations up to 55. It's interesting that the European Union, <coughs> which is very critical of Australia, and which likes to portray itself as a par something of a paragon of moral virtue in terms of concern about the environment and greenhouse gas, of the emissions of the 15 uh, members of the European Union as it stands now, 12 are not meeting the greenhouse uh, uh, targets under the Kyoto Protocol. And of those that do, <coughs> they're very largely doing it by use of nuclear energy which one might say is a rather flawed way to achieve an environmental outcome, given the problems with nuclear waste disposal. Australia and the Australian government, under uh, this government, has a very outstanding record in terms of controlling greenhouse gas emissions. And without signing on to the protocol, we are going to meet our targets. So we, we 
acknowledge the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but we also feel that the Kyoto Protocol will do little um, to enhance uh, the process whereby greenhouse gas emissions can be controlled and, more specifically, in Australia's case, there is concern, as was expressed to the inquiry by a number of industries, <coughs> that signing on to Kyoto um, in this country will mean an unnecessary shackling of major industries which employ a lot of people in Australia and result in loss of, loss of employment and very probably the loss of industries as they move offshore to other places. So signing on to this flawed treaty not only will not produce any significant reduction in greenhouse gas emission levels on a worldwide basis, it will also do positive economic damage to Australia because we will put a shackle around the economic legs of this country, which doesn't have to be there and which will have a very negative effect on our economy. We believe that what the world needs is some sort of agreement which covers not only the developed nations of the world but also the developing nations, so that um, large emitters like India and China um, and indeed the group of developing countries which are called the G77 <coughs> actually sign on to something which um, is legally blind binding to constrain their greenhouse emissions and um, will do something to reduce those emissions. As it stands at the moment, countries like India and China, although they are signatories, uh, I believe, to the protocol, they've made it quite clear that, that they are not willing to accept or discuss anything that looks like a legally binding obligation to constrain their greenhouse gas emissions. And China, uh, for the Senate's information, is the second largest global emitter and its emissions are continu continuing to grow in line with its rapid economic growth and India is the fifth largest global emitter and they have refused to sign any legally binding obligations to control their emissions. And the model we look at is the Montreal Protocol which was signed uh, by a large number of countries around the world including developed countries and developing countries and which has had a very significant uh, impact on uh, controlling um, uh, gas emissions. The Montreal Protocol um, is, is significant because it is an international treaty that does cover most of the world. Kyoto is only signed on to by a very small group of nations. It doesn't really offer any real promise of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It will have an adverse uh, impact on Australia's economy were Australia to sign on. <coughs> and against that background, we have a situation in Australia where the Australian government, the Howard government, has a very outstanding record in terms of doing what it can to control greenhouse gases through the establishment of the world's first greenhouse office and a wide number of other uh, measures have been taken by this government. This government believes that greenhouse gases uh, are, are damaging to the world's climate. We believe that it's necessary that something to, should be done to control greenhouse emissions around the world. But we do not believe the Kyoto Protocol and Treaty is the answer to that problem. <coughs> As I've said, we look forward to the day when a treaty is developed through the United Nations process, hopefully, which most of the world's emitters will sign on to, which the United States will sign on to, the South American countries will sign on to, the Eastern European countries will sign on to, and the great emitters of Asia will sign on to. And when that kind of treaty is developed, then Australia will be more than happy to be a part of it. We're not happy to sign on to Kyoto because this treaty 
is flawed and it is wrong to sign a treaty which is not going to and has no hope of ever meeting the objectives which it has set out to do. So that is why the government has opposed this bill put forward by Senator Brown, who I may say <coughs> is no doubt, without any doubt, a very sincere proponent of uh, care for the environment and certainly is um, very fully aware of the dangers of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in terms of climate change. But I leave the Senate with the message and the thought that regardless of the fact that the Howard government is declining to sign on to the Kyoto Protocol, we are meeting our targets and this country quite genuinely, more than most in the world, is concerned about greenhouse gas emissions. And I simply report, re, would like to finally repeat the point I made earlier that the European nations, particularly the Germans, who are so critical of us for failing to meet uh, the, uh, <coughs> or failing to sign on to the Kyoto Protocol, are extremely hypocritical. As I said, only 12 of the 15 members of the European Union are actually meeting their Kyoto Protocol targets, and those that are are using nuclear energy for the very large part to, do, to meet those targets. So this is why the Howard government has no sense of regret in not signing the Kyoto Protocol. We are meeting our targets and we are protecting the interests of Australia and that is why we will oppose this bill. Thank you, Senator Eggleston. Senator Bartlett. Thank Senator you, Mr. Bartlett. Sorry, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, well, the, uh, the Howard government may have no sense of regret about not some supporting ratifying the Kyoto Protocol, but I can tell you that uh, future generations sure as hell will have regrets. Uh, in fact, current generations, uh, are <laughs> the current generation already has a lot of regret. Uh, this matter uh, may be uh, at the fag end of a uh, sitting session, and people may be thinking about uh, when they're going to be able to pack up and, and uh, leave the parliament for five or six weeks, uh, but for the Democrats it's a, a serious, a major and an urgent matter. Uh, it's a matter that, um, in terms of the broader issue of climate change and uh, greenhouse emissions, uh, that the Democrats, the Greens and others have been pressing uh, this parliament about and this government about for many years. Uh, to uh, great frustration at the lack of action or even a lack of recognition of the seriousness and the immediacy of the problem. Uh, and that is the real tragedy with the, uh, the lack of response from the Howard government in relation to ratification of the periodic protocol. Nobody pretends that ratifying the Kyoto Protocol or getting it in place and operational is going to solve the issue. Uh, but uh, as I think Senator Brown pointed out, uh, certainly this government has not come up with uh, another uh, approach that is going to have a better impact, uh, and it's certainly not going out there and playing a, a role as an international leader uh, in getting uh, a stronger approach from other nations towards the issue of climate change and global warming and, uh, and greenhouse emissions. The Democrats uh, strongly support ratifying Kyoto Protocol had been our position for some time. In August of 1999, nearly five years ago now, the Australian Democrats initiated a Senate inquiry into the adequacy of Australia's response to the challenges posed by climate change. The inquiry took 15 months to complete. The final report is over 500 pages long and contains some 106 recommendations. Uh, not surprisingly, they covered a wide range of issues related to this government's response to climate change, including the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, as Senator Brown just pointed out to me, despite uh, what Senator Eggleston repeatedly said that this government isn't going to sign on to the Protocol, uh, they actually have signed the Protocol quite some time ago. Uh, it's the failure to ratify, the failure to promote, uh, and the failure to uh, uh, endorse uh, moving forward. Uh, in this area. Uh, that is the problem. The Senate inquiry, the Democrat-initiated Senate inquiry I just referred to, 
recommended, among other things, that the Commonwealth Government take a leadership role in international negotiations on climate change with a view to moving through Australia's treaty-making process in a timely manner to achieve ratification of the Kyoto Protocol, including urging other countries to ratify, starting to work constructively with developing countries to encourage them to adopt binding targets as soon as possible and to encourage global emission constraints and ensuring adequate targets are in place beyond the first commitment period to stabilise atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases. That's uh, nearly four years since that recommendation was made, particularly in relation to uh, timely ratification and urging other countries to ratify and taking a leadership role. Uh, not only has the Commonwealth Government not acted on that, uh, if anything, it has gone in the other direction. And that uh, is something for which this government must stand condemned. The committee also recommended that a comprehensive domestic emissions trading system be incorporated as soon as possible and a greenhouse trigger be incorporated into the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Com Com Conservation Act. Uh, that was an area where there was quite a clear commitment from the then Environment Minister, Senator Hill, uh, to move down the path in incorporating a greenhouse trigger. Uh, another area, one amongst uh, what is uh, pretty much uh, a, uh, a list that's too long to keep track of, of broken promises. I, I noticed Senator Kemp coming in the chamber who repeatedly urges the Democrats to assist the government in keeping their promises. Uh, well, this is a promise the government hasn't kept to incorporate a greenhouse trigger in the EPBC. And uh, I'm being focused here, Senator Kemp. I'm being focused on your urging, and you could hardly, you could hardly complain uh, when we make a specific offer to you. The entire Senate. It's not just the Democrats keeping you honest. This is the entire Senate providing you with an opportunity to keep a promise, uh, but it continues to be ignored. And uh, an area where, uh, despite going through some initial motions. Uh, the government backed away from a, a simple measure. So every measure, possible measures, a range of different actions this government could have taken, including ratifying Kyoto Protocol, uh, they have ignored, they have backed away from. About the only effective action this government's taken, I say this government because there's certainly been other people in the community who have taken action, including in the business sector, uh, but in terms of this government not only not showing leadership but dragging the chain behind. Uh, everybody else. Uh, the only thing, and the thing the government likes to point to, is its greenhouse gas abatement program, which the Australian Democrats forced on the government. Um, and I have to say that uh, even in that area, uh, the amount of money that was provided and been spent and pledged by this government has clearly not been spent as effectively as it could have been and should have been. Uh, another area, frankly, uh, of another broken promise to add to the list that uh, I will keep reminding Senator Kemp about. The um, mandatory renewable energy targets, another initiative worthy of mention that sounds good in principle and uh, makes like some, some uh, good sounding uh, approaches on the surface, but uh, the way it's been structured is such uh, that it's little more than a PR initiative and uh, doesn't, seek, doesn't actually have the effect of uh, being a positive uh, impact on moving to renewable energy. So there's the failures in terms of renewable energies, the failure to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, a failure to introduce an emissions trading scheme, indeed going not only not introducing but going as far as to dismantle the emissions trading research section of the Australian Greenhouse Office. It's the failure to introduce a greenhouse trigger under the EPBC Act, the failure to introduce mandatory emissions reduction targets for coal-fired power stations a withdrawal of funding to the CRC for renewable energy and, uh, as has already been mentioned I think, by Senator Wong, uh, a gross underspending of the money originally allocated to uh, the MBE and safeguarding the future packages, uh, an absolutely disgraceful failure to ensure halting of land clearing in Queensland, uh, an action that would have resulted in the abatement of about 25 million tonnes of CO2 saving an enormous amount of biodiversity and assisting a whole lot of other environmental gains, but even from an emissions point of view, a major, major gain that would have occurred that was continually halted and, and uh, prevented uh, by the Howard government. It's a huge list of failures, and it has made us 
not an international leader but an international pariah on climate change issues. It's placed us behind the rest of the developed world on the implementation of effective measures and behind the developed world in terms of trying to develop a momentum for positive change. The uh, European Commission Environment Director Timo Mikela uh, recently uh, specifically criticised the Howard government for its failure to engage with Europe on climate change issues and its decisions to abandon research into emissions trading. And this is going to leave Australia behind the pack economically as well. It's a government that likes to talk about engaging internationally, the value of trade, the jobs in trade internationally, uh, but in a key area of staying up with the game, uh, we've actually fallen behind the pack. The European Union has an emissions trading system that's going to commence from the 1st of January next year. Paper pulp, cement, ferrous metals, electricity generation and oil refinery industries will progressively require emissions reductions of 50 per cent of current levels by 2012. Industries that exceed their annual targets will pay a penalty, a set penalty per tonne of CO2 over those targets or can buy tradable credits uh, or invest in renewable energy. Linking legislation means that companies such as Japan and Canada can comply by investing in Annex B countries, provided they have ratified the Kyoto Protocols, but Australian companies will miss out on this opportunity. This government is not only uh, condemning Australia and the world to uh, a higher risk of damage from cli climate change, it is leaving Australian companies out of investment opportunities, out of business and economic opportunities. Uh, it is absolutely grotesque short-sightedness on all levels, and it's hard not to think that it's in part driven by uh, this government's absolute obsession with uh, towing the line of the US agenda on any foreign policy issue of concern. It's not just the Democrats saying this. The, ev I mean, the evidence is, is so enormous. I mean, even the, the coal industry themselves are recognising that emission reductions have to occur. Um, this government is happy to let all of those industries do the running on this in the way that suits their own interests. They won't do anything to take leadership and this, a simple thing, simple thing like ratifying the protocol. Just yesterday, the ACT State of the Environment report indicated that effects of climate change were already being felt, and that could in include effects such as placing significant pressure on Canberra's water supply. And of all of us, uh, even those of us who are only in Canberra uh, as uh, regular visitors to Parliament House, know the water problems in Canberra. My own state of Queensland and a major economic and environmental asset. Queensland, the Barrier Reef, is under significant threat from climate change. On the 30th of March, the uh, Rainforest CRC released a report showing climate change would wipe out the vast majority of our rainforest species and increase the prevalence of drought and the risk of bushfires and tropical diseases. On the 29th of March, the CSIRO released figures showing 18.7 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide were released into the atmosphere in 2002. 17.1 uh, in 2003, which compares to the average in the last 10 years of only 13.3, a huge jump. On the 28th, the day before, the Sunday Age reported that Australia, along with several other developed nations, agreed to delay the phase out uh, of methyl bromide, which uh, is not only a poisonous fertiliser that destroys the ozone layer, but uh, it contributes to the greenhouse effect. Uh, on the 22nd, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration had a report showing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere had reached record high levels and was increasing at an accelerated rate. Uh, another report on the 22nd indicated Australia has the second highest per capita rate of greenhouse emissions in the world. On the 19th of last month, several insurance companies released figures showing the alarming increase in the rate and costs associated with natural disasters and identified climate change as a key threat. On the 12th, the report was released indicating the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere was resulting in measurable changes in the Amazon rainforest. On the 11th, we had a CSIRO scientist indicating climate change could disrupt oceanic currents. Uh, the 11th also saw the introduction of binding Kyoto emission reduction targets in the European Union that I've just highlighted. Uh, I could go on. Uh, and I have a strong wish to go on, but uh, recognising the, uh, the time.
I shan't. I do urge people who are interested to look at all the other questions, speeches, motions that have been put in this place by many senators urging action on this area. Uh, the committee reports, not just the, uh, the large uh, report, I think it was titled The Heat Is On, that was released in 2000. Uh, there's uh, ample, overwhelming evidence. There's endless amounts of effort put by senators from a range of parties, a range of states, trying to get more action on this issue. Uh, this legislation is a simple step that uh, can nonetheless make a significant difference as to the Howard government's great discredit uh, and, I believe, an area where uh, historically they will be shown to have been one of their areas of greatest failure is uh, not doing the simple step of ratifying the protocol, partly because of the benefit it would have in itself, but also because of that, that area and that hard to measure but very clearly significant benefit of showing international leadership, of showing we're taking it seriously and it's something that we're going to do everything we can to, uh, to tackle uh, and prevent the massive economic and environmental damage that would, will come will come from inaction and uh, will come in clear ways that all of us here will will see uh, it's not something of uh, that we don't have to worry about that's going to be a couple of lifetimes away it's not even our, our grandchildren or children's lifetimes it's our own lifetimes we'll see the impacts and uh, history will condemn us for ignoring the blatant warnings uh, that we've had for quite a number of years now thank you senator bartlett uh the question is that the bill will now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Kent say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Brown, do you wish to move the third reading? Yes, I do. <laughs> I so move. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Kent say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to ratify the Kyoto Protocol to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and for related purposes. Seven, Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 2, 2003, 2004 and two Associated Bills, second reading adjourned debate. Senator Carr. Yes, uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, I uh, would like to talk about the uh, report of the Australian parliamentary delegation to Syria, Lebanon and Israel, the 9th to the 21st of November 2003, which was tabled last uh, week uh, at the last 47 seconds of proceedings, and there was not an opportunity to actually speak to this report. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the gracious uh, uh, and generous remarks that uh, the chairman, uh, the, uh, the delegation leader, Senator Macdonald, has put in the report concerning myself. This is the second Australian parliamentary delegation in the Middle East that I've had the privilege of participating in. It's given me an opportunity to, de to observe the developments in that region and the relationship between the nations of the region over the time from 1999 to 2003. The mo this most recent delegation uh, visited three countries, that's Syria, Lebanon and Israel, plus the Palestinian Authority areas. And despite their geographical proximity, I found these uh, experiences uh, uh, allowed me the opportunity to examine four very different societies. Such a visit on behalf of the Australian Parliament are important. They are to in uh, provide an opportunity to build and maintain relationships which, in my opinion, should be given greater attention. Many Australians were born in this region. Many still have relatives who live there. These Australians, and many more besides, maintain a keen interest in the welfare and the development of Syria, Lebanon and Is or Israel, and of course in the welfare of the Palestinian people. The world at large maintains a keen interest in the relationships between these nations, which remain tense and, of course, uh, very complex. Australia has much to offer all three nations, much to gain uh, in terms of the relationships with them as well. There are valuable trade, research and infrastructure development relationships that already exist between Australia and each of these three nations, but there is ample scope for further development. Syria is a particular example. The delegation 
has recommended that the Australian government consider reopening its embassy in Damascus after closing it in 1999. I am pleased to see that this recommendation is indeed uh, under active consideration by the Foreign Minister and according to last weekend's newspapers. Last Saturday's Australian reported that Syria is appealing to Australia to assist in its repair or to assist in to repair its relationship with the United States. This is certainly consistent with the position put to our delegation some four months ago. The United States has imposed a diplomatic freeze on Syria and is systematically isolating that nation as part of what it sees as its campaign against rogue nations. And I use that term in inverted commas. Uh, and of course, there's nations that uh, are asserted uh, harbours of terrorism. However, if Australia wishes to encourage the development of a modern and open society in nations such as Syria, we have an important role to play in assisting rather than isolating such countries. Syria is a secular state and has, by my observations, undertaken tentative steps towards greater political freedoms and, uh, and uh, human rights improvements. Certainly serious treatment of its Palestinian community is probably the most compassionate of any nation in the region. Syria's secular government places a great deal of emphasis on religious tolerance and social harmony. Although the constitution requires that the president be a Muslim, it does not make Islam the state religion and religious freedom is provided for. There is a flourishing Christian community operating within that country, which is unusual in uh, many, many other parts of, the, of that particular region. In our, in our discussions, there are con there's continual relevance uh, to the need to and they emphasise this in terms of the government's response to current developments, they continually emphasised the need to avoid extremism. Syria, the Syrian government has emphasised socialism and secular Arabism and has sought to build a, a na national rather than religious or ethnic allegiances. Syria is, we must emphasise this, in desperate need of investment and trade to help it modernise its heavily run down infrastructure. This is partly due to an overinvestment in the machinery of war. And anything Australia can do to help Syria and Israel reach a peaceful solution to the dispute over the Golan Heights would assist both nations in this regard. We could certainly do more to assist Syria through greater trade relations and upgrade our diplomatic contact. With trade between Australia and Syria running at only 24 million, 24 million in 2002-2003, we have a mutual interest in developing deeper ties, particularly in the export of Australian educational services and other goods and expertise. A second recommendation in our report is that Australia sends a trade delegation to Syria to expand these ties. I am encouraged by the bipartisan interest in Syria's appeal to Australia for assistance, especially amongst members of our delegation. And I noted that the delegation leader, Senator Macdonald, uh, was misquoted in the Australian report of last Saturday. He did not actually call Syria a bastard state for nearly 40 years, but a Ba'ath state. He was uh, making the point, as I have, that Syria is a secular <coughs> nation, an Arab nation, and thus one which deserves support in its bid to modernise and play a role in the region and in the international community. As I mentioned a few moments ago, we should acknowledge that Syria has treated its Palestinian population with a degree of respect and dignity, something which some of its neighbours could take heed of. The Palestinian refugees have a right to own property, to work, in short, to do all full citizens can except vote. Syria and Lebanon differ significantly in the way they have dealt with their Palestinian refugee populations. And all the, although the two nations share a similar geography and history and language, in Lebanon we saw further evidence of the extensive uh, rebuild of uh, Beirut. Infrastructure development in the regional areas outside the capital is not progressing, however, at the same rate as is occurring within the Beirut area. Syrian influence on Lebanon remains strong, and Syria continues to maintain a considerable security and intelligence presence in the country. And despite its uh, modernity and its uh, vibrance, uh, I think Lebanon still faces the struggle to rebuild the, its infrastructure and services. It faces the double burden of a large public debt and high unemployment. Like its neighbours, Lebanon would benefit from lasting regional security. Its particular confessional system makes politics in uh, Lebanon particularly interested, interesting, and given that the 
sense, the, the census on which Syrian confessional divisions occur was in fact based on the census taken in 1932, and uh, at that, even at that time was said to have uh, not been a an strictly accurate reflection of the population at that time, it is uh, little wonder that the political divide within Syria, within uh, Lebanon, remains so delicate. There is no doubt, on the other hand, that in the economy of Israel has suffered because of the security situation. Tourism has dropped by 90 per cent as a result of the intifada. Building and uh, construction has suffered a, a major uh, downturn and an increase in defence and security spending has put a huge strain on the public sector. In 2002, Israel spent some 16 per cent of its GDP on defence. This has a serious impact on the uh, state's ability to pay its own public servants, its, its, its teachers, its healthcare workers. And with economic activity severely curtailed by the security situation, unemployment is growing rapidly. War weariness is not just about people fearing for their lives and, and their safety. And although this is, of course, a very real fear for many people in, uh, in, in Israel, it's also about having to deal with the terrible impact of economic activity on jobs and on services on, a, on the very basis of daily life for many Israelis. Living standards have fallen dramatically. Average income has fallen from something like $18,000 per annum down to $14,000 per annum. Now, of course, this compares with the, per, uh, annu the annual income for the Palestinian, on average, of $800 per annum. And one can only begin to uh, imagine the extraordinary situation in terms of the economic position of the Palestinians and in the context of uh, recent uh, uh, activities there. It is clear, however, in my judgment, that there must be a just resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's clearer than ever that such a resolution will never be found through military means. This is a view that was shared by some of the most experienced strategists within Israel itself. In the months before our delegation's visit, the Army Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General Moshe Yuron, was quoted in the press as saying that the network of restrictions placed on the Palestinian population in the occupied territories has proved counterproductive and was breeding greater militancy. And just prior to our arrival in Israel, the four former heads of Shin Bet's security service also spoke out, saying that a political rather than a military solution was needed urgently. Avram Shalom, who headed the security service from 1980 to 1986, told the Israel's largest circulation Hebrew daily that, and I quote, we must once and for all admit that there is another side, that it has feelings and it is suffering, and that we are behaving disgracefully. We have turned into a people of petty fighters using the wrong tools. Uh, Camille Gillon, who ran uh, Shin Bet from 1995 to 1996, said that he and his colleagues had agreed to an interview with the newspaper, and I quote again, out of serious concern for the conditions of the State of Israel. Major General uh, Amir Erlon, who headed the agency from 1996 to 2000, is a co-author of a peace petition signed by tens of thousands of Israelis and Palestinians. Yorok Peri, whose term as the security chief between 1988 and 1995, covered the first Palestinian intifada, that is the period covering the first Palestinian intifada, said, and I quote, if something doesn't happen here, we will continue to live by the sword. We will continue to wallow in the mud and we will continue to destroy ourselves. Now, these four men uh, said that Israel should be prepared to initiate a peace process unilaterally rather than wait for the Palestinians to bring a halt to terrorism, which, of course, is the current uh, Prime Minister Sharon's overriding prerequisite for negotiations. The former security chiefs were critical of the Sharon government's efforts to sideline Yasser Arafat and called the Jewish settlements that have proliferated across the West Bank and the Gaza Strip as among the greatest obstacles to peace. They have also condemned the 400-mile um, fence, wall, barrier, complex, whatever you choose, that Israel is erecting around the, the heart of the West Bank. And I quote again, it creates hatred, Mr Shalom said. It expropriates lands and annexes hundreds of thousands of Palestinians to the state of Israel. The result is that the fence achieves the exact opposite of what was intended. 
Terror is not thwarted with bombs or helicopters, said Mr. Sharon. Mr. Gillion said the problem is, and I quote again, that the problem is that the political agenda has become solely a security agenda. It only deals with the question of how to prevent the next terror attack, not the question of how it is at the all possible to pull ourselves out of the mess that we are in today. Now I quote these people to demonstrate that it's not just starry-eyed idealists who say there are such things. These are hard-headed, hardened professionals. These are all very proud Israelis. I quote these people to show that to criticise the approach to security of the current Sharon government is not by any means the same as opposing the right of Israel to exist or indeed to defend itself. Rather, it's a serious matter for those who care deeply and passionately about the welfare of the State of Israel and the Israeli people. <coughs> to care about the rights and dignity of the Palestinian people is also not inconsistent with the support for a safe and healthy Israeli nation. I count myself as one who supports both a political solution and the right of Israel and the Palestinian people to coexist peacefully in their own neighbouring states. And I was disappointed, therefore, that the Australian parliamentary delegation had little opportunity to exchange views with our Israeli government hosts. I felt that our capacity to understand the complexities of the situation and our right to a differing viewpoint was somewhat underestimated at a number of our meetings. We were, however, also privileged to meet with a number of very impressive, courageous and articulate political leaders who are indeed committed to pursuing a political solution to the conflict. There are many senior political figures in Israel who are push pushing ahead with trying to find a political solution. I point in particular to, to the Geneva Peace Accords, a brave attempt by Israelis and Palestinians to keep the path to peaceful negotiations open. Now, some people call these naive. But by judging and the, uh, by the calibre of the people on both sides, this is a serious and realistic attempt to find a way through the impasse, to strive for a peaceful settlement, for a circuit breaker in the ever-escalating cycle of violence, to want to settle rather than uh, uh, rather more blood, uh, with, uh, shed more blood to me, is the epitome of re realism, not idealism. Our delegation met with some of the key people involving the Geneva discussions including the former Labor uh, MP, uh, the uh, member of the Knesset, uh, Yossi Berlin, the former minister uh, and professor Yuri Tamir, uh, who was also a member of the Knesset, Mr Aquara Fares, Minister for State and member of the Palestinian Legislative Council, that is the PLC, Mr Mohammed Mahurani, another member of the PLC. The Geneva Initiative addresses several of the most vexed issues including the status of Jerusalem and the fate of the Palestinian refugees. A political solution must acknowledge the inevitability of Palestinian and Israeli interdependence. It must be based on building a viable two-state solution, founded upon mutual respect. Only when serious efforts to find that political solution are underway will there be an opportunity to take away the excuse for yet another cycle of violence. And so with that, I welcome the statement yesterday by the Palestinian Prime Minister, uh, Mohammed Al-Khuri, uh, condemning the suicide bombers as an obstacle to uh, the, the uh, peaceful resolution or the peace process. And he, in fact, said that there ought not be a campaign of bombing to avenge the assassination of uh, Sheikh Yassin. I look forward to the change in attitude, however, from the Israeli government on the question of resuming the peace process. Now, if I might just quote at this uh, point the, an old biblical verse. Um, you'll note from time to time in my speeches I refer to the Bible, not, uh, not being a, a great uh, proponent of such a document, but I do think it has a lot to, to offer. It's, I quote an old biblical verse which is also reflects very much Jewish philosophy. And that is, and I quote again, to everything there is a season and then there's a time for every purpose, a time to cast away stones a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to love and a time to hate, and a time of war and a time of peace. The time to hate and the time for war are surely over. The time has come for the cycle of violence to be broken and the Australian government should be doing all that it can to lend its assistance. And I hope our brief visit can contribute in some way to informing those, uh, those efforts. I wish to conclude by thanking the parliamentary relations officer and the, uh, the office itself and the coordinating arrangements, especially those 
undertaken by Joe and Tana, the staff of the Australian embassies in Egypt and Syria, Lebanon and Israel, and those accredited to the Palestinian Authority. I'd also like to uh, thank um, the Australian Federal Police for their invaluable close protection work, which were provided to us on these occasions. Well, I might just say this, though. I think it's appalling that officers of the Australian Federal Police can be sent out to the Middle East to guard parliamentarians and then be asked to travel on an economy ticket. And furthermore, uh, when, when all other officers, as I understand it, are entitled to, over those distance to at least travel at a, and re, a, a little slightly better comfort. I find it extraordinary that when I approach Qantas to try to provide assistance to our federal officer on the way back home, that uh, I was advised that uh, no assistance could possibly be lent. I think that's something that the government should be having a look at. If people are asked to guard members of this parliament on international trips to the other side of the world, then I think they're entitled to at least travel with a little degree of comfort in that. Now, I may also acknowledge that the host parliaments of the generous hospitality that were extended to the delegations and to the parliamentarians and the political leaders, the local businesses and the community leaders and academics who so generously shared their time, their ideas and their insights with us. Uh, Senator Murray. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And, uh, before I commence my remarks, I might make the, uh, the remark, having some experience in, in matters of, uh, of war and security, uh, that it strikes me as it's a bit odd uh, that the person guarding you would be uh, 50 metres away from you uh, in the aeroplane, which uh, I think adds uh, a point to uh, what Senator Carl was saying. Uh, aeroplanes are not always safe these days. I think if you're going to be guarded, they need to be a lot closer than they, I hear that uh, they are. And with that uh, remark stimulated by um, Senator Carr's uh, thoughts, uh, I will turn to the appropriation bills before us. Uh, these bills are largely uncontroversial as they approve a range of government commitments since the budget in May last year. As uh, hopefully all Senator colleagues are aware, the Democrats were founded with a principle that we will not block government supply for the ordinary services of government and we pledge ourselves not to do so. I fear that one day a Labour government will be faced by a combination of Liberals and Greens that would share only one thing in common. They will vote together to block supply of the ordinary services of government. And recently uh, there was a vote in this chamber uh, to indicate where people stood on that and it was notable that on one of the few occasions the Australian Greens sat with the uh, government, they sat together on the principle uh, that they would vote together to block supply. The Democrats will not do that. Turning to the appropriations bills, the number three bill appropriates $945 million for government functions, including $236 million for peacekeeping in the Solomon Islands, $86 million for drought assistance, $75 million of indexation adjustments for the Defence Department, $65 million for the Australian Federal Peace Police in Papua New Guinea, $39 million for the, for the uh, Medicare Plus package, and $19 million for Australia's contribution payments to various international organisations. The number four bill is primarily directed towards payments for states and territories. It includes a further $188 million for drought assistance and $37 million for the Tough on Drugs initiative. It also includes equity injections of $47 million and $37 million for the Australian Federal Police and the Australian Customs Service, respectively. As this is the last sitting day before the budget, I thought it might be worthwhile for me briefly to, uh, to tell you uh, what uh, views the, government, uh, the Democrats have with respect to some of the various tax loopholes that we would like closed. We will be releasing some detailed budget suggestions later this month. As always, uh, we will try and be economically, socially and environmentally responsible all our spend, spending measures uh, are fully costed, but with our resources we do lack uh, the modelling capabilities uh, of government. 
In developing our policies, uh, we listen to numerous business organisations, community groups, uh, and of course, preeminently, the Australian people. Last night, I was otherwise engaged and was unfortunately unable to attend a function held by the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Contrary to their general reputation, I understand uh, they had a lot of fun. However, I did obtain some polling statistics that the accountants and uh, the Roy Morgan organisation provided last night. In response to the question whether more public funds should be spent on health, 94% responded with either agree or strongly agree. Similarly, when asked whether more public funds should be spent on education, 94% of respondents uh, said agree. So does this mean that Australians want to pay more tax for health and education? Well, I've never seen a survey saying the majority of Australians want to pay more tax. In fact, 55% of those surveyed thought that the top tax rate of 47% for those earning over $62,500 was too high. Only 23% of respondents wanted the top rate tax rate to be higher. So 94% of Australians want more public funds for health and education, but only 23% want the top tax rate increased. Is this an irre irre irreconcilable inconsistency? I would say not. And I would say not because the government can raise much more revenue and cut income tax rates if it chooses to close some loopholes and end some tax concessions. Just dealing with a few. The Democrats have long advocated broadening the tax base. Like John Rolfe, we'd like to remove the excessive tax concessions for company cars. This would raise up to $1 billion a year and would have as a byproduct the promotion of cleaner, more sustainable uh, transport systems for our major cities. We'd like the government to implement the Rolfe Review of Business Taxes recommendation that trusts be taxed as companies that all business activity be taxed equivalently regardless of the entity structure. This would improve the integrity of Australia's tax system and be a positive first step in tackling the prevalent culture of tax avoidance. Another $1.2 billion or thereabouts could be raised by reforming negative gearing. We've ad advocated this position for a decade, increasingly stridently, uh, over the last five years. At first, we were ignored, and now there is a deluge of support. It's not only the Democrats that are advocating uh, this reform, but groups as diverse as ACOS, the Reserve Bank, and the Centre for Independent Studies have all pointed out that negative gearing, the generous depreciation rules, and the capital gains tax concessions have combined to create an investment-driven housing bu bubble, they've distorted the economy and minimised tax unfairly. The Economist magazine recently described the Australian economy as being similar to that of the Americans before the dot-com bubble burst, and largely because of the terrible mistake the government made in not following uh, international precedents by ensuring that negative gearing is properly restrained. Now this issue needs to be addressed. Reforms to the tax treatment of negative gearing and other property concessions would be economically responsible. This is important, but even more importantly, by proposing changes such as this, the Democrats are giving the Australian people what they really want. And that brings me full circle back to those uh, polling figures. We can increase funding for health and education without increasing taxes if the government will attack waste and expenditure and uh, drastically reduce um, unnecessary, unwarranted and unfair tax concessions. To use the Treasurer's mantra at the time of the new tax system, what we need to do, sorry, the new business tax system, what we need to do is broaden the base so that we can lower the rates. Uh, Mr. Senator Marshall. <coughs> President, I rise to speak on the appropriation bills to bring to the Senate's attention the, the fiscal impact of the casualisation of the Australian workforce on the Australian economy. Um, Mr. Acting Deputy President, 
The permanent casual may be a contradiction in terms. However, over the past two decades, it has become an entrenched part of Australian culture, a sort of Australianism. It's an Australianism that is not an attractive part of our culture and requires a progressive and proactive response from the Australian Parliament. Currently in Australia, there are 2.2 million casual workers, and of those, about 60 per cent, or 1.3 million, are employed on a regular basis for many years, not months, as opposed to those casuals who are employed in what would be regarded as true casual employment, that being on a seasonal or a irregular basis. Since the election of the Howard government, we have witnessed the growth of half a million casual jobs in the Australian economy, one of the fastest growth rates of casualisation in the Western world. Whilst the Treasurer and Prime Minister would have us believe the rich are getting richer but the poor aren't getting poorer, statistics tell a different story when we consider that 90 per cent of the net new jobs created during the 1990s paid less than $26,000 per annum and 48 per cent of jobs created paid less than $15,600 per annum. During this time, the Australian economy has witnessed a 30 per cent growth in casual employment with only a 10 per cent growth in full-time employment. One in four Australians are currently employed as casuals within the workforce. In various regional centres across Australia, there is evidence to suggest that casual employment has accounted for virtually all the growth in wage and salary employment over the last decade. Advocates of casual employment will suggest and demand that supply are important, important factors. Uh, sorry, will suggest that demand and supply are important factors to consider when evaluating the reason for this rapid rise in casualisation within the Australian workforce. But of equal importance are the institutional factors, such as the regulatory regime that governs workplace relations. Conservative governments at a federal and state level in recent years have taken an axe to workers' rights within the regulatory regime that governs workplace relations. They claim to have deregulated industrial relations policy. However, I would argue that rather than deregulating industrial relations, conservative governments have regulated it in favour of one party, that being the employer. The conservatives have stripped away many awards and with them many rights. Until recently, many Victorians have had to endure working in a system where there was no award coverage for almost a decade following Jeff Kennett's decision to abolish Victorian state awards in 1993. With the election of the Howard government in 1996, Kennett very quickly referred industrial relations powers to the Commonwealth, but with the exclusion that these workers could not have coverage under federal awards. Predominantly, these workers were non-unionised and suffered significantly under the industrial relations regime. Due to the actions of the Brax government and its ability to utilise leverage over the federal government, Victorian workers previously not covered by an award will once again be covered following the passage of the Improved Protection for Victorian Workers Bill. It is this government's policy of stripping away awards and workers' rights that has led to an environment conducive to a rapid growth in casualisation in recent years, and the Howard government has not finished yet, with government policy being to prohibit the ability of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission to classify casuals in an industry award. Coalition government policy seeks to prohibit decisions by the Australian Industrial Relations Commission, such as that taken in the Metals Casual Award case. In the Metals Casual Award case, the Australian Industrial Relations Commission determined that the award would be varied such that an employee employed on a regular and systematic basis for a sequence of periods of six months shall thereafter have the right to elect to have his or her ongoing contract of employment converted to full-time or part-time employment, thereby achieving the rights and conditions that come along with that classification. The Howard government does not hide its displeasure of decisions determined by the Australian Industrial Relations Commission and will once again seek to muzzle the Australian Industrial Relations Commission and seek to prevent progressive decisions such as that reached in the Metals Award case and continue to force workers to remain in long-term casual employment. The concern that the Labor Party has with the explosive growth in casualisation amongst the Australian workforce is that workers employed as, as long-term or permanent casuals are denied basic working conditions which they would normally receive, conditions such as sick pay, holiday pay and overtime loadings. Most casuals have worked for at least a year with the one employer but are not entitled to a single day's paid holiday. 
The government's acceptance of permanent casuals in the workforce represents a conservative ideal that the contribution of one worker is worth less to the final outcome of production than another worker contributing equal effort towards that production. We reject that ideal and recommit that the Labor Party has always believed in the principle that an equal day's work means an equal day's pay, and we are developing progressive policy that will institute rights such as holiday pay, sick leave and other entitlements for casual workers. Under the platform developed at the recent ALP National Conference, the Labor Party will implement policy that will allow many of Australia's 2.2 million casual workers to convert to permanent part-time work and ensure that they are entitled rights such as holiday leave, sick leave, currently not available to casuals within the workforce. Labor is concerned that the massive growth of the casual workforce is due to a policy used by employers to avoid paying proper entitlements and undervalue the contribution casual employees add towards the production of goods and services. <coughs> Labor understands that a lot of casual workers would appreciate the ability to convert to permanent part-time work but are, fear are fearful that the employer will sack them. Labor's proposed changes would allow the Industrial Relations Commission to alter awards in a manner that would enable casual employees to convert to permanent part-time work without losing their employment as a consequence. Labor believes that casual, full-time and part-time work needs to be more clearly defined to help casuals who are, in effect, full-time or part-time workers to obtain their entitlements of permanent employment if they so desire. Labor's proposed policy to work towards casual employees is in addition to other industrial relations changes Labor would implement, such as restoring the powers of the Industrial Relations Commission to arbitrate in disputes where access to conciliation is currently restricted, abolish Australian workplace agreements, abolish the Office of the Employment Advocate, enshrine a minimum standard of 14 weeks paid maternity leave and ensure that a mother was entitled to return to work on a part-time basis after having a baby. The progressive and proactive industrial relations policy that Labor will promote at the forthcoming election represents a broader concern over the impact with which the Conservatives' industrial relations policies is having on the social fabric of our society, particularly in relation to casuals within the workforce. A recently tabled report by the Senate Community Affairs References Committee into the causes of poverty, a hand up, not a hand out, renewing the fight against poverty, found that 3.5 million people in Australia were living in poverty and the dramatic increase in casual work has been blamed for much of the growth in poverty. The Senate Committee's report on its inquiry into poverty and financial hardship has demonstrated that in Australia a new class of the workforce is developing, that being the working poor, and a con contribution towards the development of the working poor is a growth of casualisation. The report stated, and I quote, the prevalence of working poor households in poverty is due simply to low wage employment. Driving this change has been been a casualisation of the workforce in the last two decades and a more recent weakening of the industrial relations systems. The report went on to note that between August 1988 and 2002, total employment of casual workers in Australia increased by 87.4 per cent. The proportion of the population working full-time in Australia is about the same as in the depths of the early 1990s recession. An increasing reliance on casual employment to receive a wage is increasing the gap between the house of haves and the house of have-nots, despite claims by the Prime Minister that the poor aren't getting poorer. Evidence from the report demonstrates casual workers struggle to get home loans, rarely having any savings, get no sick leave and find it nearly impossible to prepare for retirement in old age. Of the two million people currently employed as casuals, one million are being paid less than $15 per hour. Casual workers fortunate enough to be offered a housing loan are often forced onto low documentation loans, which are offered at higher interest rates or for smaller amounts. If a loan is available, it often restricts casuals to low-cost housing, confining people to poorer suburbs and creates two sets of Australians, the haves and the have-nots. A paradox exists in Australia given that whilst the economy has been experiencing substa substantial growth and progress, poverty is becoming more entrenched. 
The paradox of progress and poverty was observed by Henry George at the turn of the 20th century, and it is remarkable how his observations still ring true today. Amongst his ob observations, Henry George observed that, and I quote, just as closer settlement and a more intimate connection with the rest of the world and greater utilisation of labour-saving machinery make possible greater economies in production and exchange, and wealth in consequence increases, not merely in the aggregate but in proportion to population, so does poverty take a darker aspect. Some get infinitely better and easier living, but others find it hard to get a living at all. George went on to state that this association of poverty with progress is the great enigma of our times. I suggest that this enigma still holds true today, a century on. The Labor Party understands the need to formulate policy that is targeted at eliminating the cause of poverty in our society and promoting policy that will see an increase in the rights of casual workers. The Senate inquiry report confirmed what Labor suspected that there is a link between casualisation and poverty, and Labor has initiated policy that I have outlined today aimed at breaking this link. I thank the Senate. One thing that will certainly benefit, um, I'm sure, the Australian economy in a major way across the board is the, the, uh, the free trade agreement with the United States, which is going to offer wide benefits uh, to this country in many ways, uh, not only in terms of... Bigger pardon? Well, we probably do need time, but I'm sure the time will show that with the increased access that Australian goods will have to the United States market uh, in agriculture, that uh, our access to the American government's procurement programs and the access of Australian goods in general to the United States market, which is the biggest market in the world, we will see a great boom in the Australian economy, uh, riding on the back of the signing of this free trade agreement. And there's no doubt at all in my mind that um, this free trade agreement between Australia and the United States, which is the first time the United States has signed a free trade agreement with a major first world country, uh, will set uh, a standard which uh, the rest of the world will, uh, will follow because um, it offers um, what uh, most of the countries in the Western world have been following for an, obje an objective, the achievement of obje an objective they've been following in economic terms for many years and that is the liberalisation of the international market. And the liberalisation of the international market is certainly going to mean that uh, countries around the world um, benefit from freer trade and access to markets that they may not have otherwise been able to get into. <coughs> One of the, uh, the, the most protected markets, of course, is that of the European Union, um, which, uh, after its formation, built a tariff wall around itself uh, and uh, countries like Australia, which uh, under the old system of British Empire preferences had access to the British market, found that uh, they had no longer the same kind of access to the UK uh, once the UK joined the common market. And the Europeans um, heavily subsidise their agricultural produce and they do so because it is said they've had the experience of going through two world wars in the last century and uh, they needed to ensure that uh, Europe was able to feed itself and Europe didn't have to depend upon the arrival of food um, from overseas countries to feed the European population. And for that reason the Europeans developed a, uh, a protectionist barrier and very heavily subsidised <coughs> their own farmers so that um, Farmers in countries like Germany and France especially found that um, their, their properties became very valuable because they were paid so much for their produce and in some cases paid uh, exorbitant amounts which um, really distorted patterns of world trade. But unfortunately the Europeans while developing their own agricultural sector um, found uh, the subsidies 
produced such an abundance of produce that um, they had a problem, the, the, the mountain of butter as it was called. And the Europeans uh, rather um, irresponsibly began dumping their excess produce um, on other countries, uh, in other countries around the world and cut out the markets of many smaller developing countries so that the economies of these smaller developing countries were disadvantaged because the Europeans undercut them at every opportunity. And uh, that uh, caused uh, a great economic hardship and the loss of uh, agricultural sectors in many third world countries. One of the, um, one of the uh, objects of Australian uh, policy in terms of agriculture for a very long time has been to get better access to the European Union and to generally support the idea of freer international trade. And to that end, um, the Australian government called a conference um, in Cairns, which uh, uh, was a conference of very largely agricultural producing countries, and uh, that group formed a lobby group, which became known as the Cairns Group, and sought to achieve a lowering of uh, European tariffs in particular, and better access of produce from countries like Australia and some of the South American countries to the European Uni Union or the common market as it was at that stage. And of course there's a natural synergy, no doubt, between the um, highly developed uh, and sophisticated continent of Europe and its market and countries um, who are largely resource and uh, agricultural producers. And it makes more sense in the world to have a balance between uh, the countries which produce manufacturing goods and the countries that produce uh, um, commodity outputs to have a free trade be, or freer level of trade uh, between uh, the two. Australia and its uh, relationships with China has uh, in recent years developed that sort of balance and synergistic relationship where we very largely sell um, our commodities into the Chinese market. We sell um, not only iron ore but also coal and increasingly large amounts of gas uh, which provide energy to the growing industrial base of the Chinese economy and um, of course we sell agricult agricultural products as well but in return the Chinese export manufactured goods to us and they um, are successful in doing this because of course labour costs in China tend to be lower than they are in Australia and because a lot of the manufacturing plants which are being developed in China have modern technology, which means computerisation, their production costs overall are quite low. And the general idea of um, locating um, production for industrial products in uh, third world countries where labour costs are low has been an idea that's been around uh, uh, for some time and it's called, um, it's described as the new international division of labour because um, it suits uh, some of these great manufacturing multinational com companies to manuf manufacture their goods in components and have those components assembled in say countries like Indonesia and Malaysia where labour costs are lower. Malaysia is an interesting example because of course the Malaysian economy has developed and as the, the Malaysian economy has developed, wages have gone up and so there's less of this component uh, production done in Malaysia than was done in the past and more in countries like Indonesia and Vietnam where costs continue to be low. And these manufactured goods are then um, exported from these third world countries to um, countries in the developed world such as Australia, Canada, the United States and the European countries where they, they sell well because the, the total cost of production, even with the cost of transporting these often white goods as well as radios and so on, electronic goods, uh, ends up being cheaper 
than the products that are ma manufactured in these highly industrialised countries themselves. Australia um, has pursued its, um, its role as a commodity producing country since uh, the time of uh, uh, first settlement, really. But we have sought in more recent years to shift the balance away from exporting minerals and agricultural product, products to being a more clever economy and developing services such as financial services, uh, information technology and management services and governance services. And uh, last year, about this time of the year, I went to Eastern Europe and I with a trade, uh, with the trade subcommittee of the Joint Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee, and it was very, very interesting to find that in countries like Poland, and I think in Czechoslovakia, the uh, the banking system, for example, ran on um, software and uh, computer programs uh, produced by Australian industry, so that. In the past in these countries, which under the communist regimes sort of stood still in the late 1940s effectively, um, um, their banking services, for example, were very far behind those in the West and they didn't have sophisticated services such as ATMs, which uh, we have now become very accustomed to. And Australian technology was put in to enable services like ATMs and computerised records to be available in any branch, in any bank. In Poland, if you went to the bank uh, five or ten years ago, it was like going to the bank must have been in the, the 1940s or 50s in Australia, where the only accounts were paper accounts kept in that a bank. There, were no, uh, me there was no means of uh, accessing records from other banks, uh, branches, or from uh, distant places except by post, which took a long time. Checks were cleared by post and so on. But uh, now with the use of Australia, Australian computer, computer software and technology, the banks in Eastern Europe have uh, the kind of banking facilities which we take for granted in Australia, where you can look up your balance, where, you can do, where money can be exchanged electronically, all at the pressing of a few computer keys. And so the Australian economy is evolving away from being a commodity-based economy to being a cleverer economy providing services. I was in Vietnam 18 months or so ago and one of the most interesting examples of Australian aid that I saw was the provision of governance services to the Vietnamese government, not only the, the government of the, the, the whole country, but down to local government level, where the Australian uh, AusAid uh, organisation was providing schools for um, local officials um, involved in uh, the provision of and delivery of local government services and teaching the Vietnamese people the principles of good governance. Um, and that's uh, another example of Australia becoming a more clever economy and offering aid of a different kind and, and services of a different kind to uh, our old uh, pattern of simply having commodity exports. The Cairns Group, um, which I was talking about some minutes ago, um, certainly uh, over its history has been very effective in uh, ensuring that uh, um, the Europeans at least were aware of the case being put by countries such as the South American countries in Australia of the need for a more liberalised trade environment, especially in agricultural produce. And, um, and that's a very important thing to have achieved because the Europeans tend to be somewhat isolationist and uh, to have uh, diplomats from Australia and, and uh, countries like uh, Brazil um, presenting arguments about the need in, in terms of the general interests of the globe and the global economy to have freer trade has been a very useful message to get through to Brussels. 
the progress has been very, very slow. <coughs> and the Europeans, no doubt, because of their history of uh, the devastating impact of the wars which occurred in the last century, have been very slow to bring down their tariff barriers, very slow to allow increased access to their market, <coughs> which of course is now one of the biggest markets in the world, with the addition of, um, I think it is, 10 additional countries to the European Union due to occur in May. So the European Union will expand from 15 to 25 nations and uh, will have a, ma a market approaching 400 million people which offers enormous opportunities to countries like Australia um, to service in uh, a wide variety of ways. But unfortunately, um, one of the features of uh, recent uh, international trade um, uh, meetings and negotiations, the World Trade Organisation meeting at Cancun was an example, um, is that they're not progressing as well as uh, was hoped in terms of achieving their objective of reducing um, tariffs and liberalising world trade. There are a lot of opinions about the reasons for this. Um, one of the views is that organisations like the World Trade Organisation are now so big that um, there are just too many interests to serve and that Many of the African countries in particular who have now joined on to the World Trade Organisation aren't necessarily really interested in trade liberalisation because, um, in a general sense, but because they in fact have um, preferential trade ar arrangements with many of their previous colonial uh, uh, owner countries and um, rather than see those preferential access agreements compromised um, by allowing, allowing a broad liberalisation of trade. There is a view that uh, the African countries in particular are not interested in a multilateral approach uh, to the liberalisation of world trade. And that has led a, a country like Australia to give some consideration to reconsidering its approach to multilateral agreements. And uh, Australia has begun um, to develop bilateral trade agreements, free trade agreements. The American United States uh, Free Trade Agreement, which has uh, most recently uh, uh, had its negotiations concluded, but the details of which still need to be endorsed by both the United States Congress and the Australian Federal Parliament, is but the latest of these bilateral agreements which Australia has entered into. Um, in, uh, in uh, the last 18 months or so, Australia uh, has uh, entered into a free trade agreement with Singapore, uh, which is, of course, one of our closest neighbours and has a very dynamic economy. And in many ways, the Singapore systems of government, the systems in their pr professions and uh, their, their general legal approach is very similar to ours because Singapore was a British Commonwealth uh, uh, country or a British possession and so its systems are British. And um, that's one of the great legacies that the British have left to the world long after their colonial empire has gone and, and the Commonwealth established, consisting of independent countries. One finds that the systems in these countries from the Caribbean to the South Pacific in Australia and New Zealand to the African countries is much the same, so that they have the same legal system, the same professional system, same university system, an education system, and of course very similar systems of government with bicameral uh, parliaments. Um, Nigeria, for example, has a House of Representatives and a Senate, and of course in that country there are state governments. Nigeria has many states and a very big population, but fundamentally their system is similar to that in Australia. So we have a situation, as I said, in the World Trade Organisation where it may be that that multilateral approach is not going to produce uh, the results that were hoped for, and so Australia is turning to bilateralism, 
the Singapore Free Trade Agreement was a landmark agreement because uh, it uh, gave uh, access to Singapore for Australian services such as finance and it also meant that Australian lawyers uh, from some of the law schools in Australia, not all but uh, most of the uh, well established ones were able to be admitted to the bar in Singapore and Australian doctors able to practice there. The Australian government has also set, sought, sought to establish a free trade agreement with Thailand. Um, Thailand in fact is a country which does have very high tariff barriers and um, uh, while we have a free trade agreement in the making there, um, the timelines are very long, so it'll be a long time before there is uh, free and open trade between our two countries. But free trade agreements uh, are all part of the economic mix of Australia and Australia has proceeded a long way down the road of trade liberalisation. Uh, Senator Humphreys, I think. Uh, Senator Barnett. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy uh, Speak President, and uh, I stand tonight to uh, speak on the Appropriations Bill and in uh, highlighting the uh, cost to the health budget in terms of uh, the impact of obesity yeah, on the health system, and its uh, obesity is an epidemic in Australia today. And it's uh, very serious indeed, and uh, all the trends are heading in the wrong direction for this country, and it's something that we can't put our heads in the sand and uh, just pretend it'll go away. In fact, uh, there's an imperative now more than ever that we should be addressing this problem and uh, addressing it with all our might. Um, it's a very serious issue. Um, it's something that, uh, firstly, is a responsibility of myself as an individual and for each of us as individuals uh, to address and indeed for personal responsibility of parents uh, to take hold of uh, this issue uh, to look after the interests of their, their children and uh, indeed for all levels of government at the uh, first tier and the second tier and the third tier of government and for all the key stakeholders and tonight I'd want to speak in that regard um, in regard to the importance of uh, the role of those key stakeholders to urge them to be part of the solution and not just part of the problem. And it's interesting that I speak on that because yesterday in this parliament um, federal politicians and uh, the community in general were, were really given a wake-up call on childhood obesity um, where McDonald's joined with other health experts to put the issue on the national agenda. It was a forum on obesity and fast food reform which I hosted in the Australian Parliament and we had McDonald's Australia Chief Executive Guy Russo as a guest speaker, marathon Olympian um, and Commonwealth Games uh, and world record holder Robert De Costello and indeed Don Dr Jonathan Shaw of the International Diabetes Institute. They were all presenting experts in their field and gave excellent presentations. And uh, the message is that obesity is an epidemic. Uh, childhood obesity has more than doubled in the past 10 years. And about half of our obese children, sadly, will carry that extra weight through to adulthood. And indeed, as parents, as I said earlier, we all have a duty of care. Um, if we don't get to our obese children now, they are prone to heart attacks, they're prone to cancer, they are prone to diabetes and all the consequences that flow through from having diabetes and indeed to other serious illnesses in later life. Indeed, yesterday we heard uh, about depression and the fact that uh, that is one of the serious consequences that flow from uh, obesity. Um, but if we do reach them and reach uh, our children, then they have an opportunity of living a wonderful and more healthy uh, life, a long and vibrant life into the future. Uh, the results of yesterday's forum will be compiled and forwarded to the key decision makers in the government, um, specifically the Prime Minister, uh, the Minister for Health, the Minister for Education, the Minister for Sport and, uh, and other key decision makers including uh, Larry Anthony, the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs and no doubt they'll be very interested in the, in the outcome of those presentations that have been made. Um, 
It was interesting because yesterday a number of announcements were made, uh, specifically by McDonald's. But before I uh, mention what they were, I just want to say that in the winter of 2002, I had the privilege of attending a health forum in the United States where the key topic was obesity <clears throat> and the obesity epidemic. And I learnt a number of things, including the fact that 50 per cent of all uh, deaths in that country are either uh, can be postponed or prevented, and um, <coughs> uh, that uh, is, is not dissimilar to the situation here in Australia. So what are we actually doing about it? <coughs> well, <coughs> on the return 2002 uh, from that conference, uh, in fact on the 20th of June, um, I made a call for the need for reform of the fast food industry and specifically the labelling of the nutritional value of these products. And uh, interestingly, the response um, at the time uh, was that, uh, from the fast food industry was that it was too hard and it couldn't be done. I actually have the statement here of the 20th of June 2002 uh, where I say that today's fast food companies in Australia could become the tobacco industry defendants of tomorrow. Health warnings on uh, Fast food packaging highlighting the medical and lifestyle risks will no doubt become a requirement in future years unless the industry acts now. Uh, the trends towards raising awareness of fast food dangers as reported in The Australian on June the 15th had, order, had already hit the United States and was headed down under. And then I said that in the United States 50 per cent of all deaths each year are preventable or could have been postponed by effective public health practices. So, uh, that call was made, the need for nutritional information on fast food packaging. And then yesterday, nearly two years later, uh, McDonald's announced that they would put that nutritional information on their fast food packaging, on the packaging of their products. And for that I congratulate them and I'm proud to say that uh, they made those announcements and their plans to go ahead in April, meaning this month. Um, on its packaging, and indeed they announced a number of other reforms. And they put out a statement, uh, a media release dated yesterday from Guy Russo, where he said that uh, uh, he announced, announced the most significant um, initiative uh, would be the introduction of industry-first nutrition labelling on regular menu items. And he made the comment that this was not only an Australian first, but a world first, a world first. And uh, he referred to research carried out by Century Solutions, Australia's specialist food, specialist food research agency, which uh, indicated that 92 per cent of people surveyed uh, thought that nutritional information on packaging was a good idea, while 73 per cent <coughs> um, would see that McDonald's as being more open and honest. And he said that from mid-April he will be progressively introducing nutrition information panels on our regular menu food packaging, which will be carried out in two phases. The first round of nutrition labelling will be the Big Mac, the Quarter Pounder, Cheeseburger, Junior Burger, McOz and Sausage and Egg McMuffin. Well, there you go. He also announced that uh, in terms of the buns that there would be a lower, lower sugar content and there would be a reduction in sugar and total kilojoules on some of their other uh, products, including the muffins, and the introduction of canola cooking oil. But basically what this says is that there's reform afoot in this country in terms of fast food and offering more healthy options. And I congratulate and commend McDonald's for the work that they're doing. I invited all the key uh, stakeholders in the fast food industry to that forum yesterday. And I'm happy to put on the public record that they uh, either were unwilling or unable to attend. And uh, yes, I've had correspondence with them. They've offered one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, with myself. But the bottom line is, you know, are they willing to commit to reform and to offering more healthy options for the Australian customer and for the Australian people? And this is an issue. I think uh, certainly McDonald's is leading in this arena, and uh, it's now an issue for their competitors to to come up to the mark and uh, to put their. Um, views forward and their policies forward and their initiatives forward in terms of offering more healthy options. As I said earlier, they have to be part of the solution, not just part of the problem. So 
what we have learnt is that uh, Australians are getting fatter. We've got 67% of Australian men and now 57% of Australian women that are obese or overweight. And uh, we've learnt that childhood obesity has more than doubled in the last 10 years. We've learnt that there are 8,000 deaths in Australia each year which are related to weight problems and obese people are six times more likely to get heart disease and ten times more likely to get diabetes. So um, we in Australia sadly have seriously unhealthy habits and we refuse to change. Uh, we need to, uh, as I say, not put our head in the sand but we need to do something about it and it's up to each one of us uh, to be part of the solution. So I hope that yesterday's forum will be part of that wake-up call on the obesity epidemic and uh, we need preemptive action and we need it fast. Um, in terms of uh, our lifestyle in this 21st century, yes, particularly for the children, they've been sucked into this vortex where uh, they have this incredible pressure, it's peer group pressure, where they have the television, they have the video, they have the video games. They have the internet. So you can't blame them for living a sedentary lifestyle. What are we doing as leaders in the community uh, to address this epidemic, to address this problem? Um, yes, 100 years ago it was totally different, where uh, we were far more physically active and, uh, and living was perhaps more tough and more challenging. But see, we've got this, uh, this uh, particularly in the Western world, uh, industrialised nations and countries like the US and Australia, the UK, of course the obesity epidemic is getting worse. And uh, we need to change our lifestyle and uh, change the way we do things. In terms of transport, in terms of uh, walking to school, as a kid, um, yes, I rode my bike to school, I also got on the bus, but I did a lot more walking then than the kids do now. So how are we helping our children in terms of uh, changing the way uh, they, do, they, they live their lives? Um, so I think these are very much important issues. I can say that there are a number of initiatives that are underway to address these problems and uh, I compliment and congratulate the, the Australian Government for the uh, leadership they've taken with the uh, uh, National Obesity Task Force and the work that that's been doing that task force has been doing uh, and they've made a number of recommendations. Um, in terms of Tasmania and in terms of uh, um, growing community awareness on this issue, I've hosted two forums, uh, Childhood Obesity um, to address uh, the issue and uh, Healthy Lifestyle Forums. Uh, Larry Anthony, the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs, was uh, launching uh, one of those forums and we've had uh, um, great support from the Australian Government in that regard. In fact, uh, Guy Russo attended the one uh, in Hobart on the 8th of May and uh, Dr Paul Zimmet and a number of keynote guest speakers appeared in November 2002 in Launceston. Um, I've been delighted to have been involved with the Australian Association of National Advertisers who um, have done a lot of hard work behind the scenes. A lot of people don't know of the work that they've done in terms of developing an advertising campaign which will be targeting young, pe young people. And I commend them and congratulate them for their work. Ian Alwell in particular, who heads the AANA, but all his colleagues in that group. And I've been, it's been a pleasure working with them and I look forward to the launch of that campaign in due course at an appropriate time. But that, type, that campaign will help raise awareness about uh, um, the importance of being active and there are two key simple messages quite uh, really and these messages are to have a balanced diet and regular exercise. They're quite simple messages but they're hard to implement. As I say we've got uh, um, unhealthy habits and we need to change. Well before we can fix a problem we must acknowledge the problem. Uh, that's the first step. So we must acknowledge the problem and this obesity epidemic. Um, we need to raise the concerns and the issues and the consequences of obesity so that we can then address those consequences and those concerns and tackle them head on. Fast food reform, yes, that is necessary. Um, that needs to happen. But simply having that reform won't so solve the problem in and of itself. In regard to the AANA, yes, uh, we've 
I've, I've worked hand in glove with them with this national education and advertising campaign, and also with them in terms of the, the uh, um, encouraging them to prepare and implement a code of practice for advertising to children. See, this is part of the solution as well in terms of the marketing and advertising to children. And yes, that code has now been prepared. Perhaps it's not as tough as some people would like it to be, but it's a good first step. It has been signed up, has been accepted by the AANA and its members, and I would now hope that the other uh, key stakeholders, the fast food industry, the food industry, the food and grocery manufacturers and suppliers would all sign up um, to this particular code to say, uh, which would encourage um, appropriate and sensible advertising to children. So they are some key initiatives. What are some of the other key initiatives? And I guess these are personal views, which I think will help address the obesity epidemic and the health consequences and the terrible consequences that flow from that. Firstly, compulsory physical education in schools. Um, yes, some states do have that, in, particularly in primary schools, and I congratulate those states. Sadly, my home state of Tasmania does not. Um, it has a belligerent attitude in terms of uh, this issue, and it's uh, not adequately addressing the problem. Uh, there's another area where we can act uh, on this, and that is in the area of school canteens. Uh, again, in the area of primary schools in particular. Uh, there's been some good work, some progress there in terms of offering more healthy options for the children, and that's good, but there's a lot more that can be done. And As you and uh, the others would know, there's, uh, this is a primarily a responsibility for the state governments around this country, and I would be urging them to be far more proactive in this area. Um, I've been uh, certainly advocating for a long time GP lifestyle prescriptions, i.e. prescriptions by your doctor in terms of how you live your life, changing your lifestyle in terms of more regular exercise, a more balanced diet, rather than just a prescription of a particular drug um, or a pill that will address a particular health problem that you have. Now, if we can think more laterally and be more creative in the way we address this epidemic, then we've got a chance uh, to fix it and to turn around the trends that are all headed in the wrong direction at the moment. Another area which is just a one-off thing, communities can, can come on board with this, uh, uh, families, uh, individuals, and that's basically TV-free or internet-free weekends or days. Um, just pick a day and, uh, and see how you go. And guess what happens uh, when you're not watching the, the box, when you're not watching the television, you're doing something else. And uh, the chances are that you might be exercised. And uh, we need to change our lifestyle and uh, change the way we do things. In terms of transport, in terms of uh, walking to school, as a kid, um, yes, I rode my bike to school. I also got on the bus, but I did a lot more walking then than the kids do now. So how are we helping our children in terms of uh, changing the way uh, they do, they, they live their lives. Um, so I think these are very much important issues. I can say that there are a number of initiatives that are underway to address these problems and uh, I compliment and congratulate the, the Australian Government for the uh, leadership they've taken with the uh, uh, National Obesity Task Force and the work that that's been doing, uh, that task force has been doing. Uh, and they've made a number of recommendations. Um, in terms of Tasmania and in terms of uh, um, growing community awareness on this issue, I've hosted two forums, uh, Childhood Obesity um, to address uh, the issue and uh, Healthy Lifestyle Forums. Uh, Larry Anthony, the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs, was uh, launching uh, one of those forums and we've had uh, um, great support from the Australian Government in that regard. In fact, uh, Guy Russo attended the one uh, in Hobart on the 8th of May, and uh, Dr Paul Zimmet and a number of keynote guest speakers appeared in November 2002 in Launceston. Um, I've been delighted to have been involved with the Australian Association of National Advertisers, who um, have done a lot of hard work behind the scenes. A lot of people don't know of the work that they've done in terms of developing an advertising campaign which will be targeting young, pe young people. And I commend them and congratulate them for their work, Ian Alwell in particular, who heads the AANA, but all his colleagues in that group. And I've been 
It's been a pleasure working with them and I look forward to the launch of that campaign in due course at an appropriate time. But that, type, that campaign will help raise awareness about uh, um, the importance of being active. And there are two key simple messages, quite uh, really, and these messages are to have a balanced diet and regular exercise. They're quite simple messages, but they're hard to implement. As I say, we've got uh, um, unhealthy habits and we need to change. Well, before we can fix a problem, we must acknowledge the problem. Uh, that's the first step. So we must acknowledge the problem and this obesity epidemic. Uh, we need to raise the concerns and the issues and the consequences of obesity so that we can then address those consequences and those concerns and tackle them head on. Fast food reform, yes, that is necessary. Um, that needs to happen. But simply having that reform won't so solve the problem in and of itself. In regard to the AANA, yes, uh, we've, I've worked hand in glove with them with this national education and advertising campaign and also with them in terms of the, the, uh, um, encouraging them to prepare and implement a code of practice for advertising to children. See, this is part of the solution as well in terms of the marketing and advertising to children. And yes, that code has now been prepared. Perhaps it's not as tough as some people would like it to be, but it's a good first step. It has been signed up, has been accepted by the AANA and its members, and I would now hope that the other uh, key stakeholders, the fast food industry, the food industry, the food and grocery manufacturers and suppliers would all sign up um, to this particular code to say, uh, which would encourage um, appropriate and sensible advertising to children. So they are some key initiatives. What are some of the other key initiatives? And I guess these are personal views, which I think will help address the obesity epidemic and the health consequences and the terrible consequences that flow from that. Firstly, compulsory physical education in schools. Um, yes, some states do have that, in, particularly in primary schools, and I congratulate those states. Sadly, my home state of Tasmania does not. Um, it has a belligerent attitude in terms of uh, this issue, and it's uh, not adequately addressing the problem. Uh, there's another area where we can act uh, on this, and that is in the area of school canteens, uh, again, in the area of primary schools in particular. Uh, there's been some good work, some progress there in terms of offering more healthy options for the children, and that's good, but there's a lot more that can be done, and as you and uh, the others would know, there's, uh, this is a primarily a responsibility for the state governments around this country, and I would be urging them to be far more proactive in this area. Um, I've been uh, certainly advocating for a long time GP lifestyle prescriptions, i.e prescriptions by your doctor in terms of how you live your life, changing your lifestyle in terms of more regular exercise, a more balanced diet, rather than just a prescription of a particular drug um, or a pill that will address a particular health problem that you have. Now, if we can think more laterally and be more creative in the way we address this epidemic, then we've got a chance uh, to fix it and to turn around the trends that are all headed in the wrong direction at the moment. Another area which is just a one-off thing, communities can, can come on board with this, uh, uh, families, uh, individuals, and that's basically TV free or internet free weekends or days. Um, just pick a day and, uh, and see how you go. And guess what happens uh, when you're not watching the, the box, when you're not watching the television, you're doing something else and uh, the chances are that you might be exercising or walking or walking the dog or out, uh, out doing the gardening or doing something productive, something active. And it's not so much uh, what you're doing when, you, when you're watching the TV, it's what you're not doing. And this point was made uh, very clear yesterday by Dr Jonathan Shaw of the International Diabetes Institute in an excellent presentation. And I, let me just say that uh, um, what I think is... Uh, what my hope and dream would be is that within a few decades um, that we will look back, and hopefully it won't take a few decades, but it will take a good amount of time, we will actually look back and say that fixing the obesity epidemic uh, by living healthier lifestyles was as vital as changing attitudes and behaviour towards smoking. 
and uh, we know the impact and implications of smoking and uh, indeed the uh, um, tragic uh, uh, news just recently in Tasmania with our state premier um, uh, suffering from cancer as a result of uh, smoking and that's uh, very sad indeed but it certainly has stirred many on in Tasmania towards living a more healthy lifestyle in terms of stop stopping uh, the smoking and uh, as a, as a result, uh, avoiding the consequences of that. Thank you. Um, I would like to also commend, um, before I close, the work of the Parliamentary Diabetes Support Group in the work that that does. As I've said, obesity does lead to diabetes. That's one of the key, key outcomes. But uh, in that regard, the, uh, that's chaired by uh, uh, Judy Moylan, MHR, um, from Western Australia, and she does an impeccable job in terms of the work that she does for that group. And it's a bipartisan group. We have uh, Dick Adams, MHR, and uh, myself, uh, Cameron Thompson from Queensland, Mal Washer. Um, and uh, we all work well together to try and uh, help and support people with diabetes and uh, to try and tackle uh, the problems associated with it. We work with Diabetes Australia, we work with the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation and have an excellent relationship with both those organisations, Dr Peter Little and Brian Conway from Diabetes Australia and Sheila Royals from uh, uh, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation and indeed the many others involved in those groups. And just before I do close, I want to commend uh, Greg Hunt uh, for his initiative of walking 500 kilometres around his electorate of Flinders in just south of Melbourne in terms of addressing uh, diabetes and trying to raise money and research for, for people uh, with type 1 diabetes, the need for a cure. He's going to be walking for a cure for a number of weeks. I think it's three weeks from the end of April through to early May. And uh, what a great initiative, and I should commend him on that. So there are a number of things that we can do to tackle the obesity epidemic. A lot of it is being done, but can I say there is a lot more to be done. And I would urge each and uh, myself and every one of us to play our part in, uh, in uh, tackling this epidemic. Thank you. Um, Senator Brandis. Mr Acting Deputy President, since, um, as you know, relevance um, is not an issue in debating the appropriation bills, I just want to take a moment to place on the record something that occurred in the chamber during question time yesterday. You may recall, Mr Acting Deputy President, that Senator Nettle asked a question of Senator Hill as Minister for Defence concerning the um, deployment of troops in Iraq. Uh, Senator, given what you've just said, are, are you actually speaking to the appropriation bill? Yes, I yes am. you are. Yes, okay. I am. Senator Brandis. Um, during the course of Senator Hill's answer, to Senator Nettle's question, a number of government senators, including, to the best of my recollection, Senator McGorran, but he was not the only one, interjected across the chamber in the general direction of the opposition and particularly towards Senator Nettle words to the effect, if you had your way, Saddam Hussein would still be in control, which is the kind of badinage which uh, as you know, occurs in the chamber, to which disorderly badinage, to which there uh, responded in a clear and strong voice, not once but twice, from Senator George Campbell, the words, Saddam, Hus Saddam Hussein is better than Donald Rumsfeld. That provoked a degree of outrage in this part of the chamber, so Senator George Campbell repeated that statement, Saddam Hussein uh, is better than sorry. Donald Rumsfeld. Please take your seat, I just Senator wanted to Brandis. make sure the Senator public Mackay. record record. Take your seat, I Senator Brandis. Senator Mackay. I call your attention to the state of the chamber. A quorum required. Ring the bells.
quorum present. Senator Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Um, uh, Acting Deputy President. I wanted to raise a number of matters tonight uh, that uh, this, uh, this bill presents an opportunity to discuss. Um, I first of all wanted to talk about a few matters uh, concerning the ACT and uh, some real concerns that I have about uh, developments uh, in the provision of services to people in the ACT. Um, I spoke uh, yesterday in another debate about um, the uh, baby care payment announcement made by uh, Opposition Leader Mark Latham yesterday. And I said that uh, the concern I had about this and indeed a number of other Labor policies that have been announced recently is that they bore the hallmark of being, having been put together with some haste and uh, were not well thought through. And the particular issue I drew attention to with that policy announcement was that uh, one of the ways in which Labor had cobbled together the money to be able to fund this new called, uh, uh, this so-called uh, baby care payment was that um, it was going to uh, significantly reduce spending on the National Capital Authority to the tune of approximately $11.9 million a year. Now, I want to come back to that issue and explain to honourable senators what that would mean to the role that uh, uh, the NCA plays in protecting and enhancing um, the planned national capital, which is the ACT. Uh, the budget of the National Capital Authority is about uh, $30 million a year, just under $30 million a year. So a reduction in that uh, uh, budget of about $12 million represents a cut of something like 40 per cent in the operations of the NCA. Now, members opposite have characterised this announcement um, with a little, just a little bit of um, uh, ex post facto uh, rationalisation as um, an acknowledgement of the uh, NCA having too extensive a role in the planning uh, of the city and that its functions should be withdrawn from many areas that it currently operates in and reduced essentially to the parliamentary triangle. Now, there are a number of uh, issues about that, and I don't want to debate that aspect of the announcement tonight. But I do want to point out that the suggestion that by reducing the areas of responsibility, planning responsibility of the NCA, to just the parliamentary triangle and a few other areas of ceremonial significance, such as Anzac Parade and the, Nash and the Australian War Memorial and so on, that you can somehow achieve a saving of 40 per cent of the uh, outlays of the National Capital Authority is simply nonsense. The National Capital Authority does have responsibility for administering the National Capital Plan, and that covers, of course, essentially the whole of the ACT. But its responsibilities um, for the uh, areas of the National Capital Plan outside the parliamentary triangle and the areas in question uh, is not as extensive as it is within the parliamentary triangle. In other words, it has a responsibility to designate broad land uses that might be made in, for example, rural areas of the ACT, but its, it's responsibility doesn't extend to, for example, approving particular works that go on within those areas. So at the present time, for example, the NCA is, I understand, considering issues to do with the rebuilding of uh, rural villages that were destroyed in the bushfires in uh, uh, January of last year, and it will decide broadly whether it's appropriate to have urban settlements, uh, non-urban settlements in those sorts of areas or not. A fairly simple decision to make in one sense, but it will not make decisions about the size of buildings in those villages and the configuration of, of landscapes and, uh, and issues that are appropriately the responsibility of the ACT planning authority. And when you consider that across the whole of the areas that the NCA is responsible for, you realise that uh, a relatively small part of its operations uh, is in fact covered by those areas outside the parliamentary triangle a relatively small proportion of its responsibilities. 
and it follows from that that a relatively small proportion of its budget is spent outside the parliamentary triangle. Because the fact is, Mr Acting Deputy President, that when you exclude um, the parliamentary triangle, uh, you are excluding a very small part of the responsibility of the NCA in a day-to-day -day sense. And if you cut 40 per cent of the NCA's budget, you are cutting jobs and you are cutting essential functions that fall within the parliamentary triangle. Functions to do with the maintenance of national areas, such as Commonwealth Place and Reconciliation Place, and the avenues that define the parliamentary, parliamentary triangle. You are cutting programs, programs like uh, Summer in the Capital, uh, Celebrate Australia Day, uh, Tropfest, uh, and a range of other things that the NCA conducts in order to promote the national capital in a way which, beho which, is, which uh, behoves its role as the chief, um, the chief promoter of this city. You have to cut its building program things like uh, the uh, enhancing of the Commonwealth Place foreshore, which is currently underway, things like the National Emergency Services Memorial and the project to uh, re-landscape um, and reconstruct the old Parliament House gardens, the uh, monument to uh, the centenary of women's suffrage. Those are the sorts of things the NCA does. And those are the sorts of things which inevitably, with a cut of 40 per cent, a cut of almost $50 million over the next four years, you will have to see significantly compromised or go by the board altogether. You don't make a saving of that order and preserve those essential functions of the National Capital Authority. You simply don't. Now, in fact, um, in making comments about this matter yesterday, um, the Shadow Finance Minister, uh, Bob McMullen, made, um, uh, made reference to, uh, in fact, took a different approach as to why um, the opposition would be able to uh, say 40 per cent by, uh, by um, cutting the, the NCA's uh, functions back to essentially the parliamentary triangle. He talked about the elimination of duplication and said that the NCA um, uh, would uh, save a large amount of money by not having to duplicate the planning functions that are conducted presently by the ACT Planning Authority. Now, again, given that its responsibility outside the parliamentary triangle in a planning sense is much less onerous than its responsibilities inside the parliamentary triangle, that argument falls down almost at the first hurdle. Um, secondly, there isn't a great deal of duplication, although there are areas where uh, duplication certainly does occur, and when they do occur they cause significant problems, and I think we should uh, accept some, uh, that there is some need to do something about that problem. But achieving it with a saving of, of uh, nearly $50 million is not the way to deal with that problem. The third point is, let's suppose that there is a duplication. That, the, uh, that there is, um, uh, it is better to have those particular planning functions conducted by the uh, ACT government rather than the Commonwealth government through the NCA. Let's make that assumption for one moment. Would you not then logically be required to transfer some of that budget currently operated by the NCA to the ACT planning authority? for it to be able to perform those functions in the areas being vacated by the NCA. Isn't that logical? But of course, of course, Labor won't do that because they don't get their saving. They don't get their 50 million bucks to throw into Mark Latham's latest um, shoot from the hip idea, the, the, baby, uh, the baby payment. They want that money, have to find the money, and so any old, any old um, uh, saving will do. And the saving in this case is ill thought through, bears the hallmarks of having been um, uh, 
discovered in fairly short, a fairly short space of time, so there isn't really a thought through policy on this, um, and frankly betrays an attitude on the Australian Labor Party's part which says cutting Canberra really doesn't matter. Cutting Canberra is okay. Because we've got three safe seats sitting in the ACT, they say, and they say we can treat you with contempt because it just doesn't matter. And in other parts of Australia, a cut to the ACT probably will win us a few votes, a few plaudits. Now, okay, you can run that line out in Western, Western Sydney and in the suburbs of Melbourne and places like that, but you can't also come back and parade yourselves as the party that cares about Canberra because you don't, because you don't care about Canberra. In your announcement about abolishing the budget and the programs in the former National Office of the Information Economy, you, you've sacrificed 160 jobs in this city. 160 jobs go by the board because you think, you think Canberra's dispensable. You think the votes in Canberra aren't seriously at risk. And with this announcement, Mr Acting Deputy President, with this amount announcement, the Australian Labor Party um, saves another 40 jobs, another uh, $12 million. Uh, that adds up to 200 jobs in the ACT lost under this government, under, under this or proposed alternative government, under this proposed alternative government, and uh, and not a, not a blush among them in making those announcements. Not a blush. And I hope that there, some, of the, some of the members opposite appreciate that this decision has been made without due thought to the implications for the ACT. And particularly my colleague, my fellow uh, ACT Senator, Senator Lundy, will stand up for the ACT in the internal organs of her party and say, this is not acceptable. The people of the ACT are not, uh, are not uh, to be disregarded so lightly. The ACT and its essential functions are not a milch cow to pay for Labor promises generally in other parts of Australia, and that these sorts of announcements will stop, and that Santa Lundy and her colleagues will ensure that these decisions, these uh, reprehensible decisions, will be wound back. Because we do need to maintain functions in enhancing Australia's e-security. We do need to talk about broadbanding our nation, about making, uh, making Australian government agencies and departments capable of facing the new uh, IT environment. For those reasons, we do need that spending on the Office of the Information Economy, and we do need those jobs in Canberra. And we also need to have a well-planned, well-maintained, well-promoted national capital, particularly in the parliamentary triangle. And cutting 40 per cent of the budget, 40, 50 jobs out of the NCA does not achieve those objectives, and we should reconsider. I wanted also to talk about um, other services in the ACT which, although they're not going to be cut, unfortunately won't be able to be enhanced because of a decision made uh, in the last week or so by the ACT government. Uh, members, uh, honourable senators, will be aware that the uh, Australian government promoted in uh, the 2001 budget the concept of greatly expanding access to concessions and benefits by uh, Australia's uh, low-income, self-funded retirees. That constitutes a growing and very important part of our community. People who have taken the trouble to make preparations for their retirement are now living on those arrangements prepared during their working lives, find that it is difficult to make ends meet for a variety of reasons, and who in those circumstances I think deserve our sympathy and our support. And the government in its 2001 budget made the very sensible decision to put some money on the table to um, uh, encourage uh, state and territory governments to get out there and put concessions in place for those sorts of self-funded retirees. Now, recently, the uh, minister announced that that uh, offer was being sweetened, and I think, from memory, that the order of the offer is something in the order of $75 million on the table uh, to uh, get Australian 
uh, states and territories to come to the party and um, offer concessions to self-funded retirees. In the case of the ACT, the offer of the federal government is $2.27 million. And they've said that the total, uh, the total cost um, of making those concessions available to self-funded retirees in the ACT um, is being met 60 per cent by the uh, Commonwealth government, 40 per cent by the ACT government. Now that seems like a very sensible, a very, very fair offer. To my horror, I discover that the ACT government has refused the Commonwealth offer of assistance. The $2.27 million will be returned to the Commonwealth government because in the ACT government's view, um, their contribution, something like $2 million, uh, would be better spent on providing services to other sorts of people than Canberra's low-income self-funded retirees. That is a truly disgraceful attitude, a truly disgraceful attitude. Self-funded retirees deserve to be taken into account in government policy at both the federal and state and territory level. They deserve to get a better deal than they've had in the past. They deserve to be able to access the something in the order of $965 a year in concessions uh, that uh, this package presented them with. And it is it beggars belief to think that the ACT government would hand back such a generous Commonwealth offer because they think they've got higher priorities for their spending. I can assure um, honourable senators that I'll be doing my best in the coming few uh, months to draw to the attention uh, of uh, AC the ACT community um, the, um, the very mean-spirited approach being taken by the ACT government. Finally, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I want to, um, without preempting debate on a matter that will no doubt come to this place in due course, I want to commend the um, uh, Australian government for its decision to introduce the Occupational Health and Safety Commonwealth Employment Amendment Promoting Safer Workplaces Bill 2004 uh, into the uh, House of Representatives this morning. That uh, bill has the intention of uh, removing from the operation of the um, removing from the operation of the uh, ACT's um, industrial manslaughter legislation recently passed uh, employers and employees within the Commonwealth's ambit within the Commonwealth employment. Uh, it's a matter of uh, great concern to the business community of the ACT that uh, the ACT has been the first and hopefully the only jurisdiction to legislate in this way for industrial manslaughter. Laws which are quite unnecessary given that there are already uh, clear occupational health and safety laws which outlaw uh, reckless and uh, uh, inappropriate behaviour by employers which could lead to the injury or death of their employees. Given the existence of those laws, the uh, imposition of a law outlawing industrial manslaughter and imposing extremely heavy penalties, criminal penalties, on employers in this territory is a matter of great concern and, in my opinion, will have the effect of reducing or retarding the growth in employment in the ACT. People will factor that into the equation when they come to consider whether they should be making the ACT a place for them to employ other people. And that is a matter of great regret. The Commonwealth has wisely decided to exclude uh, the operation of this, from the operation of this bill employees within the Commonwealth orbit. And that is a very sensible decision. And I hope that this parliament will speedily pass the legislation to protect um, uh, those employers and employees within that, uh, within that definition, um, and that uh, it will leave then the ACT community to pass judgment on uh, those industrial manslaughter laws when the, uh, when the ACT goes to the polls in October of this year. Uh, these are matters which touch on uh, the ACT. Uh, the niggardly approach of the ACT government in respect of uh, concessions for older people is a matter of concern. Uh, and a great concern is the attitude of the opposition in promoting 
um, a, an attitude which says the ACT may be cut freely because uh, the votes here just don't matter. And we all should be concerned about the degradation of the national uh, areas, the parliamentary triangle, inherent in the decision that Labor has announced uh, this week. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, in speaking to the uh, appropriation legislation that's particularly appropriate, uh, to note the uh, amount of money that uh, goes towards defence. And I think it's uh, an area that hasn't had the focus in some respects uh, that it deserves in the previous years, but it's certainly uh, much more uh, higher on the public agenda these days, uh, defence and security issues and getting value for money and effectiveness uh, for the money that is spent. And uh, I thought I'd draw attention to a report uh, from the Daily Telegraph, I think, from, by Ian McFedrin uh, a few days ago, on March 27, uh, regarding plans for a joint Australia-US military training facility, uh, a facility which, according to Mr Hugh White from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, uh, would probably leave no change out of a billion dollars. Uh, this at a time when Australia's defence budget is already fairly stretched. Uh, the Democrats uh, certainly aren't suggesting we shouldn't spend money on defence, but it should be spent wisely uh, to get value for money and in areas where it's going to be of maximum effect uh, to suit Australia's defence and security needs. Uh, we've always been of a view that in our own region uh, is where the main focus of our resources uh, need to be, uh, and that means that the use of our resources and the focus of our defence activities have to take into account regional sensitivities and regional issues. The um, report by uh, Mr McFedrin, uh, who has uh, a degree of expertise in defence issues, I might say, uh, states that the Howard government has been pushing for an American training base in the Northern Territory since 1996. Can you guys have your argument later? Um, if I might uh, repeat that sentence. The, uh, according to the article, the Howard government has been pushing for an American training base in the Northern Territory since 1996. Uh, but the US has resisted for cost and operational re reasons. Uh, the plan involves a high-tech, fully instrumented range outside Darwin that would be paid for by the US and Australia and then used by both nations. Uh, according to the article, it's Australia that is actually pushing the concept uh, as the uh, US review their global military basing strategy. According to a senior defence official named in the article, Shane Carmody, uh, so-called scoping options for the project should be ready by June, and officials met with U.S. Pacific Command officers in Hawaii uh, just a few days ago to push the plan forward. Uh, Mr. Carmody told a, a joint parliamentary committee, uh, according to the report, that the training facility would have no role as a nation-building or peacekeeping facility, uh, and it's that aspect as much as anything that concerns me. I, I do want to make it clear that the the Democrats support. Uh, the US-Australia alliance. We support the ANZUS Treaty, uh, which uh, many people uh, on the progressive side of politics don't. Uh, and we do support appropriate defence cooperation and intelligence cooperation. Uh, frankly, I don't believe we have much alternative, particularly in terms of intelligence cooperation, uh, in relation to uh, dealing with some of the threats to our security, particularly in terms of uh, the threats of terrorism and other instability, including in fact, particularly in our own region. Uh, but it needs to be appropriate cooperation, and it needs to be cooperation, not, uh, not subservience. And the real concern that the Democrats have voiced many times is that our defence policy and our defence spending, which is limited, like all taxpayer spending, is being directed too much towards ensuring that we fit in with the US's military and foreign policy objectives rather than other nations, rather than particularly our own, 
uh, as given primacy, but taking into account other nations uh, in our region, as well as other nations that we have uh, historical and current alliances with. And the concern of putting forward a base, and whatever you want to call it, in effect it is a base uh, that has no nation-building role or peacekeeping facility, uh, that won't play a positive role in terms of the real major likely future needs for much of our defence activity in our region, which is the sort of activity that's occurred in the Solomon's, Solomon Islands recently. A use of our defence forces and our um, federal police, I might add, uh, that met very, very wide approval in Australia. Uh, so it's not as though there's a massive group of Australians who oppose any sort of defence activity, any sort of overseas involvement of our troops. Uh, they'll always be a part, but uh, obviously if you look at the difference in Australian communities' reaction to the use of our troops in the Solomons, as opposed to the use of our troops in Iraq, uh, there's no comparison. And that's because many Australians, the majority of Australians at certain periods at least, didn't believe that it was appropriate to use our defence personnel for the activity that occurred in Iraq, but they did believe it was appropriate um, to use them um, as was done in the Solomons. And of course there is an ongo ongoing activity there. The other key point about the Solomons is it involved cooperation from a whole range of other nations in our region. And one of the overriding concerns the Democrats have with a US base set up a joint Australia US military facility, whatever name you want to call it, a US base, would be the perception and the impact on the relations with other countries in our region. I'm not saying they're all going to turn hostile and, uh, um, uh, and attack us or anything ridiculous like that. Uh, what I am saying is it will make it, it will develop and enhance a, an unhelpful perception. It will impede uh, effective cooperation with other nations if we are seen to reinforce the perception and what is clearly to some extent a reality of being a deputy sheriff to the US. We do have a role in our own region in terms of security and in terms of showing leadership and providing support with intelligence, with security, with in, in improving social stability in countries in our region. Uh, but that shouldn't be in connection with or at the behest of or overly reliant on the aims and desires of the US. And that is the problem and that is the concern. There have been a number of attempts to disguise the setting up of military bases under the names of defence staging posts or logistic hubs or logistics and training facilities. But forward positioning of US equipment and weapons storage in Australia for this purpose cannot be disguised as just the establishment of a training facility. It would be a US base. And we have to be absolutely clear that this rose by any other name would amount to a military base which would house equipment, including tanks, aircraft, fuel and ammunition, and which would allow the rapid deployment of US troops into theatres of war. Uh, the primary benefit would be about giving the US a new string of facilities uh, and weapon stores in Australia, which can be used to refresh forces, launch attacks as needed. Uh, so the statement that by a senior Australian defence official that uh, any training facility would have no role as a nation building or peacekeeping facility. Uh, the statements that it would cost a, a, at least a billion dollars and the statement that it is Australia that is actually pushing this uh, onto the US and encouraging them all give great cause con to concern to the Democrats because there is clearly a, a real problem at the moment with the military focus of the military agenda of the United States administration. And that's not being anti-American to say that. It's, it's obviously being anti the current US administration's policy. Um, but that's a very different thing. And in the same way as we can and are and should be critical of aspects of the Australian government's policy, uh, we can certainly be critical of the US government's policy without being anti-American. And that US military agenda at the moment supports first strike, supports preemptive strike, supports unilateral action uh, and supports uh, aggressive uh, activities in other parts of the world and the Australian defence policy at the moment supports increasing interoperability with the US and that is not the best use of Australia's 
defence and intelligence resources in the Democrats' view. The reshaping of America's very large global military footprint uh, is in reality uh, offers the potential of a very big boot uh, firmly stamped in areas where we really don't need it to be. And that is in terms of security uh, for Australia. Uh, there's a lot of very legitimate debate of people across the political spectrum. Uh, it's not a uh, left versus right, progressive versus conservative. Uh, it's people in different parts of the political spectrum who recognise the danger of a uh, aggressive, preemptive military agenda, uh, who recognise, as many people have stated, uh, that that can increase the risks um, of terrorism, can increase instability, can increase the likelihood uh, that we will be less secure rather than more secure. Australia is already, in our view, being tied too much into US foreign and military policy. And if that was a policy that clearly and genuinely looked after the interests of the Australian people, then our, our concerns would be a bit lower. Uh, but the trouble is we are backing a government, a US government, that has stated it will take preemptive strikes, has shown it will take preemptive strikes, and we are using taxpayers' money to a, a lot of money already uh, spending in defence areas to increase our interoperability uh, with that military agenda. So the provision of US bases in Australia, in our view, has the potential in such a climate to undermine Australian relations with many countries in our region, uh, Southeast Asia and Pacific Island countries to some extent, uh, which already see Australia as too closely aligned with the US. And that's not in the interests of Australia. Uh, equally importantly, if not more so, uh, it's also not in the interests of world peace and disarmament. Uh, and we don't believe that money should be being spent to increase that problem. Senator. Senator George Campbell, I understand you would be seeking leave to make a personal explanation. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator George Campbell. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I understand in an earlier contribution in this debate tonight by Senator Brandis, he made comments to the effect that I had said across the chamber yesterday that I preferred Saddam Hussein to Donald Rumsfeld. That is an absolute lie. What I did say, what I yeah, did yeah, say. Sen Senator George Cam, please take your seat. Uh, Senator Brandis on a point of order. Parliamentary, as you yes. well know, Mr. Acting Deputy President. You're, you're correct, uh, Senator Brandis. I'd ask you to withdraw that, um, Senator Campbell. Well, I'll withdraw the word lie, but that is a total distortion of the truth. What I did say across the chamber, and there was in the middle of question time when there was a lot of noise in the chamber, so people's hearing on that side must be substantially better than mine, but I did say words to the effect that in the 1990s Donald Rumsfeld and Saddam Hussein were the best of friends. And there is plenty of evidence around on tape to demonstrate that of Donald Rumsfeld sitting in Saddam's office or in the palace shaking hands with the leader of Iraq. That was the words that were said across the chamber. I did not say at any stage that I preferred Saddam Hussein to Donald Rumsfeld. Now, if Senator Brandis has got any moral courage, courage he will apologise, or if he's got any courage, he'll walk outside those doors and make the statement order, in public. Please uh, take your seats, Senator George Campbell. Senator Ching on a point of order. Mr. Acting Deputy President, I understand Mr. Uh, Senator Campbell was giving the uh, chamber, the, giving the Senate, his version of what, he act, what interjection actually said. He's is, making he, a is he seriously saying Senator. that that was his interjection? Because if he wasn't, uh, then he what, should not be making What's your point of order, Senator? Uh, I, I believe, I, I think Senator Campbell is taking advantage of making All right, speech. There's no point of order. Resume your seat, please. You raising a point of order? Senator Hill. Point of order. The, the personal explanation, you can explain your position as Senator Campbell has done. Within that personal explanation, you have no right to demand anything. If you want to demand something, then you've got to move a substantive motion. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Campbell, have you finished your personal explanation? Mr. Acting President, and it's still only 50 yards to courage. Thank you, Senator Campbell. The question is that the 
bills be read a second time? Those of that opinion say aye. Five yards that, those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark? Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 2, 2003-2004, Appropriation Bill No. 3, 2003-2004, and Appropriation Bill No. 4, 2003-2004. Minister? Is, uh, call the Minister. I move that the bills now be read out a third time. The question is that the bills be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark? Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 2, 2003-2004. Appropriation Bill No. 3, 2003-2004. Appropriation Bill No. 4, 2003-2004. Clark. Government business order of the day number eight. Issues from the advance to the finance minister as a final charge for the year ended 30 June 2003. Consideration in committee of the whole. Order. The committee is considering issues from the allowance to the finance minister as a final charge for the year ended 30 June 2003. Minister. The committee approves a statement of issues uh, from the advance of the, minister, the finance minister as a final charge for the year ended 30 June 2003. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question, yep, the question now is that the resolution be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The uh, temporary chairman of uh, committee, Senator Marshall, reports that the committee has considered issues from the advance to the finance minister as a final charge for the year ended the 30th of June 2003, and has, the, has approved the statement of issues. Minister, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the President has received letters from party leaders seeking variations to the membership of certain committees. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of certain committees. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister. I move that Senators be discharged from and appointed to various committees in accordance with the document circulated in the chamber. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. At the request of the respective senators, I withdraw general business notice as a motion set out in the list circulated in the chamber. Yep. That's all you need to do. Yep. Anything further? speech as a 10-minute statement, sir. Is leave granted? Just, um, is, is Senator Mackay. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. G Senator Mackay. Just as a point, I think that's a very reasonable proposition. I just wanted to clarify that would this mean that there would be 10 minutes less on the adjournment, not 10 minutes more? Yeah. Thank you. S Senator Lightfoot, that is a most welcome uh, move on your part. I call you to uh, yep. make your statement. It's, I, um, it's normal to stand in your place uh, yes, of course, I, uh, and to have, and to have, one's, I, I to have, have one's phone. Uh, yes. maybe I was just checking to make sure that it wasn't my phone. No, I'm very uh, pleased. Unfortunately, uh, it was, Mr. Uh, uh, well, I wasn't seeking that sort of President. admission, Senator Lightfoot. We will not start the clock yet. Senator Lightfoot. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. And I thank uh, the opposition uh, for uh, their assistance in this matter. Um, my uh, contrib contribution tonight in my 10-minute statement, Mr. Uh, Deputy uh, President, uh, is to paraphrase in the first uh, couple of, uh, a couple of uh, paras 
uh, from the authors of Saddam Hussein, a political biography by Ephraim Hakash and Anari Rotsi. Quote, for Iraq is a land of rival ambitions and con contradictions. It is a country with a gro glorious imperial past, stretching back thousands of years and far-reaching dreams for the future, and yet geopolitically handicapped, virtually landlocked and surrounded by six neighbours. It is a country that inspires to champion the cause of Arab nationalism, while at the same time being, in the words of its first modern ruler, King Faisal I, no more than unimaginable masses of human beings, devoid of any patriotic idea, imbued with religious traditions and absurdities, and prone to anarchy. It is a land torn by ethnic and religious divisions, a land where the main non-Arab community, the Kurds, have been constantly suppressed. Mr. Acting uh, Deputy President, it is not only the Kurds who have suffered, although it is upon this ethnic group that I intend to focus my attention tonight. In 1933, the Iraqi army committed atrocities against 3,000 members of the, ethnic community, of the ethnic minority community in northern Iraq in retaliation for their demands for ethnic and religious recognition. Following this mass murder, celebrations were held throughout the country, and the perpetrators were lauded by the masses, and their acts were treated as heroic. The victims in this instance happen to be Assyrian, but they may well have been any one of the other minorities that have been the targets of a succession of genocidal dictators. It is against this environment of ethnic cleansing that minorities in Iraq have been struggling for decades and from which our forces from the Coalition of the Willing hope to free them. Who are the Kurds, Mr Acting Deputy President? Kurds represent the largest minority group in the Middle East. Despite this, they are without their own homeland, disenfranchised due to their ethnicity. The traditionally demarcated lines of their country, Kurdistan, have been violated and the people left homeless. Even in their countries of residence, they have been disenfranchised uh, due to their being different. The Kurds uh, are the descendants of Indo-European tribes who settled amongst the Aboriginal inhabitants <coughs> pardon me, of the Zagros Mountains around 2000 BC. The earliest reference to Kurds occurred in the 6th century at the time of the Arab conquest and was used to donate nomadic people and at that time was thought to donate socioeconomic status rather than race. <coughs> Tribes became Kurdish by culture and language, and their eth ethnic identity does not imply a singular racial origin. The Kurdish population. Kurdish population is a controversial question that is virtually impossible to determine accurately due to regional government practices with regards to Kurds. In Iraq, however, Kurds account for more than 20 per cent of the population of the 23.5 million, of which 97 per cent are Muslim. The greatest concentration of Kurds live where they have always traditionally lived, in the mountainous regions where Iran, Iraq, Turkey and Syria meet, an area that has been called Kurdistan since the 13th century. Kurdistan borders cannot be drawn without contention excepting a de demographic map that reflects where the greatest concentration of Kurds are distributed. It is an area that covers approximately 230,000 square kilometres or a quarter of the size of Western Australia. The area where Kurds predominate in northern Iraq is a region of about 83,000 square kilometres, roughly the same size as Austria. The significance of Kurdistan has always been mainly strategic, where powers have sought to co-opt tribal chiefs to secure three things. Troops for the Muslim armies, relatively secure trade routes across Kurdistan, notably the Silk Road from Central Asia, and the repulsion of any external challenges to the then government's nominal sovereignty. The Kurds of today have a good command of Arabic, with some of the local population being more fluent in Arabic than in their own uh, native Kurdish dialect. Many are, uh, are, bilingual, are multilingual. The Kurdish religion. Although Kurds embraced Islam following the Arab conquest in the 7th century AD, religious belief plays no part in Kurdish distinctiveness. The current Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, or the PUK leader, uh, His Excellency Jalal Talabani, a man whom I have met and admire greatly, has done much for the minority Christian community and the Christians in northern Iraq. As a result, enjoy freedom of religion and worship. The peace settlement of 1918 and after. The demise of the Ottoman Empire in 1918 saw foreign armies in its former territories and the British occupying almost all of the present-day Iraq and foreign powers involved in the drafting of plans for that region. The United States President uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, in point 12 of his 14-point program for world peace, stated in his idealistic principle that non-Turkish minorities of the Ottoman Empire should be 
quote, assured of an absolute unmolested opportunity for autonomous development. The Treaty of Sevres was signed on the 20th of August 1920, and it promised the Kurds a state of their own, conditional, however, to the, the representing themselves to the League of Nations within one year from the date of signing as unified in desiring independence from Turkey. Unfortunately, the authors of the treaty failed to recognise that Kurds are real placed to take advantage of an opportunity, couched as it was, due to their social structure, which was uh, rural, highly decentralised and largely tribal, making cohesive leadership virtually impossible. Kurdish society was split between secessionists, autonomous and those content with the assimilation into Turkish society. Lacking at that time a cogent nationalistic policy, they were unable to make use of the provisions of that treaty. The offer was then rescinded under the 1923 Treaty of uh, Lausanne. Human rights atrocities against the Kurds. The Kurds in Turkey, regime of Kemal Ataturk. At the peace conference in Lausanne in 1923, Musa Kemal managed to re-establish complete and undivided sovereignty over what is now modern-day Turkey and won the support of the Kurds by appealing to Muslim unity. It later became clear that he was to dismantle the Muslim state and create a Turkish state under European and authoritarian lines, alienating the Kurds by dissolving all public vestiges of Kurdish identity. A short-lived revolt led by Nashbandi Sheikh Said and, men, and mainly confined to the Sunni tribes broke out in February of 1925 and was a catalyst for the beginning of a tradition of human rights atrocities against the Kurds by the Turks. Kamal Ataturk aimed to suppress any opposition to his ideology of a one-party state and he combined this with a view that the Kurds were dispensable. The revolt opened the way for a wholesale suppression of Kurdistan. Thousands were killed, hundreds of villages razed. The pacification process itself provoked other tribes into rebellion until 1927. Laws were induced to give security forces a free hand to commit massacre and other atrocities throughout the second half of 1930 without fear of prosecution. Numerous acts of human rights abuses have been committed in Turkey since the 1920s, and, and I believe that there is a serious cause for concern with Turkey as a member of the Council of Europe. Turkey has signed and ratified the European Convention on Human Rights, which has been incorporated into their domestic law and should, in theory, be applicable to the Turkish courts of law. Still, Turkey continues to deny freedom of expression, a free press, freedom of assembly, its widespread use of extrajudicial killings by security forces, its methods and practice of village evacua evacuation and coercion of people into its village militia force. All these denials are violations of the convention to which they are, willing, they are a willing signatory. Human rights atrocities against Kurds in Iraq. Conflict with the Kurds in Iraq, largely from the strategic position that its people occupy in mountainous areas where Syria, Iraq, Iran and Turkey converge. This is particularly so today. The Kurds are well established in the northern regions of Iraq, the oil and resource rich northern regions of that country. In 1968, when the Ba'ath Party seized power, it saw that there was little use in fighting the Kurds unless they had the power to defeat them. That regime preferred to deal with one Kurdish party rather than the Mullah Mustafa of the Kurdish Democratic Party, the KDP, since the KDP's ideolo ideologies were more closely aligned. Saddam Hussein chose to deal with Mullah, Mullah Mustafa. Each stage of failed negotiations with the Kurdish leaders resulted in fresh attacks and atrocities on the Kurdish people. Human rights atrocities within Kurds in Iraq. By 1987, the Kurds, with the support of Iran, controlled most of Iraqi Kurdistan. Saddam Hussein appointed his cousin, General Ali Hassan uh, El Majid, to take charge of northern Iraq with full authority and powers to eliminate the Kurdish rebellion. Destruction of villages, pollution of water supplies, detonations and mass murders using chemical weapons were some of the methods that General Hassan El Majid used to put down the rebellion. It was due to this barbarous methods of annihilation that Saddam's notorious cousin became better known to us as Chemical Ali, a committed terrorist who was captured by the United States forces last August. Chemical Ali oversaw, on behalf of his cousin, two of the worst episodes in Saddam Hussein's already unforgettable vicious dictatorship. They were codenamed Anfal and Halabja. Anfal. The broad purpose of the campaign was to eliminate resistance by the Kurds by any means necessary, any, uh, any many that were not necessary. In specific, its specific aim was to cleanse the region of saboteurs, who included all males between the ages of 15 and 17. Mass executions were carried out by uh, targeted villages and surrounding borders. Mr. Acting I Deputy regret President, to inform you I your seek time leave of the expired. Senate to incorporate the balance of my speech. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I do thank you, Mr. Acting uh, Senator President. I thank the Senator. Thank you, Senator Lifeblood.
A message has been received from the House of Representatives returning the Communications Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 2003, acquainting the Senate that the House has disagreed to the amendments numbers 1 to 3, 5 to 9, 12 and 13 made by the Senate and requesting the reconsideration of the amendments. Minister. I uh, move uh, that the message. <coughs> hmm? I move that the message be considered in committee of the whole immediately. Uh, the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that uh, the committee does not insist on Senate amendments numbers 1 to 3, 5 to 9, 12 and 13 disagreed by the House of Representatives. Senator Mackay. Just very briefly, uh, Chair, uh, on behalf of the Labor Party, can I assure the Senate that uh, Labor wants to improve the national security arrangements in our telecommunications industry? As stated uh, in the uh, second reading speeches, we have no desire to obstruct what we regard as an important bill, which will strengthen national security arrangements in our telecommunications industry. We want our national security environment to be robust and responsive to the terrible threat of global terrorism against innocent civilians. And Labor initially sought to improve this bill by ensuring it did not apply to individuals. And the government agreed to this amendment and Labor congratulates the government for that. Whilst we would have preferred the government to support our amendments and some of the Democrat amendments, it is now clear that the government will not do so. Our approach, we believe, has been consistent with respect to national security legislation. We've been attempt we have attempted to strike a balance between strong measures to fight terrorism and protecting the values and freedoms of Australians that Australians cherish. Whilst we have not got all the improvements we wanted to this bill, we have, I believe, extracted a key significant concession from the government, and that is the removal of individuals from the ambit of the bill. We don't have the desire to uh, block the government's moves to tighten the national security checks against telecommunications carriers. Whilst we would have preferred that our amendments uh, to the bill be made law, it is clear that this is not uh, possible. The choice, I guess, is between a somewhat improved bill or no bill at all. In the interests of enacting this legislation as soon as possible and strengthening our national security arrangements with respect to telecommunications, Labor will support the bill as insisted on by the government. Senator Gregg. And Democrat amendments introduced important safeguards into this legislation. Given the wide-reaching nature of these powers, we Democrats firmly believe that such safeguards are imperative to protect against the abuse of these powers. The amendments ensured that those affected by the exercise of these powers could seek judicial review of a decision made by the Attorney-General. They also clarified the grounds on which the Attorney-General could exercise these substantial powers under the legislation. One of the most important safeguards introduced by the amendments was to ensure that individuals and groups who engage in lawful protest are not restricted by these laws. This is, a fun this is fundamental to ensuring that the powers created by this legislation are used appropriately for the purpose of combating terrorism and not for preventing those who choose to exercise their freedom of expression. Finally, these amendments also ensured that telecommunications companies could not be sued for complying with the direction of the Attorney-General. While the government argued that the doctrine of frustration of contract would apply in these circumstances and would therefore prevent liability for acts done in compliance with the legislation, we Democrats believe this should be made very clear in the legislation and not left to the courts to determine. Setting this out clearly in the body of the Act will serve to prevent litigation against telecommunications companies. While the government has argued that this is an unnecessary measure, the minister failed to provide any reason as to why this should not be expressly provided for in the legislation. The opposition's amendment to require a review of these new provisions in four years' time is also, we believe, crucial. The express object, uh, objective rather, of the government in introducing this bill is to respond to the current threat of terrorism. We Democrats believe that it is imper imperative for the parliament to reconsider the effectiveness of the government's legislative response to the threat of terrorism in four years' time and the impact that these laws have had on telecommunications carriers and on the Australian community. The Democrats will insist on these amendments and we are unprepared to support the bill without their absence. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
against say no, the ayes have it, the ayes have it. The question is that the resolution be reported. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no, I think the ayes have it. The Chairman of Committee, Senator Hogg, reports that the committee has considered a message from the House of Representatives in relation to the Communications Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 2003, and has resolved not to insist on its amendments to which the House has disagreed. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Uh, the question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Um, I now propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Lundy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to talk about the allegations of sexual misconduct in our football codes that have recently come to light and uncovered what seems to be a culture of acceptance of unacceptable behaviours which it would be irresponsible to ignore at a political level. It is important to note that in regards to many of the current reports that are in the media, particularly those regarding the allegations of rape against the members of the NRL's Canterbury Bulldogs team and sexual misconduct of the AFL St Kilda side, no one has yet been charged. At this time, these allegations are just that, allegations that are under investigation within the criminal justice system. We trust that the legal system will deal with these charges in the same way as any member of society charged with these offences would be. Regardless, however, of whether these alleged crimes are proven or not, what they bring to light is the existence in some sports of a very distasteful and disturbing sexist subculture that marginalises, silences and disrespects women. That a sexist culture exists, particularly within the football codes, is beyond question. In fact, officials have admitted that serious misbehaviours have been covered up for decades. John Elliott, for example, has admitted that a fair bit of misconduct was covered up during his 20-year presidency of AFL's Carlton Club. In fact, Elliott went so far as to make the incredible statement, and I quote, run it under the carpet, that's what we tried to do. And a former first grade Super League player reported that in the past, if players went too far, there were minders who would make the incident go away. He stated that if a girl brought charges or threatened to, someone, a lawyer or club official, would quietly take her aside and remind her that her reputation would be destroyed in the witness box and then she would be offered a sum of money to take a long holiday. Such, ac such actions by these administrators must be considered at best immoral and worst illegal. The fact that not only do players engage in such behaviours but that administrators are willing to cover them up either points to total administrative ineptitude or an entrenched subculture of acceptance of behaviours that are so far below the societal no norm they defy belief. While it is in no way suggested that all football players engage in acts of rape or sexual abuse, reports of Canterbury Bulldogs players urinating in front of media and levelling crass comments at female reporters attending police interviews in casual attire with pre-prepared statements and Australian League captain Darren Lockyer's crass joke all show that there is a systemic problem in some sports. Actions like these indicate an absolute failure by some players to comprehend just what is acceptable behaviour. It suggests that players believe they are able, by decree of their sports hero status, to live outside the rules that govern the rest of society. The continual excusing of these behaviours by administrators and covering up by teammates only serves to perpetuate this misguided belief. As a case in point, in response to Lockyer's joke, ARL Chief Executive Jeff Carr put forward the excuse that young sportsmen cannot be expected to always be diplomats. What a poor excuse. We aren't asking for diplomats or cultural icons. We are simply asking that players do not behave in a way that is so far below societal standards that they shame us all. We merely want to be reassured that any member of this society, sports person or not, knows that rape is not a joke. Sexism in any form is denigrating, and the fact that there is a problem in some, and the fact is that there is a problem in some sports. The question is how do we change these misogynistic attitudes and, in, and instead promote a culture that accepts and respects women? Many believe that a greater involvement of women within sports, particularly in decision-making bodies and management roles, is a key. In fact, a lack of female role models has been seen as a major inhibitor to stamping out sexist attitudes in football codes. Some may argue that this is a concept being pushed forward by women. However, this is not the case. 
The AFL has said that they believe its success in dealing with ethical issues around racism was largely due to the greater involvement of women in their sport than in other football codes. The AFL also believes that although far from perfect, it has the capacity to work through the issue of sexism in the same way that they work through the issue of racism because of the role women play in their sporting structure. Labor has always fostered a culture of equal opportunity and acceptance for women, of course, as equals. Labor believes that if there was greater involvement of women in decision-making and management roles in sport, particularly at the elite level, there would be little tolerance of a sexist culture. Already Labor is leading the way forward to change the male-dominated culture of sport, with Victorian Sport and Recreation Minister Justin Madden and Women's Affairs Minister Mary Delahunty this week announcing a $78,000 fund funding for a program to encourage more women to join club and league boards and committees. It is envisaged that initiatives such as this will help to specifically build the views of women into the decision-making processes. Parents and players also play a key role in raising their concerns and fears with sports clubs, both nationally and locally. What mother would want their son to become part of a sports organisation that covers up and condones behaviours, including this, the abuse and sexual degradation of women? Can you tell me that a player who is engaged in the abuse of females as a father later in life would not feel outraged if it was their daughter who was treated so shamefully? And players themselves should also be at the forefront of this community campaign. And I think one of the most disappointing aspects of the current scandals is the, the lack of num number of male sports role models who have come forward and publicly condemned the assault or harassment of women. Many players are angry themselves because, as players, they realise that their reputation has been tarnished by the acts of others. These players must be encouraged to stand up against this behaviour. They must show both the public and other players that they do not condone this behaviour, that they will not be involved and they will not cover up for their teammates. While there is a mounting body of evidence that suggests there is a specific problem within sport, it would be naive to think that the abuse of women is a problem within sport only. ABS statistics show that one in six women are sexually assaulted at some time in their life. The Australian Institute of Criminology, however, shows that charges of sexual assault and prosecution are successful in less than 10 per cent of cases. Clearly the fear of reporting a sex crime is still strong in some women. It's a sad reflection on our society that not only do women not, a, not feel able to report cases of sexual violence against them, of violence against them, sexual or otherwise, but that rape is the only crime in which the victim is required to prove their innocence. If a store owner is beaten and robbed, they're not expected to prove that they didn't invite the thief into their shop. A rape victim, stripped of their dignity and self-confidence, is required, however, to sit in front of a jury and prove that she wasn't asking for it because of what she wore out. In, in fact, it seems that many men still fail to understand that rape is a serious business it's a serious crime. The results of a recent Australian survey showed that one in six men thought it was acceptable to force a woman to have sex if he felt she had led him on. They justify their actions by saying that she was asking for it. The message to all members of society, and particularly to sportsmen who are revered and idolised, must be made very clear. Sex without informed consent is rape. No really does mean no. Change will only come about <coughs> through policy changes and re-education, and Labor knows that it takes a cultural shift to successfully change the behaviour of individuals. Labor is committed to stamping out sexism in all its forms, to promoting a civil society and an equal opportunity and a fair go for all. A concerted effort to promote this awareness and acceptance throughout sport and the broader community is an essential step towards confronting and removing the sexist attitudes that do exist and, of course, uh, to prevent crimes taking place. Everyone has a role to play to ensure a safe, healthy and happy life for all associated with sport. For a future federal Labor government, that is the public policy goal. Every child and adult should feel that sport is a positive and exciting thing to be involved with, whether you're a volunteer, coach, player, administrator, whatever role. That sexist attitudes and behaviours are unaccepted and in many cases celebrated part of some sporting culture gives rise to very grave concerns within the community and certainly within my party. Media reports such as those we are currently regarding make us collectively hang our heads in shame. The focus on football at the moment is sensational and rightly so. It is not a better outcome for sport or society as a whole for this issue to remain behind closed doors out of the limelight. People must speak out and be proud and defend um, the right of every woman 
to have an equal place in society, to stamp out crime of this nature and to move towards an environment in sport where the culture is indeed celebrated across both genders. Senator Kim. Uh, Mr uh, President, uh, let me just briefly make a comment on uh, Senator Lundy's uh, speech this evening. Uh, all of us deplore the, um, the reports that are in newspapers uh, about uh, what's alleged to be some cultural uh, attitudes uh, in some of our sports, uh, and clearly this has got to be stamped out. Uh, our political leaders have all made statements uh, on this, uh, uh, this particular issue. Um, and it is important, I think, as uh, Senator Lundy said, for uh, people to, uh, particularly sportsmen, to speak out about this. And I refer Senator Lundy to uh, an article today in the Herald Sun by Jim Steins, uh, which headed up uh, football silent victims. But uh, this evening I want to turn to another comment uh, and comments that Senator Lundy has, uh, has made in recent times, uh, which I believe uh, are very unfair to uh, large numbers of Australians. Uh, they are unfair to uh, the AIS. And I think that they should be counted. Now, Senator Lundy, I think, will be forever remembered as the shadow sports minister who tried to put a four-lane highway through the uh, Australian Institute of Sport. Uh, that was defeated, and very sensibly so. Uh, but to this very day, Senator Lundy has refused to acknowledge the absurdity of that policy and taken no steps. Another issue which Senator Lundy has, has raised in recent times is to denigrate the research which has been done by Australian scientists into uh, anti-doping uh, in sport. And, uh, Senator Lundy, I have cautioned her before that uh, sometimes Senator Lundy's research uh, lacks the required depth. Uh, Senator Lundy, I regret to say, sometimes reads speeches which have been, uh, been written uh, for her on these matters without carefully weighing up uh, the real facts. Uh, and this evening I just want to point out uh, to those who have believed that what Senator Lundy is saying, and which not only denigrates the activities of these government, this government, which of course Senator Lundy is quite entitled to do, but uh, denigrates, I believe, the very important work that Australian scientists uh, are carrying out into uh, anti-doping uh, in sport. There are a number of specific claims that were made by Senator Lundy. Uh, let me just uh, deal with one. First, uh, Senator Lundy makes a broad sweeping comment that it, when, uh, when it comes to anti-doping research, uh, the government has, and I quote Senator Lundy, effectively relegated Australia to the position of disciple rather than messiah. S someone wrote those lines for her, but to, to my mind, uh, again, very unfair. Nothing could be further from the truth, Senator Lundy. Indeed, this government has a very proud track record in the fight against drugs in sport and remains a world leader in anti-doping research. Within Australia, significant anti-doping research of international acclaim has been carried out over the past five years and continues to be carried out. This is a direct result of the government's significant commitment to the fight against drugs. Uh, as Senator Lundy, I believe, has become aware, but it would be hard to judge this from her public comments, funding for anti-doping uh, research in Australia is at record levels. At record levels. And I'm advised uh, Senator Lundy can see no achievements, but I'm advised by uh, ASDA that this research has resulted in significant advances in such areas as uh, detection methods uh, for haemoglobin-based oxygen carriers, H so-called HBOCs, a new group of substances with a similar performance effect to EPO. Certified reference materials for all WADA accredited, accredited laboratories to underpin testing for banned substances, including the development of the materials for THG detection, and uh, very importantly, significant advances in the detection of human growth hormone. You can contrast this with what was happening uh, prior to 1996 when Labor was in office. Activity in this area was minimal, even though problems such as human growth hormone and EPO were known substances of abuse in sport at that time, I'm advised. In 1998-99, uh, the government commenced funding for anti-doping research in the lead-up to the Sydney Games. We did this because we knew that the integrity of the Games could be threatened by the use of banned substances, and we recognised that we had an opportunity to progress the world effort in this area. In all, uh, over $3 million is being invested in research, research that has been conducted in Australia by Australian scientists from Australian institutions. Institutions such as the Australian Government Analytical Laboratory, the uh, Garvin Institute of Medical Research, the Colling Institute of Medical Research and the Anzac Research Institute, to name but a few. 
These are internationally acclaimed institutions conducting world-class anti-doping research. Over the years, Australian researchers have undertaken and published research into improved detection and uh, confirmation of stimulants, diuretics, narcotics, steroids, peptide hormones and oxygen delivery systems. The Australian Government also continues to support the World Anti-Doping Agency, which funds anti-doping research. Australian researchers have, completed, have competed against tough international con uh, competition and su successfully won um, over uh, $2 million dollars, uh, that's US dollars, uh, in WADA grants to conduct anti-doping research. A very different picture from the picture that Senator Lundy uh, has painted, a picture of increased uh, funds, a picture of increased activity and a picture of increased achievement. None of this recognised by Senator Lundy, all in the attempt to make some cheap uh, political uh, point. And as I said, it's OK for Senator Lundy to attack this government, but she should not denigrate uh, the work of Australian scientists. I believe the government record speaks for itself and puts to rest uh, to, to uh, Senator Lundy's claim in the media a few weeks ago the astonishing claim that she has seen no evidence of research being started or completed in Australia. How could Senator Lundy make such an utterly absurd statement? Uh, Senator Lundy also said yesterday that the Australian government had chosen uh, to enforce a ban on world-leading uh, research. I can only assume Senator Lundy is basing her, um, her claim on some absurd press reports, uh, but uh, Senator Lundy, again, not true. The Australian Institute of Sport is a world-class centre of excellence in training and the development of elite athletes and coaches. Uh, the government did not want there to be any risk of actual or perceived conflict of interest occurring by conducting anti-doping research in facilities such as the AIS, whose primary charter is to foster and develop the talents of elite athletes. I would like to make it perfectly clear that this government has not banned AIS scientists from undertaking anti-doping research. What scientists cannot do is undertake anti-doping research in-house at the AIS. The government's policy enables AIS scientists to contribute their expertise and collaborate with external institutions conducting anti-doping uh, research. Uh, Senator Lundy um, uh, describes this, uh, this move, which we believe uh, is a, was a principled move, as totally inexplicable and unjustified. Can I say to Senator Lundy that uh, when uh, Labor was in government, the ALP recognised the reputation of the AIS was paramount and, in that, uh, and to protect it and Australian sport generally from allegations about conflict of interest in drug testing, an independent authority, the Australian Sports Drug Agency, was established. Senator Lundy, let me deal in the brief time available a number of other points. Senator Lundy said yesterday, under a directive issued in, on, in April 2001 by the then Minister for Sport and Tour Tourism, the AIS scientists were ordered to cease any further work on blood doping research and confine their, part their participation in anti-doping research to intellectual property. I believe uh, Senator Lundy again is wrong and she has chosen quite deliberately to ignore a response I gave in Senate estimates when this issue arose. Uh, what, uh, what I said at this time was, and I quote directly from Hansard, the previous minister said that anti-doping research programs should not be conducted within the AIS. That was her view. However, she did make the point that individuals with expertise within the Commission may contribute to the work of or collaborate with external research institutions in relation to anti-doping research programs. Senator Lundy also said the government should play an integral, integral role in providing support for the work of those who are fighting to develop detection tests to stay ahead of drug cheats. If Senator uh, Lundy had done her homework, uh, she would know that this government is playing an integral role in supporting the work of those who are fighting to, to develop detection tests to stay ahead of drug cheats. There has been no diminution uh, in the Australian government's commitment to anti-doping research or in our commitment to achieving a sporting environment free from uh, performance-enhancing substances and doping methods. Uh, it is most unfortunate, I believe, uh, Mr President, to have misleading comments and slurs uh, against Australia's anti-doping uh, efforts in the lead-up to the Athens Olympic Games. The government has a proud record in promoting, funding, uh, promoting and funding anti-doping research. The evidence is there for all to see uh, on the, the departmental website. Uh, Senator Lundy has uh, launched a most unjustified attack, uh, an attack based on no proper research of her own. She has obviously taken information from others and not uh, bothered to check uh, this information out. And if she had bothered to check this information out, Mr. President, she would have seen that uh, funding of uh, anti-doping research is at record levels, I believe, in this country. 
she would have been able to note the significant achievements uh, which have been made, and she would have avoided uh, making a slur against uh, Australia's significant efforts in this regard. Um, it's with much pleasure that I announce that the Senate will now adjourn until um, Tuesday, the 11th of May, at 12:30 p.m. And can I wish all those people here tonight a happy and holy Easter? <laughs>